Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining me for another restful episode of True Scary Stories to Help You Fall Asleep. Today, we have a compilation of stories from the great outdoors. I hope you enjoy them. This video will encompass backwoods stories, deep forest stories, camping stories, and hiking stories. I hope you enjoy them. So without further ado, lay back, relax, and enjoy these true scary stories. I've spent most of my life running around the woods of Southern Oregon, and I've seen some weird stuff out there. First story, way out in the middle of nowhere, far from any road, my friend and I stumbled across a large fenced in area, 10 foot chain link fence. Inside the fence were all these trees planted in perfectly straight rows. No biggie. The Forest Service does sciency stuff out in the woods sometimes. What was odd is that every single tree was bent in a specific shape. All of them were crooked in the exact same way. We didn't climb the fence that day because our dogs were acting super sketchy and one ran off. We found him eventually, thank goodness. And despite looking, I've never found that place again. Back then, I was convinced that it was a nefarious government project, a la Stranger Things or Aliens. The vibe was really weird there in our defense. Now that I think about it, maybe someone was growing trees in that shape to make a boat. I did read that people do this. The woods can be spooky sometimes, so maybe it was aliens or Bigfoot. Another time with that same friend, we were again in the literal middle of nowhere, dry camping and hiking with the dogs. We found a small clearing that had a twin-sized rusty old iron bed frame, a small rusted out cook stove, and some other rusty buckets and stuff. The odd part is that it was so far from anything, even old logging spur roads. Whoever lived out there really didn't want to be found or bothered. Can't blame them, really. I do have a bunch more stories, if anyone is interested. When I was 14, I found a body floating in the Flint River near Bainbridge. It was winter, so no alligator activity, but any body in water in the deep south is going to be terribly bloated. And this one was. Race, age, and gender were no longer evident to my observation. When I was 19, I came across human remains in the woods surrounding the creek that ran behind my house. It turned out to be a hunter who'd gone missing in the early 80s. I picked up the femur thinking, what a weird looking stick, only to find that it was still attached to other bones. The realization of what it was was unsettling when my brain was telling me that it was a big deer. Then I looked closer and there was a human mandible within a couple of feet. The fact that I was not disturbed by either led to me doing a lot of volunteer search and recovery over my life. Uncomfortable in remote areas, woods don't phase me, and a body is just a thing. A thing that deserves respect, and an important thing, but I never feel creeped out. I found, aside from those two, four other partial sets of remains, and one recently deceased individual who got lost in Escalante Canyon. That one bothered me, because even half a day sooner could have saved him. That's why I don't do search and rescue unless it's a child. I can't handle it. But I can put the feelings aside when it's a missing kid. My buddy, my wife, and her friend hiked to a remote cabin. The cabin's previous tenants had to be medevaced, 
so my buddy and I decided to hike their belongings back down the mountain, three miles each way, so we could get it back to them. My wife and her friend went on a hike while we were gone. On their way back, they found a decorative flamingo in the middle of the trail. No clue who put it there, as they didn't see another soul. A couple of times, I've had people appear in places that no one should have been. One was an old man at 2 a.m. in St. Mary's Wilderness. He said he had gotten turned around and asked if I could use my Jeep to take him to where he wanted to camp. The road is very rough and was just a series of mud pits. I ended up agreeing, no idea why, and drove him about an hour to where he just said, okay, this is fine. I dropped him off, took his picture, and left. At camp, I noticed that he wasn't in the picture, just kind of a blur. The next morning, I went to where I dropped him off and I couldn't find him or any tracks. No clue if he was real or if I was just imagining it all. I've also seen markers from where Civil War soldiers had died. And how. Example, Jack Smith gunshot, carved into stones. Not headstones, just the rocks by where they died. I also sat and watched an orb slash will-o'-wisp with two friends for about 30 minutes before it finally went away. In high school in the mid-1980s, we used to go out to the lake and stay the night. We would build a campfire, and then we would just get tired and sleep in our cars. It must have been around 11 p.m. when we decided to go for a hike into the thick wooded area. There was a trail. There were four of us, three girls and one guy. We had flashlights, but we didn't really need them because the moon was bright. Then I heard something that sounded like faint music. I asked the others if they heard it and they said that they did. It was like music from a jewelry box. You know, that type that has the little ballerina that spins around. We keep walking. Then, right in the middle of the trail there it was. A white jewelry box with the ballerina. It was just in the middle of the trail playing music. We turned around and started to run. Then we stopped and decided to go back to where it was. It was gone. It wasn't more than a minute and it was gone. We ran back, put the fire out, and we went home. My family and I have a new puppy that we take outside to walk in the middle of the night. This was around 4 in the morning, and she let me know that she had to go out. She's always been very intimidated about going out in the middle of the night, but we never thought anything of it. Just as I was about to bring her inside, I hear this howl. Human-sounding screech that sounded like it was right behind me. The puppy and I ran so fast in the house. The scream that came out of my body was so bizarre. I just froze in fear as soon as I got inside. My husband was very concerned and immediately locked the doors and brought all of our kids into bed with us. We were trying to chalk it up to maybe a fox. I would normally talk myself into it just being an animal, but the weird vibe that I got, I can't even describe it. The howl slash scream sounded like it was right in my ear. I will never be going outside alone again. This is a story that I only recently remembered again in a conversation with my fiance. When I remembered the story, I was overwhelmed by an uncomfortable feeling, similar to what it was like at the moment. I never fully managed to figure out what really happened then, so I decided to share that story here. My older sister had graduated from medical school at the time, 
and my parents decided to organize a celebration for our family and friends on the occasion of that event. The celebration was held at the cottage of our family friends, where we grew up, so I was very familiar with the space. Imagine a large empty clearing, a large square surrounded by houses and fields between them, a narrow road leading to individual houses runs along the perimeter itself. And at that time, it was not even fully paved. It was mostly a dirt road. From that main road which framed the houses in a square, you could go down into the dense forest that surrounded that square. The depth of the forest was great, and when you turned off the main road towards the path, you had to walk for a long time to reach the river, which was a few kilometers away. All this was familiar to me, because I grew up there and spent a good part of my childhood playing in those woods. I was afraid of the forest, but nothing more than normal, and I was always careful not to stray from the path so as to not get lost. Back to the story. My parents organized a celebration and invited a large number of people, including my cousin, P. She and I were close in age, and we got along well. As the number of people became tiring for us, we decided to take a walk so we could catch up on life, just the two of us. We were both about 20 years old, and I led her down the road because I knew the path I wanted us to take, down the perimeter, alongside the forest, next to all the other houses so as to not be alone. Everything was normal until we reached one of the turns for the forest that I mentioned. Somehow we both stopped without saying a word and looked in silence at the path that stretched deep into the forest. Let's go inside. I was the first to speak after some time, even if this is something that's not typical for me. As I mentioned earlier, I was always a little afraid of the forest, especially after I got lost in it once. That was when I was still a child, but they managed to find me quickly after my screams that rang throughout the area. For this reason, I never left the road without my older friend, A, who carried a stick with him and his hunting dog, May. But now, something was different. Let's go in there. It won't hurt us, I said to my cousin and stepped inside. I don't want to. I'm scared, answered my cousin. But I persistently assured her that everything was fine. In the end, she still followed me because I was already 30 steps ahead of her. L, this is not a good idea. Let's go back. P tried to convince me once again but I walked forward as if in a trance. Everything's fine, I repeated to her. After some time when we were already deep into the forest, I finally stopped myself. I could not take a step more. I was paralyzed. It was as if some part of me tried to break away from whatever was pulling me inside. I was overcome with fear. My heart was pounding hard and my breath stopped. It was as if all sounds had stopped. It was daytime but there was no signs of life. Not a bird, not a rabbit, not a butterfly. Only silence. And those trees that I had a feeling would stretch out their branches and trap me forever in this forest. He was a few steps behind me. I'm going back. I can't do this, said P and ran the same way we came. Her voice was trembling and I could feel the panic in it. After another moment, I managed to break away and run after her. We ran without looking back, as if something was chasing us, until we reached the entrance of the place from which we entered. A little further towards the cottage, we finally stopped as we finally felt safe. We did not look back out of pure fear. We tried to catch our breath, and only then did we talk as we were walking back home, fast and still scared. There was something there. We were sure of that. I wasn't afraid at first when I went inside. In fact, it was as if something was calling me, wanting me to follow it. But my cousin's frightened voice and presence tore me out of the trance. It had called me. I'm afraid to think what would have happened if I was alone, if there wasn't someone to pull me back so I wouldn't go too far. I didn't know where I was going. I just knew that we got to that road that I had to go inside. It scares me, and I can't shake the fear that overwhelmed me and my cousin after that event. Any thoughts on what happened here? 
Why did I go inside and persuade my cousin to follow me? Why did she manage to snap me out of it? And why were we both so scared? There was no sound. There was no voice. There was nothing. Just the unspoken words of something that I heard and my cousin didn't. I'm from Croatia, so Europe, a bit more Eastern, not too far from the Serbian border. I'd never been a big fan of camping. Circa 2012, for some reason or another, my friend and I decided to take a Saturday night to camp on private property. We had permission from the owner. On the bank of a small lake in the rural American Southeast. The lake wasn't very large, probably only 50 to 150 yards across. Not great at estimating distance. It was more of a deep pond, but it was like five times as long as it was wide. And from the perspective of our camp, it consumed the majority of our sight line. The plot of land itself wasn't entirely removed from civilization. We were five to ten miles outside of a small suburb of a mid-sized southern city. It definitely was not easy to access, however. And the only way in was a gated narrow dirt road across a levee which spanned one side of the lake. This road was gated and locked. The owner gave us his code. We pulled the car through and locked the gate behind us. If you've ever been down south, you know how quickly it gets isolated outside of cities. Our cities are small, and the rural people around often live rough and wild. We have dense woods, so thick that they're not worth building in unless you have some connection or attachment to the area. I've heard it was not profitable to cut roads through a lot of it when they were building highways in the 50s. So not much development has happened in the last hundred years, and in some places, since the Civil War. It's not uncommon to go for a 30-minute drive straight out of town and come upon cabins that are obviously off the grid. My friend and I were used to living in the suburbs, so we were just happy to see stars and hear the sounds of nature. We were at our utilitarian camp. Small, Coleman two-person tent and a blanket simply looking around and enjoying the night, when suddenly my buddy sat up real straight. He said something like, Do you see that guy over there? He pointed to the other side of the small lake. I didn't see anything. I sat up slightly and said, Nah, it's just the dark playing tricks on you. He seemed actually shaken. No, look, there's a bunch of faces behind the trees now. That got my attention, and I sat up fully, rubbing my eyes to try and gain full focus. And then I saw them. Small, round, white faces staring back at me from across the lake. Maybe 15 to 20 of them. All were positioned in such a way that their bodies were behind the trees, and only their heads were visible. The best way that I can describe the faces is very pale somehow internally illuminated children. I should mention that neither of us were drinking or high. We were too young for that, not for at least a few more years. We had eaten dinner at home and were just planning on going to sleep after chilling out for a while. The faces weren't moving. I was kind of sitting there in shock, thinking that my eyes would adjust and I would see that they were a reflection, bugs or owls or something but I would never come to that realization. I stared right back at them for what felt like five minutes, looked back and my friend, and they were gone. Bodies of water carry sound extremely well, and we heard extensive shuffling from the other side of the lake and a couple of small branches snapping. It's incredible what your ears pick up on during an otherwise silent night. My buddy was tearing up a little when he said, what the heck were those? And I didn't have a good answer. Neither of us slept particularly well. I definitely felt validated in my feelings of disliking camping. But what were we going to do? I tried to do some research on the internet. 
but never found a phenomenon that could explain that. When I was very young, I was visiting a family friend at their camper in the woods. No idea where. I remember at one point being outside and hearing what sounded to me like a church choir. But we were in the middle of nowhere and it was dark out. No one else seemed to hear it. I still think about it and wonder where I was and what on earth it could have been. I've just stumbled upon this subreddit, and I've thoroughly enjoyed all the experiences and stories shared by others. I've finally felt compelled to share an experience of my own, and while it may not be as provoking or profound as the stories told by others on this subreddit, it still fills me with a strange and mysterious feeling all these years later. I grew up on Long Island in New York State. My older sister, her boyfriend, and myself often would walk the trails and the beaches at night, on one particular evening, the three of us were on a walk at a Camp Hero State Park. It was a full moon, so it was very bright out. As we were walking the trail, we stopped to relax and look out over the water. My sister's boyfriend sparked up a joint, and we were all partaking and relaxing. Whilst we were gazing out onto the open water, we spotted a small light in the distance. My sister inquired as to what we thought that was. Her boyfriend said it was probably a light on a distant boat. I agreed and we didn't think much of it. However, as moments passed, we noticed the light seemed to be approaching us, getting closer by the minute. As it moved closer, it appeared to not be on the water, but above the water in the sky. We soon realized it was not a light on a distant boat. We continued to speculate what it was, and I came to the conclusion that it must be someone's small personal drone. But as the light came closer and closer, the brightness got stronger and stronger. If you know Camp Hero, you know that there are cliff edges that hang over the water. There we are, standing there on the edge with this orb steadily approaching us. With the span of five minutes, the orb was no longer in the distance, but hanging right in front of us. It was no longer over the water, but rather over the sandy beach. We stood there staring at it. It had a whitish purple glow to it. Despite being night, it was bright out due to the light of the full moon. On this high visibility evening, it became evident that that was no drone. This light was standalone, no machinery of any kind attached to it, and it just hung there about 10 feet in front of us for about 30 seconds. Then, it just disappeared. In such a way that it almost seemed to envelop itself. We all decided to get the hell out of there, and that was that. This was back in 2015-ish. I've since visited this particular park many times since, and have never seen anything like it again. Maybe we were all just a bunch of stone teenagers and it was some sort of group delusion, but that night will stick with me forever. The park itself is shrouded in mystery, and I can only speculate that the orb was perhaps a remnant of one of the experiments conducted at Camp Hero from back in the day. Anyway, that's my story. Have any of you had any spooky experiences on Long Island? We're certainly not quote-unquote backwoods by any means, but things still happen around these parts. So this is a story my dad recently told me about my grandpa and my great grandpa. My grandpa grew up in a very rural southern Indiana, but moved to very rural southern Illinois in his youth. So this takes place in Illinois. One night, grandpa and his dad were hanging out at his uncle's, who lived a couple of miles away. Keep in mind, this is the 40s out in the country, so all roads are just dirt, basically. Anyways, it was pretty late, so they decided to head home and hopped into their old car, going probably about 15 miles per hour through these woods roads. 
At some point, as they're just driving and talking, they pass something along the edge of the road, standing upright. They both hunted, and were very familiar with any animals or other local people that may be around. Neither one of them really said anything for a minute, and then they both looked at each other and said, What the hell was that? My grandpa asked his dad, Do you want to turn around? And he said, Nope, and they kept driving. My grandpa said it resembled a big owl, or a small person, just standing in the ditch. First time posting here or anywhere. Wanted to recount a bizarre series of events from my childhood and figured that this was the best place to do it. Particularly because I have very little karma and cannot post much anywhere else. When I was a kid, I lived in Clinton, Tennessee. Both parents worked full time, so I was often sent over to stay with my grandparents who had a plot of land in the vicinity of, but not right in, Mosheim near Greenville. Both of them had been in East Tennessee for their whole lives in that area for a good many of years. They had been established at their home for some decades before this story and remained there a good time after. Recently, I had reason to return to that area in Tennessee after having spent the majority of my adult life in Minnesota. Being in and around the area, driving the same roads made me reminiscent about my lazy summer days tucked away at my grandparents' house. Learning to shoot on the same 22 with which grandpa had taught mom feeding fish at a neighbor's stocked pond, or spotting deer and bear with binoculars from the back porch. When I relayed this to my mom, she in turn told me a story about a time I scared my grandpa half to death, then lied about hanging out with Bigfoot. At first, I had no idea what she was going on about. Then I remembered exactly what happened with startling clarity. New context given by the experience adulthood provides. And no... This was not about Bigfoot or a cryptid. Before we start, some information about my grandparents' land. Their house was on a small hill surrounded by grass lawn. The lawn gave away to a smallish hay field than a wood line. Those woods lasted for a good half mile to either side of the home, and a good several miles to the back. I hated the hay field because it was too pokey to play in, but liked to hang out in a creek that ran behind it. To get there, I would like to walk to the edge of the property just in the wood line to avoid the hay. While at my grandparents, the only rules were that I stay where I could see the house, so the house could see me. I was to take a whistle with me anywhere I went. I didn't take the whistle, seeing it as a badge of my regrettably young age, and the best part of the crick was outside of the house. That was the only stretch where it got deeper than my knees and thus the only part where I could swim. Naturally, I spent much of my time in the water splashing around, skipping stones and being a kid. One day I was playing in the creek when I noticed someone. It was a man, a stranger on the bank watching me. He had long hair, a beard, and pale skin so dirty that it was stained. I could not tell his age and simply thought of him as old. I have no better guess now as he clearly went through long years of hard living. He wore no shirt, no pants, only a wrap of dirty cloth around his waist that I thought was a Moses dress, thanks to some illustrated Bible stories. Around his neck, there were multiple necklaces made from knotted tatters of cloth, fiber, and string. In those knots were various pieces of detritus, mostly bones, but some flowers and bits of dark glass. When I first saw him there by the creek, I was terrified. Terrified. Frozen still. The man, however, was smiling. He gestured from his squat with an outstretched arm. Fingers down. In a kind of, don't stop for me wave. I didn't react. Startled and reeling. Then he splashed at me, still smiling. He did it again. I splashed back and soon we were playing. We both threw water at each other. He jumped into the creek and stomped around with me, laughing all the while. He threw walks in the water and so did I. I pushed him. He pushed me back. We carried on for some minutes until my grandma called for me. With her voice, a switch had turned off. The man stopped in his tracks, gaze, fixed back towards the house. 
Then, as my grandma kept on hollering, he looked to me. He crept back to his side of the creek, barely disturbing the water, then slid into the brush, completely silent the whole way, holding my gaze. Once he was out of sight, I waited in the water until my grandma found me. She wanted to know if I was alone. I said no. She became very tense, asking who was with me while looking around. I didn't answer. I didn't know how. Seeing no one, she pulled me back to the house without any more words, gripped like iron the whole time. At the house, the real inquisition began. I didn't really have new words, the event and this reaction overwhelming my ability to explain. Such silence further irked my grandma, and I was swiftly placed in a corner, held without bail, awaiting patriarchal judgment. Around an hour later, my grandpa came back from work. He was told about my churlishness and was ready to set into me again when I started talking. I told him about the man, hairy and old, dressed like Moses, about how we played and then he disappeared. I remember they digested this for a few minutes before sending me to my room. I was happy to go, and happier still, Grandpa did not yell like he usually did when we misbehaved. Later, I was brought out for dinner. I ate in the kitchen with Grandma, but Grandpa called me to the back porch. He was on the swinging bench, looking out over the hay field, turned red by the setting sun. He had kicked off his boots and put them next to his shotgun. I knew that was odd for the gun to be out of the closet. Previously, we had used it to shoot bottles. Sometimes I would throw them into the air like they were clay pigeons. These escapades were accompanied with speeches about how the gun was dangerous and only for adults to use. He went through my story again, his tone deadly serious. Eventually, he asked me how Harry was the man, really. I told him very, thinking it was the right answer. He asked where. I told him everywhere like a bear. He ruminated on this and grew more nervous, worried I was in trouble or causing trouble, just wanting the trouble wherever it lie to end. So, when he finally asked me to swear in the name of Christ and on my mother that I was telling the truth about everyone, I said I had been joking. He finally yelled then and sent me back to my room. The family memory became that I had hid by the creek and made up a tale about Bigfoot. At the time, everyone was very upset with me, and I was forbidden from going back to the creek or anywhere out of sight. The enforcement of this rule, like the others, was lackluster. Even so, for a time I didn't go to the creek. In my memory, I stayed away for a very long time, but I am sure it was only a few days, that hiatus feeling interminable to my elementary age self. I did start going to the creek. I took a bucket of toys, mostly Godzilla, and a thick stick plucked from the wood line on the way. I think I was conflicted about what to do if the man came back, imagining either impressing him with my toy collection or clubbing him, or both in turn. When he did show back up, he appeared next to me as I dozed under a tree on my side of the creek. I was once again gripped with terror. He was not smiling, his face expressionless as he lurked beside me, having watched for who knows how long before I smelled him. I scrambled away, leaving behind my stick and toys, coming to my feet a yard out. I stood in the sun while the man watched me from the shade. Eventually, he crouched and started to look through my bucket. I remember becoming indignant as he examined my toys one by one, only to toss them into the dirt. It became too much and I started to lecture the man, telling him about how he got me in trouble, how he was a weirdo, how he stank. At some point, he stopped looking around my things and calmly watched my tirade face still neutral, eyes analytic. Once I had concluded my lecture, I sat back under the tree to pout, having become hot in the sun. I remember the man made a noise, a grinding kind of snort, and when I looked over at him, he was chuckling while he inspected the last few figures in my bucket. I wanted to laugh too, but was more determined to stay sullen. Once everything was out of the bucket, he put one figure, Gaidora, back into the bucket. He then stood to his hunched fullest, took the bucket by its handle, began to make his way back into the woods. I stayed by the tree until he turned, said something, not a word I knew or to this day even know, and gestured with a forward sweep of his hand. At first I didn't comply despite knowing he wanted me to follow. After a few moments he yipped, clicked his teeth, and gestured again more emphatically. With this further prompt, I did get up and come along. 
the man making approving noises and putting on his smile again. We went into the woods. The man led. But he was naturally quicker and quieter, making it hard to keep up. Eventually, he would stop when he lost me, knocking on trees with sticks and whistling arrhythmatically so I may find him in the vegetation. He never came back for me, opting instead to guide me forward with the noises. I became lost, having only a vague sense of my grandparents' place being behind me. After some time, maybe 15 minutes, we came to a bald. The man had me wait there, indicated by patting the ground before going into the tree line alone. He returned from a different direction, pulling a sled. It was made from a half of a discarded plastic drum and lined with small pelts and smooth bark. On the back half there rested the fly-covered carcasses, squirrels, possums, and other critters savaged into anonymity. On the pulling end, woven pouches were tied into place on it by the same eclectic cordage that made the man necklaces. He put my bucket on the sled and tossed Gaidora in the pouch. He then called me closer with a glottal noise and beckoning wave. I saw the sledge pouches held many odds and ends, dried salamanders, mushrooms, metal bits, glass fragments. From one, the man pulled a square made out of bound together sticks, just big enough to slip over my wrist. From another, he pulled a piece of fool's gold and a small shard of geode crusted with a bit of purple crystal. These he handed to me with an air of business and a few more utterings of nonsense. He then patted the ground for me to set again. I did so without much bewilderment, understanding we had traded the same as exchanging Pokemon cards at recess. I did not much miss Ghidorah anyway, as he was a bad guy. The bucket was a loss. In retrospect, I think Ghidorah was chosen because its dull gold scales resembled something valuable. The bucket for its obvious ability to hold things. The man came back and gestured for me to follow by slapping his thigh. I did this readily. During the hike back, I tried to keep up and pay attention. I did so moderately well, having to be whistled over a few times. I did notice that our path was not straight. The man led me one way and then another, making turns unneeded by the lay of the land. We eventually came out by the creek, but from a different approach than we had left. I could hear my grandma calling for me again, not from up on the hill, from out in the field. The man would not cross the creek, but pushed me to do so. I did, but did not go to my grandma. Instead, I crept back to the house and around to the opposite side. There I laid the shrubs by our front door, pretending to sleep I was found. I swore I had been there the whole time. When I was sent back to my room, I placed my fool's gold crystal and charm in my bedside table for safekeeping. The next day, I went back to the creek to pick up my toys. The man was not there. However, throughout that summer, he did visit me again to sit under the tree or throw rocks at the water, or yammer softly to himself. I would bring snacks and candy to share, and he would likewise give me stringy dried meat, which I ought not to have ate, or honeysuckle blossoms, which I still would eat. Taken from my old bucket, he seldom visited long and never splashed and whooped like he did on a first meeting. At this point, you may be wondering why I've posted on Backwoods Creepy and not backwoods weird but wholesome i guess there were two more occasions i want to account one gruesome one awful the eventful one occurred near the fourth of july i had brought two boxes of bang snaps to the creek the man was initially wary of the little fireworks but quickly came to appreciate their miniature pyrotechnics he took the box i gave him gratefully even taking the empty box likely for the wood shavings which are excellent tinder during the use of the bang snaps, I had scared a turtle into the water, into the opposite bank. It sat there watching us from the far shore. The man, after stowing the bang snaps in the bucket, noticed the turtle. With little thought, he scooped up a smooth stone and threw it with force and accuracy to the turtle. He then waded over to retrieve the slider, which struggled meekly in his grasp. One leg knocked clean off. On my side of the river, he took from the bucket a new piece of stone. One side was rounded and fit in his hand. The other came to a flinty cutting edge. Working with deft experience, the man began chopping the live turtle above its neck, pulling up on the shell top. The thing struggled and bled as it was dissected. 
the dome eventually coming free. The turtle dropped to mingle its viscera with dirt and sand. The man rinsed the shell in the river, then offered it to me. In wordless horror, I ran. That evening, I came back to shuffle the dead turtle into the flowing waters of the creek. The shell itself was nowhere to be found. This experience did not deter me from going to the creek, or the man from visiting me again. However, sometimes he would try to call me away from the creek with thumps and whistles. I would tell him I heard him and refused to move. On some occasions, he would join me. On others, he would leave. The last time, we were sitting under the tree sharing cow tails. From the woods, there came whistling and the staccato knocking of a woodpecker. The man looked up and whistled back. There were a few more exchanges before he stood, collected his bucket, and beckoned for me to follow. I was curious and felt comfortable with the man as a guide, so I did as asked. He took me back to the ball, a direct pack this time, periodically stopping to call or respond to the other in the wood. Waiting for us at the bald was a woman and a child. The woman was dressed the same as the man, topless, wrapped at the waist. She was dirty with long hair and a wiry frame. The child was in a similar state, wearing a sack that went to their knees. The man sat on the ground and the woman joined him, sitting in his lap but leaning forward so that her elbows rested on her crossed knees. She had dark brown eyes that were fixed to me. The other child would not look up. I didn't know what to do and didn't speak. The other kid lifted their sack to wipe at their nose. And I learned under all that dirt they were a her. The man made a noise and drummed on the woman's bare back. The kid looked at them still hanging her head, hair covering her face. The woman yammered and swatted at the girl lazily. The man echoing her noises, slapping skin to skin once more. At this bizarre scene, the girl stumbled towards me stopping close enough that I could smell her and hear her wheezing breath. She was thin, but not emaciated, and slightly taller than me, should she have straightened up. The man and woman fussed some more, and the girl leaned close and pressed her cheek to mine. Her hair was in between us, greasy and cold. She made no move to embrace me, no move at all, only pressing limply against me and breathing so loud it was all I could hear. During this time, the woman had approached. She pulled the girl back by her shoulder with one hand and delivered a flurry of snaps to the crown of the girl's head. The woman then gathered the girl's hair in one hand, using the other to sweep back her bangs. The girl was then made to look at me, face bare. One side of her jaw was bulged out, smooth skin over a lemon-shaped bump. Her mouth was twisted by this deformity. Her nose faced to one side as if affixed sideways and leaked a trail of clear snot. One eye was bulged and roomy, the other startlingly regular. It looked at me, blank and dark brown. The woman gave the girl's head a little shake, spat off to the side, then cooed like a dove as she smiled at me. I fled. There was commotion behind me. I think the girl was pushed to the ground. I did not look back, and they did not pursue. My flight ended at my grandparents' house, my absence unnoticed. I chose not to tell anyone what had happened, wanting to forget, not wanting to get in trouble, not thinking about the girl, the couple, what was intended for me. I spent that August inside whenever I visited my grandparents. I begged not to be taken, claiming it was boring and lonely. Sometimes when I sat on the porch or went from the car to the house, I'd catch a snippet of bird call in the wind or the distant tapping of wood and hurry inside. My grandma could tell something was wrong and it made an effort to entertain me in town. My grandpa cared in his own way, involving me in his errands as he never had before. Eventually school started. Classes and friends eased me away from thoughts of the dirty man or the people in the clearing. Time did the rest. I think now that of all the people in the clearing were of a family, but their features, white skin, brown eyes, brown hair are common enough that they could have been unrelated. I am sure they lived together. They knew each other's signs and signals. They used their own words. I know that the Smokies are full of tales of feral people, wild men, and superstition. I also know that they are full of people living in unlikely ways in unlikely places. 
and that those real people call others kin. And that through the chain of human connection, even a recluse living in a rundown shack is someone's somebody. I guess I'm asking if the people in my story are somebody's someone, or if they are known, or if their behavior rings any bells, or lies any known intention. I figured here, where the tale would not be discounted out of hand, might be the right place to ask. I was traveling solo around the Olympic Peninsula in Washington State and making various stops in the Olympic National Park. I decided to stop in Quinault for the first time and took a random road that dead-ended at a beautiful spot at the edge of Quinault River. There was an ancient footbridge that led across the river, but it looked like it might collapse if I tried to cross it, so I decided not to. It was off-season, and I was not in a tourist area. I was the only one there. It was so unusually hot outside that I decided I needed to get in that water. I backed my car all the way to the edge of the dead-end road, faced it out in the direction I would need to leave, and started hiking through thick brush down an embankment to the edge of the water. There was no path. It was a pretty rugged area. It was mid-fall, and I didn't have a suit since I didn't plan on swimming, so I took my clothes off and got in the water in my bra and underwear. I had a nice swim but I could not shake the feeling that I was being watched, even though I was in the middle of nowhere. After about five minutes, the creepy feeling was enough for me to want to head back, so I started to climb out, turn my back to the other side of the river, and walk towards my clothes and shoes that I had left behind. When I turned around, there was a big, small man standing in plain view, just across from me on the other side of the river, but higher up on his embankment than I was on mine. He was wearing a poncho made of animal pelts, had long hair full of sticks and twigs, and looked like he had been living out in the wild for a very long time. We stood and stared at each other, me in frozen terror, for what felt like forever when all of a sudden he frantically took off in the direction of the footbridge leading across the water. I grabbed my car key, tried to grab my clothes and shoes, but they tangled up in some blackberry vines so I left everything and went running for my life through the thick brush and blackberries, barefoot in my underwear trying to make it to the car before he made it across the river. There was no doubt in my mind that he was trying to harm me. When I made it out of the blackberries, I could see that he was crossing the bridge towards me rapidly. I got to my car and flung my door open just as he arrived. I locked the doors while he pounded on the hood of my car, just screaming and grunting non-verbally. The moment he went for my driver's side door, I hit the gas and took off as fast as I could. I looked back and he was chasing after me. He must have run after my car for at least a mile until he faded from view. I was bleeding everywhere from running nearly naked through blackberries. I was wet, unclothed, shaking and crying. Had I hesitated for literally 10 seconds longer, I don't think I would have made it out alive. Even typing this story out again all these years later, I am starting to shake. I felt like I was being hunted. That is the only way that I can describe it. I will never go back to that area. Since that moment, I always bring a hiking buddy with me when I venture out into the forest. That day is going to haunt me for life. I've had many years of therapy, and that experience is still as vivid as the day it happened. Have you ever experienced anything strange in and around Florida? Apologies if this isn't allowed. I got to thinking after a couple of weird things I experienced in my hometown, and it had me thinking if anybody else has experienced anything. Back when we were teens, me and my brother were out for a walk outside of our neighborhood. Where we were walking was kind of wooded, but the houses were still pretty close together, yet considerably more in the boonies compared to our place. Anyways... We had almost completed the loop of the area and were around the bend going towards the exit when we heard something odd. I remember there was a helicopter overhead, 
around the time, we both heard this weird guttural yell slash growl, like right next to us. It was so close. It sounded like a mix between a mountain lion, an angry house cat, and yet oddly human-like all at once. We both just froze and looked at each other startled, and started looking around for the source, but there wasn't a single cat or anything animal-like about. I was pretty freaked out and practically sped walked to the road. All the while, my brother kept asking me what the F that was, but I was too spooked to talk about it. It was like a primal type fear in an instant we heard it, and I just kept looking over my shoulder the whole way back. Anyways, pretty benign compared to the other stories I've read on here, and I'm sure there's an explanation to the sound, but it did have me wondering, has anyone else experienced weird stuff in Florida? Years ago, I moved from a very small town to a remote valley out in the middle of nowhere, surrounded by national forests and not many neighbors. It was just what I had always wanted. At that point in my life, I had been a paramedic for about four or five years, and being an outdoorsy, civic-minded sort, I decided to volunteer my services with a local search and rescue organization. For being such a tiny, poorly funded organization, we were surprisingly busy. In the nine years I was with them, we'd have at least one rescue, sometimes several, every weekend spring through fall. The source of the majority of these calls was the roughly 100 miles of poorly maintained fire trails that were very popular with dirt bike and quad riders. When they'd inevitably get lost or wreck and get injured, we'd head out, track them down, provide medical care, and fly them out in a helicopter or put them on a Stokes basket mounted to a janky trailer thing that we'd pull with a quad. About two weeks after joining, and with zero training beyond what I had learned as a Boy Scout and medic, I got my first call. A group of dirt bikers from the city had lost a member of their party. For some reason, they had put their least experienced rider at the back of the group of a dozen or so riders and took off into the woods. When they returned to the trailhead four hours later, the inexperienced guy was missing. They sat out again and looked for him for four or five hours, then gave up and called 911. The time interval from the initial 911 call until we had a squad assembled at the trailhead was pretty impressive. No more than 20 minutes, but we were already eight or nine hours behind the ball. We did a very quick briefing, distributed maps, divided into teams, and then set off. They put me on a quad with the most experienced guy, and we headed out. The plan was for each two to three person team to take one of the longer trails that ringed the place. Then after searching those weeds systematically work our way into the shorter maze like trails that made up the interior. This was to be a hasty search. None of that grid search crap, just riding around looking for clues. I don't know what I had expected exactly. Maybe a few dirt roads through the woods or something, but these trails were an absolute nightmare. They were extremely rugged technical trails where you really had to know what you were doing and where you were going or you'd never make it out. GPS rarely worked due to the rugged terrain and tree cover. Radios and shell phones were a crapshoot and the maps didn't account for all the random trails that riders would just sort of make. The only marked roads were fire breaks and mileage wise those were accounted for maybe 10% of the trails. Why this guy hadn't been partnered with someone or put at the front of the group is a mystery. Four hours into this, I'm caked with mud, bleeding from being hit with branches, exhausted and just effing done. We take a water break and hear broken radio traffic that sounds like the bike has been found, but no rider. It's only a couple of miles from us, so we head that direction. When we get there, the bike is off to the side of the road, along with the quads of the other teams, but we can see them a few hundred feet in the woods. We walk over and find them looking at the missing person, who is very dead, lips blue, skin dusty, arms spread out like a cross. On first glance, his eyes looked to be wide open and solid white, but when I examined him, I could see that his eyes were actually covered with fly eggs. This dude had been dead a while. It didn't make sense though. His bike still had gas in it. He had water and food, and he was a healthy guy in his late 20s. Why was he dead? 
It looked like he had simply laid his bike down, then ran into the woods to die. Mission accomplished, I guess. We wrapped him in blankets, then put him on the stokes and took him to the trailhead where the coroner was waiting. About a week later, I ran into the coroner and asked what the cause of death had been. The pathologist's determination was cardiac dysythmia, secondary to extreme anxiety. The guy literally died of fright, which up to that point, I had always assumed was just Hollywood BS. I've always wondered what was going through his head. Was he just afraid of the woods or of being lost? If so, why did he run blindly into the woods instead of continuing to follow the trail? There's a part of me that thinks he may have seen something out there. I've heard a lot of stories about weird stuff in these woods, and I've seen a few strange things myself, so it wouldn't surprise me. I've been wondering where to share this. It's so weird. I don't even know where to begin. So I've been house sitting for some friends in the rural Pacific Northwest. They live up the hills on a long twisting road and the house itself is at the end of a long gravel driveway. The house also sets up against a big evergreen forest. I should also mention that at one point the driveway branches off and goes into the woods. I have no idea why. I've explored in there before and there's nothing. The road is too overgrown for a vehicle to get through anyways. Or, so I thought. Recently, it dumped snow up here, and I've kind of been trapped, as my gutless sedan doesn't have four-wheel drive, and the driveway is covered in over a foot of snow, and the road hasn't been plowed. Anyway, a couple of nights ago, I was setting up awake reading. I haven't been sleeping well because I got COVID, and the coughing keeps me up at night. At about 11.30 p.m., I saw headlights outside the window. I could hardly believe it. First, it was late at night. Second, there's been so much snow that most cars couldn't even make it up there. And third, my friends are out of state, and no one else would be coming up here, certainly not at night. I peeked out the window and watched as the headlights, instead of turning the bend in the driveway towards the house, kept going into the woods. Um, what? I was curious but I'm also a coward, so I didn't do anything as ridiculous as following the car into the forest in the middle of the night. But I couldn't let it go, so in the morning I grabbed my boots and parka and stupidly left the house to investigate. This next part I genuinely can't explain. There was one set of tire tracks in the snow, heading down the rough road into the woods. I followed them about a half mile into the forest, and they suddenly stopped. There was a large fallen tree blocking the road, and no vehicle in sight. The tire tracks just ended, and no footprints in the snow either. That's it. I wish I had an explanation, or a better ending than me running like hell out of the woods. But I don't. I'll be glad when my friends get back, because it is super creepy up here. My husband and I were on the way back home from Navarre Beach, heading towards the Alabama line. It was storming really bad that night. As soon as we were passing Blackwater Forest, it slacked up a bit. We both saw Bigfoot walking across the road. By the time we were coming up on it, it was almost to the other side. He looked so shocked like a deer in headlights. I asked my husband if he saw the same thing that I did and he agreed. I couldn't believe that we had seen it. A couple of weeks ago, he got sad news that our older woman friend that had stage 4 cancer had passed away. Yesterday, her daughter updated everyone with where they were having all the memorial services at, and one of the places just stunned me. They opened a restaurant, and it's called Bigfoot Crossing, exactly in the area that we had seen it. So now I'm wondering how many more sightings. I mean, it's got to be quite a bit. Now I want to go back out and check out the area more.
I was stationed in the panhandle of Florida near Pensacola. I was in charge of a team of about 10 guys taking part in an exercise. We were playing the bad guys for this exercise. And on that night, our job was just maneuvering. Mostly walking and driving around pretend villages. Anyways, we grabbed our gear for the night and went back out to an informal staging area to wait around for us to get called into the village. Being a group of young military guys with nothing to do, we started messing around. Driving in circles and up and down the nearby jerk trails in our trucks. Talking crap on the radios. Looking around with our night vision goggles, etc. Because why not? We spot an SUV parked down one trail, which was a bit odd, since we were on the military range at the time, but not crazy since we weren't near any of the sensitive or dangerous parts. I drive up next to the SUV slowly, and the guy, setting shotgun, with night vision goggles, says there's some weird person setting in it. He hands me the night vision goggles, and I look over, and holy hell, that person was terrifying. They were in the back on the driver's side, super tight skin crazy sunken eyes, thin lanky hair, at first just staring straight ahead, but they suddenly turned to look at us, and I booked it out of there. I practically threw the night vision goggles at the guy next to me. I don't know why, but I felt one of the deepest feelings of fear that I'd ever had. Literally the only times that were worse were times where I genuinely thought that I was about to die. We drive back to where the other guys were and I tell them about it. Of course, they think we're messing with them, but eventually we convince them to follow us and check it out. So now there's a convoy of three trucks holding ten guys. We roll past to let truck two get next to the SUV, and only a few seconds go by and the radio goes wild with them yelling, Go, go, go. We haul crap out of there, and all agree to find a new informal staging point to park at. The rest of the night, we'd mess with each other about the decent woman watching us or waiting for one of us to walk off alone and just genuinely joking around. But I did notice that no one wanted to go pee by themselves. Anytime someone had to go, suddenly a few others chimed in too. The rational explanation is that it was some drifter in the SUV crashing for the night, probably at least a little high, tired, and confused as crap about the trucks creeping up on them, then driving off real fast. I took a trip to stay in a cabin in the middle of the woods, high up in the mountains of the city of Ranger, Georgia, United States. This neighborhood was 30 minutes up the mountains, away from civilization, and even the cabins were spread far apart. The front deck of the cabin was completely exposed to the woods, so I acknowledged that any animals could stroll along if they pleased. But I stayed there for about a week, and me and my boyfriend sat outside on the front deck every night, very late and at no point felt in danger. It was peaceful with flyerflies out and sounds of crickets every night. Until the fifth night. It was eerily dark too. The moon was covered heavily. It was about midnight, and all of a sudden, I didn't feel peace like I did those other nights. The forest went completely quiet, and I felt a horrible sense of dread. I genuinely feared for my life. I sat there in my chair looking out into the dark forest trying to rationalize and calm myself down that it was just my mind playing tricks. But all of a sudden, my boyfriend said out loud that he felt unsafe. That's when I realized it wasn't just me. We then both heard a blood-curdling scream, and we pulled out a flashlight to see what it was. Turns out it was a gray fox. They make scary screaming noises. The weird part was that the fox was running and had its ears and tail down like it was scared. This was in June, and I read that foxes scream like that when it's mating season or if they're in danger. Their mating season is winter, and this happened in June. So I do believe that this fox was in danger, or afraid, as well adding to our fear. The cabin has three floors, and we were able to climb out the window and sit on the roof, because we still wanted to be outside and relax. Didn't matter how high up I was. I felt something truly evil and stayed inside. The only other time I felt something so evil or like someone was watching was when I had a few paranormal experiences at a haunted house. 
Georgia doesn't really get mountain lions that often. Maybe a bear, but it didn't feel that way at all. It felt unnatural. I've lived in the backwoods of Northern California most of my life, hours north of the Bay Area. So with that being said, I have a million weird or creepy stories, most of which can probably be blamed on wildlife, but not all of them. This would have been about two years back now. I was living in an isolated neighborhood with my parents right at the edge of a thin, dry national forest. Anyway, one night I woke up at about 5 a.m. to the loud sound and purple light of the garbage truck speeding by. After that, I couldn't get to sleep. A few minutes after, I get up and start walking down to the kitchen for a midnight, or I guess early morning, snack. Out of boredom and insomnia, I decide to go into the backyard. It was an unusually warm, dry night for the season, and it felt nice to get outside, but something caught on in the corner of my eye. I looked up to see this huge ball of light in the sky, completely still, just a little bit above the neighbor's roof. I stand and stare for about 30 seconds to a minute and run back inside completely freaked out. Does anyone know what this could be? It was completely clear and in Northern California, not a place for weather. So I've ruled out ball lightning and I'm kind of stumped. So here is a little less backwoods, but more country roads of a paranormal story. Every summer, my family and some close friends would all travel up from Southern California to the Eastern Sierra Nevada mountains along the California Nevada border to the town of Bridgeport. If you've ever been, it's a super cool area. Big biker route to Reno Tahoe. Excellent outdoor camping and hiking into Yosemite high country, rich in wildlife crazy old history with native tribes in the gold rush of the west, has Bodie Ghost Town nearby, and my favorite is the world-class trout fishing. Mark Twain even once stayed in the town way back in the day, which I thought was cool. The town is small and has your typical 20-building Main Street USA to match the field, all surrounded by rivers, lush meadows with cattle and horse ranches, and absolutely gorgeous wooded snow-capped mountains. We would often camp up near Twin Lakes, just outside of town about 10 miles, but always made a point to get to town for dinner at this bar, Reno's for pizza and beer, at least once during the trip. So one night we do this, and afterwards we're on our way back to camp at twilight, just light enough to make out the peaks on the horizon, but still densely dark with billions of stars out in force. Now this road back to the camping area would zigzag through the square cut properties of ranch land, it's a narrow two lanes edged by barbed wire and an irrigation canal, and minimal streetlights, if any at all. Literally can only think of one installed by the dude ranch out here. So, we drive back to camp, having to use our brights due to the dark, and making sure to keep an eye out for deer. And when we finally pull into camp, my mom immediately asks, Did you see that kid in the swimsuit on the side of the road? Perplexed and a little amused by the idea, I say no. Where was this? On the side of the road near the cows, he was shirtless walking along the road. I had been driving behind her and my dad. There is no way I could have missed this had someone been there. Nobody in our car saw him, and my dad said that he didn't either when she initially saw him. Not shocking for my dad, though. However, also not shocking would be my mom seeing something paranormal. It always seemed to follow her, and she was dead, excuse the pun, serious even described the color of the shorts, his hairstyle, said he was walking the same direction we were traveling, so she couldn't see his face and had to be in his 20s. So we half-jokingly jumped to that conclusion that maybe it was in fact a ghost. After all, it was dark and late. Nobody else had seen him. And even in the summer, the Sierras are high enough in elevation and have crazy enough weather to easily kill someone who wasn't prepared for the cold night, especially shirtless in swim trunks. 
on a clear night in August, I've woken up to the teens for temperature. And where she was describing was in the literal middle of nowhere in these fields. It takes us about 20 minutes just to drive it at a good speed, let alone walk to camp in the dark. But I guess anything is possible. The next morning, we get up to learn my idiot friend, same one who got scratched in a previous post I wrote, left the cooler out after the rest of us went to bed and a bear got a buffet out of us. So we decided that we'll make the most of it and go back to town for supplies, some further fishing spots, and get in dinner again. This time, on the way back to camp, I'm driving in front of my parents, zigging and zagging through the fields, when all of a sudden there was a bright set of headlights right on my butt. Looking back, I could tell this had to be some sort of lifted truck, maybe a Bronco or similar rearing up on my SUV. So close at times, I thought we were going to get rammed. I started speeding up a little at first, but this car stays right on me. I'm starting to get annoyed and concerned. After all, this was a two-lane road at night that anyone wanting to pass could very easily and safely do so. And there isn't any area you could really pull over without risking pulling into a ditch and getting stuck. So I continue speeding up. But I'm getting concerned because I know the hills are coming up and there are deer by the thousands in this area. But this car's lights keep pressing. My wife, then girlfriend and friends, start getting a little freaked out as well. Thinking about the backwoods BS butthole of a human being that is pulling this. And this continues through the fields until I get to the final turn before it goes from meadows to woods. And I get a really heavy gut feeling. Almost like a scream in my head saying slow the F down. So do or die, I start pressing the brakes. Hard fully expecting this truck to ram us. As I do this we're coming around the corner. And sure enough, there's a pack of six or so deer in the middle of the road. I was immediately a little shaken up. It's always a little startling when you see animals out of the dark while driving, especially big ones. And then it dawns on me that I'm not being blinded anymore, and we definitely didn't get hit. I look back in the mirror and the lights are gone. Just gone. No dust in the rear brake lights from a vehicle pulling off the road. Nothing screaming by us in the other lane and no road for them to even have turned off on. Headlights lighting up the tree or area. And then I see my folks coming driving up right behind us. All of us are dumbfounded trying to figure out where this person went. The deer clear the road and we make the rest of the drive to camp and adrenaline immediately gets me a bit irritated. So I start ranting off about how stupid this guy was and how we could have died. Blah, 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 really making everyone feel good. When we get out of the cars, my mom immediately starts giving me the typical parent talk. But I get even more angry when she calls me an idiot for taking off like that on such a dangerous road in the dark. And how lucky I am to have not killed us all with those deer. And how I needed to be more careful, etc. Well, if that butthole hadn't been riding my butt, it wouldn't have been such an issue, I say. What are you talking about? She responds. There wasn't anyone behind you. Oh, how the tables had turned. Luckily, my wife and friends had experienced everything with me, and they start chiming in about the truck, and I start talking about how I finally had enough and listened to my gut and reason, deciding to slow down just as we come to find the deer, and how the truck was just gone. It gave my mom chills, and she apologized but told me to be careful next time, but then started laughing and saying how weird the trip had been. I'll give this to my mom. She never did call us crazy for what we experienced in life which is something I think a lot of parents neglect to do for their kids. It's funny, because I always heard similar experiences from country towns back east, or folklore of ghost trucks, and thought how stupid it sounded. But now, after experiencing it, holy crap is it dangerous. Plain dangerous. I'd never wish that on anyone. This road hasn't given us any issues before or since. But I'll admit, I drive it with a lot more caution now. I always wonder if the shirtless guy and the truck were somehow connected, but never found out anything about it. Only God knows, I guess. I've always been super creeped out by this experience, and I've thought a long time about posting it, 
But it wasn't until I told one of my friends this story that they pointed out that this might be a men in black type story. Anyway, here we go. It was my middle brother's 10th birthday party. So this was 2006. And the woods I grew up as my backyard was Seneca Creek Park, which is also where Blair Witch supposedly took place. My brother's birthday party was pirate themed and I guess my mom had given us chocolate coins for treasure. I don't really remember why, but all the boys at my party, myself and my mom, walked through the woods before having cake. My youngest brother, Jesse, six at the time, told me when we got back to the house that he left his coins by the bridge in the woods. That part of the woods was where a fork came in the path. Left was the bridge leading to a walking trail and right was deeper on the path headed near the creek. So I decided I would go and find his coins and told him to come with me. Oddly enough, my mom warned us not to go, but we still did. And for some reason she led us. The bridge was about a five minute walk from the bottom of our hill. That was our backyard. We walked into the woods and everything was normal just like it was when we were there with the group. We finally made it to the bridge, and I found Jesse's coins right away. I was bent down, and Jesse was behind me, and I looked up while grabbing the coin, and there's a man in all white with a white-brimmed hat. I thought it was a cowboy hat, and then a man behind him wearing all white too, but no hat. They appeared out of nowhere, and I started backing up right away when I saw the first man because I felt pure fear. He saw me scared and backing off, and he said, I don't bite. That's when I told Jesse to run, and I was screaming run and we ran home. I didn't even check to see if they were following us, but we ran all the way out of the woods and up the hill screaming because the group plus my mom were on the back deck and I knew that if the men knew people were listening for us, maybe they wouldn't chase us. We told the boys and my mom what had happened, and my mom said, See, I told you so. And that was it. It was so scary, and they truly came out of nowhere. They just appeared. My brother remembers this just as vividly as I do. Has anyone ever encountered men in all white in the woods? I never really knew what all this meant, but it was so creepy, and this is probably the best place to try and figure it out. Thank you for reading this far. I'll try to answer any questions. I live in the countryside of France. My village is settled at the top of a hill and surrounded by forests and crops with no stores nor a bakery. My parents' house is near two farms and behind the garden there are large crops. These are essential elements to the story. The bathroom's window overlooks the garden. Before my parents built a veranda, there were curtains. So every time I closed it when I was going to the bathroom, which made my family laugh, why are you closing it? No one's watching you. I was like, we don't know that. It's just in case. Then the veranda was built and my dad got rid of the curtains and put strips on the window. I got worried because I love to know that I have intimacy when going to the bathroom. And I even showed my parents that when we were standing at the end of the garden, we can see us in the bathroom. Of course, they laughed. You're just being paranoid. Weeks passed, and then I noticed a tractor being parked just at the end of the garden. Every night the tractor was there. My parents also noticed it and thought it was weird. We have lived there for 20 years, and it has never happened before. Sometimes we felt like we were being watched, but we shrugged it off, thinking that we were just being paranoid. My dad came to talk to the farmer to get rid of the tractor, and then it disappeared for a while. Today, I was smoking outside, and my mom came up to me and told me, I think you're right. We are being watched. 
Yesterday night, I was going to the bathroom, and the tractor was parked in front of the garden with its headlights illuminating the bathroom's window. I turned the light off and went to the veranda and took a picture. Then he left. I'm glad that I was right, but worried because I don't know how long he or she has been stalking us in the bathroom. What are your thoughts on this? Thanks for reading. I was in Blue Ridge, Georgia and young, must have been eight or nine. My parents went for a walk and I decided to stay home due to the neighbor's dog scaring me so much. I no longer remember what it was that caused me to go outside on the porch, but I did. There, a good 50 feet away from the house was a young buck, velvety antlers starting to grow. As I stared at it, I had the most bizarre vision it was like someone suddenly switched my eyes to x-ray and I panicked that lightning had struck the deer because it was suddenly inverted and I could see its bones through it. Like an actual x-ray, some coloration, you could see the outline of its entire body and then its bones as if they were painted over its body. An instant later, my vision corrected. The deer was back to normal and I had a panic attack in the crawl space. I was scared to be near windows in case it was lightning and I would be struck. This has never happened to me again. Before I start, I want to acknowledge that it's likely that this was just a mountain lion. Either way, it's one of the scariest things that has happened to me in the woods. In early March of 2021, I was just barely recovering from a significant concussion, enough to where I could drive again. I still couldn't work for another few weeks and couldn't look at screens or even read, so I was spending plenty of my time just going on short walks and such to pass the time in ways that didn't aggravate my head. I went to a small trailhead that I hadn't been to before. If it weren't for the trees, I think houses about one half mile away or less would have been visible from the parking lot, so I wasn't exactly deep into the wilderness. I had a weird feeling that I shouldn't go. I was alone, but as always, I was armed with my CCW and figured I was just being goofy because it was a dreary cloudy day with some chill and a slight breeze. I approached the trailhead feeling very strange, like I shouldn't be there. I saw a single car in the parking area and figured that maybe since a previous car of mine had been broken into at a trailhead a few years previous, I was worried that it would happen again with my car now, being the only other one up there. I backed in and hung out for a few minutes. Two dudes with fishing poles came from the left, where I couldn't see, but could clearly hear a rushing river. They got in their car and left, and my I shouldn't be here since persisted. Being an idiot, I still got out and headed up the trail. I had no idea how long it was or where it went, but I didn't really intend on going the full way unless it was short. I just wanted to walk for a little while outdoors. The trees hadn't gotten their leaves back, and it was a dreary day as I mentioned earlier, but that usually doesn't put me on edge. As I walked, the strong feeling to turn back got more and more obvious. I felt myself glancing all over literally constantly. It wasn't even fun anymore to be up there. It's only been a couple of minutes too. I mean, the feeling of dread was so immediately strong that I could still see my car in the parking lot when I finally decided that it was time to go because it has gotten that strong so quickly. I turned around hand on my pistol in its holster, and stopped to listen. A few seconds after I turned around, I heard a big footstep off to my right. It was a big snap of a branch that had been on the ground already, maybe 25 to 30 yards away. I'm not sure if it matters that the branch was already on the ground, other than I know that it wasn't deadfall. I've been working in audio for way too long and can tell you a lot about an event simply by how it sounds. 
That might sound silly, but it's important to know that I could 100% tell that it was a footstep that had, likely accidentally, stepped on a branch that was already present on the forest floor. I waited a second or two after this big snap to head out. I looked over at the place that it had come from, able to see what felt like a decent amount because of the lack of leaves on the trees, but I couldn't see anything that looked alive. Not wanting to trigger a pursuit instinct in whatever it was, I started walking down the trail. I had my sidearm in hand, drawn at that point. My car wasn't far, and I'm a naturally fast walker, so this seemed like the best course of action. I got back to my car in a minute or two, and heard nothing at all besides the nearby river rushing by. Having backed into my spot, I started my car and put it in drive, but had my foot on the brakes. I wanted to see if anything came into sight, and then peel out of there if so. Nothing ever showed itself. Not that I could see anyways. As I left the area, the dreadful feeling went away, and I had a normal rest of my day, but shaken up a little. I don't know what it was, and don't make any claims. As I mentioned at the very beginning, it was probably a mountain lion as this occurred near the Box Elder area of Utah, and they're often seen coming down into the cities. So, one still in the mountains, but only half a mile from some fancy houses probably isn't too strange. Either way, a few things still strike me to this day. One, whatever it was, clearly knew that it had revealed itself when it stepped on the branch, and was smart enough to recognize that I immediately looked in its general direction as a result. The fact that something saw me, saw me notice its mistake, and that I still saw absolutely nothing in turn during the middle of the day, still freaks me out. Mountain lions are notorious for their natural camouflage, so this still tracks. The sense of dread, number two, before I even got to the trailhead. I felt this a few times, as you might see in my other post in r slash the truth is here. But even then, I didn't feel the same dread like I did here on this little trail. I knew that I was going to be in danger, then ignored that, and then knew there were eyes on me by something that I couldn't see myself. Then that instinctual knowledge was confirmed when there was very clearly a large step taken among the trees to my right. I've had a handful of stories similar to this one that are also 100% real things that have happened to me that I think I'll try to post someday. I keep running into similar situations because I keep going out when I have the sense that I should not. Maybe someday I'll learn. I live in the heart of the largest ponderosa pine forest in the world. This makes for a beautiful, albeit rugged wilderness that can shift from pleasant to dangerous, empty to heavily populated in the blink of an eye. Phoenix and Flagstaff are separated by roughly a hundred or so miles of pretty isolated backwoods driving. There is one stretch between communities where there aren't homes or residential areas at all for about 50 of those miles. This is National Forest for Outdoor Recreation. The only buildings are ranger stations and one space observatory that is pretty far back into the forest. The observatory has many weird legends about it, like being privately owned by the Vatican, which there is some evidence for. My mom was driving between townships in this very isolated span of woodland when she came upon a boy walking down the roadway. He looked to be maybe 15 years old. My mom doesn't stop for people as a general rule, but she turned around and decided to help the kid out. Only when she circled back around did she realize her mistake. The pedestrian wasn't a boy, but a small man close to her age. He had boyish characteristics, but was dirty and strange. Even his clothes were weird, almost too plain, as if handmade. He tried to get in the car, but my mom kept it locked. She questioned him for a bit and learned that he was an android, trying to make his way back to the colony. 
He explained that there was a camp of homeless people, what he called vagrants, that were being reconfigured into androids. These androids weren't allowed to drive or interact with humans as a whole. That was not unless they became separated from the rest of the colony. This wouldn't stand out as strange if not for all the other stories that I've heard about this place. A ramshackle place with plywood buildings and other roadside trash coaxed into shelter. Cult and commune are the usual labels. And word is, they all dress exactly the same. In late summer of 2019, I'd say maybe a couple of miles away from Montello, I was walking down in the woods in Marquette County, Wisconsin. I decided to go in the night after dark because there would be no heat, and I didn't want to get heat stroke out there. I was taking a walk on a foot trail some people used, and made, but it's not an actual trail on any maps. Anyways... Moments before the experience happened, I checked my phone and it was 1.42 a.m. A couple of minutes later, I hear, Hey bro, can you help me? From a direction I was facing, and I said, With what? They said come closer, which made me choose to run back down the way that I came. And yes, I got chased down and heard, I need some help, bro. Funnily enough, a deputy was driving by as I floored it out of there as the dude hit my car with a knife, scratched my truck a bit, and dented it. This happened in September. No, the deputy did not do anything, as I don't think that they really cared. I was camping with my kids when I woke up to the sound of blood-curdling screaming. It was my own kids screaming. They were pointing at the tent door. The zipper was unzipping, and a tiny hand came in and was trying to pull my backpack out. I forgot that there were raisins in it. Raccoons. My kids were terrified of raccoons before this happened, so their screaming was intense. They calmed down after a couple of minutes, and I expected to hear someone shout, everything okay over there or for a park ranger to walk up because there were lots of campers in sites nearby and my kids were screaming bloody murder like straight from a horror movie but no one checked on us i imagine maybe they were all laying there too scared to move in case they were the next ones to be murdered and that maybe they are still wondering about the screaming ghosts or unreported murder to this day This is a story from when I was in high school, around 2010-ish. My parents' house backs up to a small wooded area. It's not a forest by any means. There are walking trails and other neighborhoods around. But the woods are big enough that we used to see deer and the occasional fox. There was also a small creek that ran through it. And I used to spend time in the fall slash winter, poking around back there when it wasn't obscured by brush. I found what I assume was likely a deer path that ran all the way up to my old elementary school, which was about a block away via roads, but using the deer trails took about 10 to 15 minutes. I was back in this area fairly often, which is why the following story was so weird. I went down to the creek one day and followed the trail like normal, but this time I found a partial deer skeleton at the end. The head and the front legs were missing but the rest was still there, and there was no flesh at all on the bones. They were stripped absolutely clean, and the bones were still a bright white. At the time, there weren't coyotes in the area like there are now, and I'd seen a bobcat once when I was little, but they definitely weren't very common. To this day, I have no idea how that skeleton got there or what happened to it. It was too clean to be a predator kill. And that also doesn't explain why the front half was missing. I got so freaked out that I never went back into those woods again. 
this took place in a residential area, not a hunting ground. It could have been a predator kill, sure, okay. But I'm positive that that thing wasn't killed by a human. Not with houses and an elementary school, literally, across the creek. About a year ago, my girlfriend and I were on a trail to Lamille Lake in northern Nevada. It's about 1.5 miles each way, I think, and usually pretty well populated. It was that day as well. There were at least a handful of people on the trail here and there, plenty down at the trailhead parking lot, and it was otherwise a totally normal sunny day. Evening began to come, and we started heading back down, not wanting to be out when it got dark as there is no cell phone service up there for quite a distance, and it was just an afternoon weekend hike. We started down the trail, and I got the slightest hint of a bad feeling, like we definitely needed to get back in our car before it got dark. I think that's generally just common sense, and doesn't need to be prompted by a sixth sense or anything. Still, I kept an eye out as we went. Weirdly, absolutely nothing happened until we were maybe 300 yards from the parking lot, the trees had largely been left behind as we descended in elevation, and bushes, large and small, were there instead. There was a creek that ran through to our right. Ahead of us, by maybe 50 yards, was a lone woman and her medium-sized dog on a leash. I had my head on a swivel the whole way down, because I was just trying to keep an eye out and make sure that hint of a bad feeling didn't amount to anything. I was also carrying... This woman was ahead of us by about the same distance for a good while down the trail, and I felt somewhat responsible for her safety as well, if anything strange were to happen. Mountain lions are known to live higher up in those mountains, the rubies, and she was pretty much in sight the whole time, so I was trying to help keep an eye out for her too. As we're walking, me and the girlfriend both hear what seemed like a big boulder sliding and grating along a stone surface. It lasted for a few seconds, and we were both looking at the stone surface mountain slope, maybe 600 yards to our left. I'm bad at judging distances, but I think that might be close. Fully expecting to see a landslide of some sort. But there was nothing, and daylight was still good enough that if there was something to see on that front, we would have seen it. I immediately looked to the lady ahead of us. And just a second later, she and her dog started booking it. Right as they did this, a herd of deer came sprinting out of the bushes away from the boulder sound. It must have been closer than it sounded. They ran across the creek and kept going to our right. After pausing for a second to discuss what that weird sound might have been, we hurried along as well, and I drew my gun. We passed the same little section where the lady was when she took off, and thankfully nothing happened. We didn't hear or see anything in those bushes, though I'm not surprised. A whole herd of deer was in there, and we couldn't see them until they ran out, despite being at a higher elevation at the time. We quickly made it back to the parking lot, and I put my gun back in the holster. It felt safer getting back to the pavement for some reason. We caught up with the woman and the dog. She was catching her breath and pacing a little. We asked if she heard that weird sound and she said that it sounded like a loud bouldery sound. And then off to her left, directly close by, right where the deer came running from, she distinctly heard a big low growl after the boulder sound. And then she heard the deer coming and ran to get out of the way. The deer probably would have just run right into her if she hadn't moved. Watching this happen from a ways above and behind just a minute or two previous, they came out onto the trail right where she had been a second before. We determined that it may have been a mountain lion. I'm all for believing that, but I still have two questions. One, why did I get the feeling that we needed to leave, even subtly, around 45 minutes before anything strange happened? And two, why and how did whatever it was make a big sound of a boulder scraping along, not tumbling, but sliding? very different sounds and then there was a clear growl heard by the woman
but not by us. I think that that indicates that there was something absolutely in those bushes, but I'm very confused about the bigger sound. I doubt the same animal made a huge boulder scraping sound. It sounded like it was sliding down the mountainside, and the deer didn't run, and then that same creature made a normal growl sound from the same place, and that was what scared the deer off. I don't know what I believe about this, but it was certainly a strange experience. Also, this was one of the few times that me and my girlfriend had been on this trail together and never had any strange experiences. I myself had been there several dozens of times over the course of many years and also had never experienced anything remotely weird, even towards the night time. So this happened about seven years ago. I was around 19 or 20 and I was a scout leader. We had a camp in a forest. The nearest city was about 10 to 15 minutes drive. Every year in July, we would have an international scout camp. Scouts from different European countries would join us. I was in the preparations team and we would go around two to three weeks in advance to clean and put the tents up. In the preparation team, we had around 20 people. 10 to 12 men, and the rest women. We were all in our late teens or early 20s. If anyone has been a scout, you might know that the first thing in a camp is setting up a flag. The flag is an important part of this camping game. Other scouts would constantly try to steal the flag. If they managed to steal, then the lost team would have to go home. This never actually happened. No one was ever sent home. It was just a rule to keep other members involved and willing to protect the flag. Therefore, we had to constantly keep an eye or a guard near the flag. Other games involved attacking other teams and kidnapping members. All fun and games, nothing violent or harsh. It was fun and made us to be alert 24-7. So here's where my creepy story begins. One night, our preparation team was done with everything. The other two countries from Europe, about 60 people, were set to arrive in the morning. We had nothing to do, so we set up a campfire and started singing and talking. We had our guards, people from the team, set up in different locations. Two near the flag, two near the entrance, and two in the woods facing the river. So we were tired and decided to go to sleep. We would change guards every two hours. Each guard had a whistle. If an animal or a person was to come to the camp, they would blow a certain note of a whistle as to alarm danger. That night, I was an hour into sleep when I heard a whistle. We all woke up and ran to the team member who had whistled. She claimed she saw three white figures running fast in the forest near the set-up tents. We thought that the morning teams arrived early and sneaked in to steal the flag or kidnap a member. So we all decided to stay awake and go into defense mode. We each stood guard in different locations watching for any signs. After some time, we started hearing whistles from the deeper parts of the forest. We also started hearing radio sounds from different places. We saw some guys in white shirts running around in the forest. Me and two other people decided to check the empty tents to see if there were people hiding in the empty tents, but we couldn't find anyone. Then we started walking around and we heard loud laughter from a bush near us. It sounded like a woman laughing. So we started laughing too as we thought we found another scout team near the bush. Naturally, we walked to the bush without any hesitation. To our horror, there was no one there. Then we heard more noises from another bush that was a little bit deeper into the woods. Then we heard a clear conversation between a few people speaking in a French accent. We could hear them clearly, so we checked, and again, nothing. Then we saw a guy in a white t-shirt running fast again in front of us but his speed was weird. He was running so fast as if he was sliding. Keep in mind, we were in the woods at night with no lights. There's no way that someone can run without making a noise. But somehow, this guy was running so quietly. It really seemed like he was just sliding. Again, we still didn't feel threatened. We just had an adrenaline rush, but it was more excitement to catch them than anything else. 
After all, we just wanted the fun to begin. We were excited to see the teams again and have fun. For the next two or so hours, we kept hearing whistles and whispers in French, but we couldn't find a single person. It was so clear that there were a lot of people hiding around us, but we couldn't even catch one of them. They were so fast and so sneaky. This is important to mention that the arriving teams were not from France, so it was weird to hear them speak in French. Anyways, after two hours of running in the forest, in the dark, I got tired. I didn't take this too seriously, so myself and a couple of my friends went back into our tent to rest. I laid down, and after 10 minutes, I saw a car light speeding towards us. This area is not designed for regular cars to drive. None of us or the other teams had cars. A bus from the nearby city would drop us there and pick us up after the camp was over. We heard a car coming straight towards our tents with high beams on. It was coming so fast that we were frozen, expecting it to hit us at any moment. It happened so fast that we couldn't even run. Then suddenly, it just stopped right near our tent. We heard the door open but heard no footsteps. Whoever it was just closed the door and left. We were shaking, and at that moment it hit me that it couldn't have been anyone from the other teams. We got out and learned that our other teammates also had seen a jeep speeding towards our tent but didn't see anyone coming out of the car. After this, we just decided to stay awake until morning. Throughout the entire night, we kept seeing these white-shirted men sliding around us. We couldn't see any faces. They were fast and weird. We could hear loud laughters and French whispers all around our camp. We could tell that there were a lot of strangers near the camp who were either messing around with us or had plans to hurt us. The sun came up and the strange things stopped we didn't manage to catch anyone or figure out who they were. And in the morning, the other teams finally arrived. We had this leaderboard meeting every afternoon where we would discuss daily plans and meals. Also, we would share about any planned or failed attacks. All the team leaders said that they arrived in the morning, so they were not even in the country at night. Up to this day, I have no idea who these people were. I have no idea what they wanted or what their plans were. They never attacked or kidnapped anyone in the team. It was scary when I think of it. What would happen if we didn't have guards that night? What would happen if we were all asleep? At the end of the day, this was a campsite in a wooded area. And woods can be places where cults and crazy people gather. I was doing a property inspection in the winter as the sun went down. I do basic CAD drawings of properties for title companies, so I have to measure all the buildings and show where they set, show driveways, easements and whatnot. This property was an abandoned pig farm in the middle of nowhere, with a house and a number of large farm buildings. The house was left with the doors standing open, and being curious I stepped in and looked around. I had an immediate feeling of repulsion. There was an odor that was off, but that wasn't it. I just knew something bad had gone here, and I left to start measuring. It was getting dark. When I measure buildings, I have a measuring wheel and have to keep my head up to see when I'm parallel with the end of a wall. So I was hurrying through the work when I tripped on something and fell in the snow. I had a headlamp on, and in the snow, staring up, eyes open, not a foot and a half from my face, is a frozen dead dog with an obvious bullet wound on the side of its head. I actually let out a gasp slash scream thing that was pathetic. It scared the ever loving crap out of me. This happened to me over the weekend during a hunting trip. I spent last night trying to Google and figure out what the heck I saw. I haven't found anything that doesn't seem like conspiracy craziness, so I'm open to any suggestions. A family friend has a few hundred acres in Tennessee. Once a year, my dad, uncle, and myself 
and the guys in the family that own the land go on a week-long hunting trip. They have a cabin and a trailer tucked away at the edge of the mountain that we stay at during the week. There is no running water, and we use a generator for lights during the evening. Phone service is non-existent out there. The nearest town is Murphy, Tennessee, which is about 50 minutes away by car. Typically, we get out to tree stands slash ground blinds at around 4 a.m., and then come back to the camp around 9-ish, grab something to eat and nap, and then head back to hunt until sundown. All week, my uncle and I hunted the same plot. It was on the east side of the property and took about 20 minutes by four-wheeler. We would park the four-wheeler in this big clearing, and then the ground blind I was hunting from is another 15 minutes or so by foot. It's a rough 15 minutes, too. I basically walk along this ridge line on the side of the mountain, and the blind is set just inside the underbrush of a tree line that overlooks an opening at the start of a river. My uncle was hunting in a blind that was a little closer walk and probably 30 minutes away from me. We hunted the same spot Sunday through Thursday. Thursday evening, we were all drinking beer and hanging out by the fire. My uncle, having not seen anything all week, wanted to go to the plot my dad was hunting. It was a 30-minute walk from the camp. You don't even need a four-wheeler to get there. I had killed a deer the first afternoon there and seen a bunch of does that evening right before sunset, so I wanted to stay where I was. So Friday morning after we hunted, I helped him pack up his blind and ride it out to the plot that my dad had been on and helped him get set up for that evening. I took the four-wheeler by myself that afternoon and continued hunting the same ground blind. Same thing as I had done all week. Everything was fine. Nothing out of the ordinary. Until Saturday morning. I had gone out by myself again that morning and had watched a bunch of deer that crept up right before the sun started coming up. They were a bit further than I wanted to shoot, and when they got closer to the edge of the river, they weren't big enough or were too young for me to justify shooting. I watched them until they retreated back into the woods, and at this point, it's probably 8.30 a.m. or so, and the sun is fully up. Now, this is an embarrassing one for me, but oh well. Having spent almost an entire week packed in this trailer with two other guys and no privacy, I decided that I was going to have a little fun before I went back to the camp. Every hunter has done it. I don't care if you admit to it or not. Now, I'm sitting there doing my thing, and even though nobody ever walks up while you're hunting out there, I'm still on high alert, making sure that I don't get caught by one of the guys while I'm doing this. I'm laid back in this chair inside of the blind, basically one eye looking in front of me, and every now and again peeking behind me through the mesh to make sure that no one's coming. That's when I started hearing crunching. I knew it was people's footsteps, and I could tell that it was more than one person. It was to my right, and the mesh of my ground blind and underbrush kept me from being able to see who it was. I calmly got myself ready, and quietly leaned up so that when my uncle or whoever it was came up, I could act like I was just sitting there hunting. Keep in mind, we are so far out in the sticks that it never even occurred to me that it could be anybody other than someone that I was hunting with. I listened to them walking, and finally, I slowly stood up and poked my head through the blind and peeked over the underbrush. It was four people walking towards the river in a line. They were wearing these black cloak-looking clothes, like something they wear in Harry Potter, with these furry hats that covered most of their faces. It looked like some weird cult, but the guy in the back of the line was completely naked. He looked disgusting. His hair was curly and way too long, and he had a big beard that looked nasty, like it had a bunch of leaves and stuff in it. I'm bundled up with hand warmers in my pockets because it's like 25 to 30 degrees out. This guy had to be freezing. No shoes either. This is thick underbrush that we're talking about walking through. Rocks jutting up from the ground and stuff. No sane person is out there barefoot, much less completely naked. The guy had to be 115 pounds too, just completely unhealthy looking, like these people that had been keeping him prisoner or something. The sight of these guys was so unnerving to me that I was still standing there frozen in an awkward half stand, half bent over position, with my head out of the blind watching them, before it clicked with me that I needed to slowly set down. At that point, they had passed the point of the blind where I couldn't see them and were walking with their backs to me towards the river. I slowly sat down 
and put my rifle in my lap and watched them all step ankle deep into the river. They were facing side profile away from me towards the woods. And I could see two of the clothed people moving around the naked guy and one of them was standing still holding their arm out in front of them. I got the nerve to look through my scope at them and it looked like two of them were washing the guy with the river water and the other one holding their arm out like a chain or something. The one holding the chain was talking, but way too far for me to hear any of it. After a few minutes, the two doing the washing stopped, and all three of them held hands around the naked guy and started moving in a circle around him while he just stood there staring ahead. They did this for at least five minutes. That doesn't seem that long as the time, but five whole minutes of watching whatever the heck that was seemed like a lifetime. Something of note that clicked with me last night. Whatever they were doing seemed time-based. My watch beeped at 9 o'clock and nearly gave me a heart attack. No way that they could hear it, but in my head, I was picturing them all turning and looking at me. But right after my watch beeped, they stopped a few seconds later, at 9 on the dot. The three clothed people stepped back in a line in front of the naked guy, and they walked back the way they came, exactly like they came in. None of them talked or broke the line while they were walking. It was terrifying because the way out for them was the first time I could truly have been in their line of sight. They never saw me though, and I watched them once they passed my head back up the mountain from where I assumed they originally came from. I waited for 30 minutes or so and booked it out of there fast. This story takes place in Navarre, Spain. When fall comes around, woods get packed with people trying to gather all sorts of edible mushrooms. It's a pretty popular thing to do in Spain, since they can get pretty expensive once you purchase them at any grocery store. Anyways, he goes all by himself, like he's done multiple times, but after a couple of hours, notices that he can no longer recognize where he is. It's getting dark, and there's no service at all, so he's screwed. He starts panicking. My uncle calls 112. It's the European equivalent of 911, because that's the only thing you can call when there's no service. They can track his position, but they aren't able to send any forest rangers yet. After getting off the phone with 112, an older guy pops out of nowhere, and mind you, he's super deep in. He just straight up tells my uncle that in order to get out, he needs to take this certain path. He starts walking that direction, and the old guy just disappears out of nowhere. Turns out, he was right, because he was able to get out. To this day, he doesn't know if it was a hallucination, or if the man was real, but he made it out safely, so at the end of the day, that's all that matters. Out back of my neck of the woods is an old dirt road. It's hard to access unless you know how to take a turn down another old road that runs around the back of the coal mine that I work at. Anyhow, if you follow that old road until you get to a T intersection, you can either turn right out to Hale Creek or left, which will take you out to Mount Coulon. Now, Mount Coulon isn't much of a town anymore. It's an outback pub and that's it. There used to once be a town there, but everyone upped and left once the railway line got moved to the coast. That was the only reason the town existed for so long. Or, for as long as it did. It wasn't the start of the town, though. Way back in the early 1900s, gold was found in their hills by a prospector named Thomas Coulon. He staked his claim and settled there with his family. Some local aboriginals found him and his family living on their land and weren't too happy about it. So they attacked his home, throwing rocks through the windows and antagonizing him. Well, Thomas went out and shot the lot of them, all dead, then in a fit of grief over what he had done, sat down on his porch, and unalived himself, all over the wall behind him. Fast forward to the year 2021, 
I was working out at Hell Creek Mine at the time on the maintenance crew. I'd had a big seven nights of 12 hour shifts and had very little sleep. I had left my mining camp the following afternoon, still not feeling the best, but set out for the long drive back home to Moranba. Anyhow, dusk came along, then nightfall. I was driving for what seemed like forever, trying to make my way back home. I was constantly looking out for the turnoff on the old back road that ran up behind Gunyella Mine, but it never came. I kept on driving and driving. Hours went by. I was on a very unfamiliar road. It started to bend and twist and turn all over and narrow to the point that my little Kia Rio could barely get out without making the scratches on branches of old looming trees hanging over the road. I was definitely lost. So I pulled over to check my Google Maps. No signal. Of course. I was so confused. Did I miss the turn? I thought, maybe it's a little further up. So I pressed on and kept driving. Then, out of nowhere, I see an old and worn sign off to the left of me on the side of the old dirt road, Mount Kulon 15K. I thought, okay, I've gone way too far out in the sticks. Better turn around. Before I could, though, I saw off to my right the entrance to what looked like a cemetery with an old and rusty archway, and above on the archway was in rusty, wrought iron lettering, Betsy's Rest. Well, my curiosity got the better of me, so I veered in there to have myself a quick squiz. Sure as crap, there was a road that went into a giant U-shape around an old cemetery full of tombstones. Generations of cattle farmers and jackaroos, etc., who all must have worked on the various stations in the area. It gave me the spooks pretty bad, so I got out of there quick and made my way back onto the old back road. I kept heading back from whence I came, hoping and praying that I'll find this bloody T intersection. Over an hour passed, and then my worst fear happened. The fuel light flickered on on my dashboard. I'm driving on this road in the absolute middle of nowhere. It's now midnight. No one will probably find me for days if I ran out of fuel. I was absolutely beside myself. This is the outback of Australia. You run out of fuel, water, or food in the outback, you've just signed your own death certificate. Done and dusted. All I had was a couple of sandwiches that I took from the camp mess hall and a bottle of water. Better than nothing but not enough to last a couple of days stranded on the side of an old back road with no phone signal. So I kept cruising along, being extremely careful not to go too quickly or over-accelerate around all the twists and turns. As I'm driving along this lonely road, I see a shadow out of the corner of my eye. I think nothing of it, though, keeping focused on the road ahead. Then I hear it, swooping and whooshing noises above my car. What? I look up and see what I can only describe as a giant bat creature with red eyes flying directly above my car. It startles me and makes me accelerate at a rapid rate. Yet, it's flying overhead, gliding effortlessly and keeping in pace with me. I'm watching my speedometer, reaching neck-breaking speeds, and I'm bouncing all over the old and bumpy dirt road while this creature glides down to my driver's side window, looks inside at me and grimaces. Then, just as it does, it flies up and disappears into the night air as quickly as it had appeared. I floored that old clunker of a car of mine until the heart leapt with joy at the sign of life in that desolate hellscape. I saw the Gunyella mine, CHPP's lights cut through the vast and empty void of darkness. I knew then and there that I was within 10 to 15 kilometers of the intersection and turn off back home. And sure as heck, I found it. Anyhow, I managed to get all the way back home, and I'm very grateful that my clunker ran on the oily rag and the vapors in my tank kept me alive. I told my partner at the time all about the nightmare I had been through, as she had been expecting me home the evening prior, and it's now 6 a.m. in the morning. My phone was full of missed calls from her, which I apologized profusely for. I hadn't even thought to check my phone as I had no signal for the better part of this entire journey. Well, that was part one. Part two is the next story that I have about Mount Kulon.
the actual experience I had when my partner and I convinced ourselves to drive all the way out there one night just to see the actual town. If you're interested in hearing that story, let me know. Have a good one. Mount Kulan, Part 2 Months had passed. I kept having recurring nightmares about that vile winged creature. It had entered my dreams. I woke up one night sweating in bed. My heart rate was racing. My partner asked what's wrong. Again? I had just been waking her up super late at night when I would have this horrible nightmare. This whole situation had impacted me. The desolate hellscape would reemerge in the dark nights plagued by the old outback road menacing my demise with the off chance that I would make one wrong move and come undone escaping that creature. Something had to be done, and I knew what I needed to do. You see, I'm a man that'll openly admit that I can't overcome anything in life unless I face it head on. That's the only way I know. No use sticking your head in the sand and pretending things will just go away. So I spoke with my partner and after much discussion, we both agreed that we would go back and investigate the back road to Mount Kulon and investigate the town itself. And to really drive the nail in, we were going to do it at night. I needed answers. I needed to know what lay at the end of that old road and whatever else I may have missed on my first misadventure. We set out at 6.30 p.m. and headed for the old back road, which now is inaccessible. You can go take a look for yourself, but the mine has shut the gate as it runs along the inside of the mine's boundary. Anyhow, we were driving my partner in mines at the time new Bitsabitsi Mirage. It was a really beast of a car, but it had all the kit that we needed for a long drive, and we made sure that we left prepared. We had food, water, and snacks, my tool kit in case of a breakdown, torches, a first aid kit, a two-way radio, and a battery pack for phones and the two-way radio. My trusty hunting knife, which I kept in my side door compartment, as if I was going out there again completely unarmed with God knows what lurking out there in the dark. The first leg of our adventure was rather fun. I felt a bit like Colin McRae taking the old dirt road that twisted and turned in all directions, slithering my way up to the T intersection. Once we got to the intersection... I took the left turn to head north and gradually west. The familiar road was as it was the same night that I encountered this strange flying beast. Except tonight brought a slight amount of comfort as there was a full moon in the night sky illuminating the surrounds and edges of the road. As we approached the old cemetery, I told my partner to look right. She was in awe. I asked if she wanted to go take a look but she was too nervous about it, so I kept on driving along. As the night went on, we came to the point of no return. The road became nothing more than a dirt track interspersed with sealed sections the local farmers had laid prior to and after crossing old relics of bridges. They were rusty and wrought iron, sturdy, but foreboding at the same time. We crossed two of them on one stretch, one built over the Coalfields railway line, heading eastward to the port, Another was over a deep ravine. The bottom was clouded by dense native plants. The road got very narrow and snaked right and left and down and up. We were in unfamiliar territory now, and I was growing apprehensive about what I would see or find. At one point, I swore that there was no road at all. We were basically driving through a wide open field, and I had to drive at 40 kilometers per hour max to avoid any ruts or depressions in the ball dust. I was starting to think this entire trip might have been a mistake when the road then came good again to compacted dirt. A random sign appeared off to the right of the road stating that we were now deep in aboriginal land and that was how it would remain until the ends of its time. The drive went on and on. Hours had passed. Were we any closer to our destination? For reference, I switched the car's function from Bluetooth headset to radio to scan the FM slash AM for any signs of life. Nothing. 
I thought, well, I'll check again in an hour. An hour had passed, so I checked again, scanning, scanning. A muffled and distorted voice emitted through our car, and then the sweet sound of music. It was ACDC's Highway to Hell. Huh, how befitting, I thought to myself. I said to my partner, right, love, check the signal on your phone now. She replied, two bars. She immediately checked Google Maps. I parked the car in this small spot of salvation while it loaded up. According to Google Maps, we were approximately 30 minutes away from a fork in the road, one way heading west out to the Never Never, another heading towards Mount Kulan. Good thing we checked. So we headed onwards, and sure enough, there it was, the fork in the road. No signage indicating which way to go, just one road slightly more compact than the other and wider. So we kept true to the road that we were on, and then came a faint glimmer in the distance, a faint yellow light on the horizon. As we approached the light, it developed into a service station, off to the left of the old dirt road, with a storefront that looked completely empty, save for a cash register on the countertop. We were now at the main intersection. Signage indicating to head right was to head towards Collinsville, left out west into the Never Never. I came to a stop off to the right shoulder of the road on a dirt patch made by trucks that had turned here before. I checked the fuel gauge, half a tank. I looked into that old rundown service station, scanning the area for any other signs of life outside of the faint yellow glow of the iridescent tube lights above the old and rusted Bowsers that looked like they hadn't been used since the 80s. Then I saw a figure emerging from a back room. It was a frail old woman her hair tattered and distressed. It looked like we had awoken her. The time was now 11.30 p.m. She came to a stop inside the abandoned storefront and just stood there, staring at her car. I thought, better come forwards and ask if there's any chance of fueling up. So I pulled in and rolled down my window. She came outside into the night air and approached me with a great deal of hesitation. Excuse me, I'm so sorry if we woke you. We were just wondering if you had any fuel. She stood there, glaring and studying me, her face withered from the harsh outback climate. No, no fuel here. You better leave, now. Something felt off. There was a tension between us. And so I said, okay, thank you. So sorry. We'll leave now. Thanks again anyhow and sorry again. So I wound the window up and got out of there. We drove around the old pub in the center of what was once the town. It had multiple V-double road train tracks parked all around it, almost like they were protecting the pub itself with a wall of steel and rubber in the desolate darkness. A picnic table with a tin roof cover appeared on the right of the massive loop road, the only road in the entire area that was sealed, and even it was rather narrow. Thanks for reading. I'll post part three, our return trip, directly after this. Here is part three, our return trip. In part two, we had discovered the heart of Mount Kulan, an old outback pub slash general store slash post office. The most notable thing that I'll say about this pub is that it had an amazing veranda. It fully encompassed the exterior ground level and was solid hardwood varnished. Whoever owns the pub has taken great care to preserve it, as it's all that really remains of the town bar the old petrol station converted into an old couple's new home. Anyhow, where we left off. As for lighting. What lighting? This place was clearly not welcoming after dark, albeit for two street lights in the entire area that glowed faintly, only illuminating small patches of the loop road. You definitely wouldn't want to be out there with no headlights. We did the brief tour of all that was out there, then made our way back towards the road back home, my partner said hold up, so I came to a stop, again, off to the side of the road back out to the Miranda. She had just discovered on Google Maps a quicker way back home. This would take us out on that old dirt road, out west in the fork in the road. However, as you continue down that road for 50 kilometers, you'll come to another fork in the road, 
taking the leftward track, will take us to the Gunyella Road, which then headed back home. Good on ya, I said to her. So on we went. The Mitsubishi ran on an oily rag, too. It was only a little four-cylinder powerhouse, like my Kia Rio, so I felt confident that we'd make it back. On the drive back, it was another long and slow slog. At some points, I'd have to slow to 20 kilometers per hour to make it around tight bends and twisting and turning through the rough and thoroughfare, which went wide open cattle farming properties. Then, at points, the bushland would thicken around creeks and runoff areas, and you couldn't see a meter off the sides of the road. After taking the leftward turn in what was a slight fork in the road, we made our way homebound, and then it happened. A large creature came bounding out from the dense bushland and right out in front of our car. I came to an abrupt stop, and there in our headlights was a massive cow. It looked at us, then took off back into the bushland. I was a little stunned. That was close. Too close. So on we went back home. The rest of our journey was rather mundane to say the least. The only exception was an interesting stretch of road that had been well sealed and snaked through dense bushland. I was impressed by the craftsmanship of how well compacted it was. Then suddenly we were back on dirt road again. Hours on, and we made it to the Gunyella Road. Intersections with lighting signaling the turnoffs to local mines and explosive factories that make the bomb products for them and so on and so forth. The usual akin of the cold fields. Then we made it home as the first light of morning emitted from the horizon. Pulling into our driveway, we both looked at each other, shrugged as if to signal, what the heck was that all about? Then got out of the car and headed inside. It's a strange feeling out there. It's the desolation, I think. The lack of. It's what really drives the tension, I guess. Any moment can be fraught with demise, but it gave me the closure that I needed to put the rest of the monsters in my head. Whatever I saw that night, when I made that near-fatal misadventure, will remain a mystery. And maybe that is for the best. This happened last night, and I'm still pretty freaked out. We're up at my father-in-law's for Christmas. He lives in South Jersey, in a pretty remote area just north of Burn State Forest. It's quiet, and always a little eerie, but felt especially weird with the overcast weather and unseasonable warmth of the last few days. We did Christmas dinner at my brother-in-law's, and got back pretty late. Because of the radiator heat and outside temps, we slept with the window open. I woke up in the middle of the night to use the bathroom, and as I was drifting back to sleep, I heard a low wail, building in volume for a few seconds before stopping abruptly, figuring it was just an odd-sounding bird and trying to go back to sleep. It happened twice more over the course of maybe five minutes. I was basically able to put it out of my head and start drifting back to sleep, when I heard a loud, shrill blast, like a too high elephant's trumpet. At that point, I shot up, my heart racing. I knew I had to close the window and took a beat to build up to it. When I dragged myself out of bed, I peeked through the shutters before I reached to shut the pane. Whatever it was had tripped the motion sensor light at the back of the property and was half illuminated. Standing maybe a hundred feet from the back door, right at the tree line, it was cloaked with its head partially shrouded. The bottom of its face looked flat and round like the back of a dinner plate, with another smaller, half-uncovered black circle at its center. I immediately slammed the window shut and it didn't move, just stood there with its face tilted towards the window. I shut the blinds and crept into bed and basically hid until the sun came up. I didn't hear any more sounds. I dared another look out the window after dawn and the figure was gone, and I managed to drift back to sleep for a few hours. Has anyone seen like this or know what it might be? I've been frantically googling, but nothing really coming up.
This happened many years ago, when I was about 10 or 11 years old. I wouldn't describe the area that I was in as backwoods necessarily, but it was a wooded 100 plus acre ranch. The land is in the southwest part of the United States. My family owns the property, and we have family reunions every year, and all stay for about five days to camp. There's an area of the ranch where we all set up camp and cook and eat. Getting to that part of the ranch requires driving through a small village and several gates for about two miles. The first gate beyond the village is slightly past a set of railroad tracks. That's a lot of description, but it's relevant later in the story. Because I had been camping at the ranch for as long as I could remember, and the land was private, my parents would allow me to go off on my own during the day, as long as I didn't get too far. I'd spend time walking the property near our camp, looking for arrowheads or trying to catch tadpoles in the ponds. On this day, I left the large camp area after lunch, which was around 11.30, and told my mom I was going to a nearby creek. I planned on catching some tadpoles to bring back to camp and be back on time for a swimming trip that my cousins were planning. They wanted to go to a nearby river, and I really didn't want to miss it. I made it down to the creek and got several tadpoles. I probably spent a total of 15 minutes down there. To get back to camp, I would have needed to either climb up a relatively steep embankment with a lot of loose rock, or circle around on a longer route with a flat trail. I'd usually go up the embankment, but I didn't have a top for the water bottle that I caught the tadpoles with, and I didn't want to risk slipping and spilling them out slash killing them. I had never walked along the longer trail by myself, but I had with my dad, and I felt confident that I could find my way back to camp on it. As I walked back to camp, I had my head down looking for arrowheads in the washed out areas of the trail. I started feeling a little creeped out as I continued walking. We all know that feeling like someone is watching. It was unsettling, but I chalked it up to just getting spooked being on the trail by myself. Now, the next part I cannot explain whatsoever. It's as if a light switch was turned on, or someone snapped their fingers and I came back to reality. Except when I came to, I wasn't on the trail that I'd been on before. I was near the railroad tracks, and it was completely dark. My mom was standing in front of me shaking my shoulders and yelling, Where were you? Two things I remember really clearly about the moments I came to are, one, the look of fear, anger, and relief on my mom's tearful eyes as she was yelling at me, and two, the confusion that I felt about what was going on. The last thing I remembered was walking on the trail back to camp, and now suddenly it was dark, and I was at the railroad tracks leading to the ranch, which was over two miles away. The best way I can describe it is to compare it to a movie, The Butterfly Effect. The main character would be living in one moment, then somewhere, suddenly, he'd wake up somewhere entirely different. My parents drove me back to camp, and I learned that it was 10.30 p.m. This meant that I had been gone for 11 hours, about 10 and a half which I can't account for to this day. My parents and all my family had understandably freaked the heck out when I hadn't returned to camp. They had been looking for me all day. I was a really good kid, growing up, and almost never broke any rules, so my parents were baffled at my behavior. I tried to explain to them that I had no memory of getting to the tracks, but they didn't believe me. They thought that maybe I got lost and was too embarrassed to admit it. This was the only time that I've ever experienced something like this. I can't explain how unsettling it is to not be able to account for all the hours that I was gone. Was it a coincidence that I had that creeped out feeling on the trail and then just lost ten and a half hours of my life? I wish that I had answers for what had happened. Has anyone had anything similar happen to them? I work as a counselor at a summer camp in Southern California. The place is very out in the woods, so we get all sorts of animals wandering through, from deer and foxes, coyotes howling in the distance, to a mountain lion that's been spotted in the area. The camp also occasionally has a spiritual slash haunted vibe. There are a couple of creepy and weird spots, some things in that area that we think show the place has been inhabited in the past, 
ghost stories, etc. One night after putting my kids to bed, I was standing outside our cabin, talking to another counselor, when my friend Sadie comes running by with her entire teenage girl's cabin, maybe 12 of them, all dressed in black and freaking out. She screams at me that she thought they heard a ghost, and once her kids were asleep, she'd meet me back here to explain and investigate. Sadie is normally the level-headed type not to freak out easily, so this really caught my attention. She meets me back at my cabin, maybe 30 minutes later, and explains what was going on. She took her campers on a night hike, had them all dress up in black and pretend to be ninjas. All was fun until their way back, they passed a particularly dark part of the trail when they heard off in the distance, just beyond the tree line, what sounded like a faint help from a small child. But each time they heard it, it got more and more distorted until it no longer sounded human, yet still sounded like a child yelling help in the distance. Naturally, they freaked out and ran. Me and Sadie decided to be good counselors and go investigate the sound of a small child yelling help. As we walk over to the area of the trail, we hear it. It doesn't sound like a small child anymore. It sounded more like a demon screeching out its best impersonation of a child. And it didn't sound like it was coming from any point source. But more was coming from an entire mountainside. We booked it back to the safety of the main part of camp, where we tell this story to anyone who will listen. The next day, the camp director had a meeting where they told us to tell our campers not to freak out at the sound of bobcats in the forest. They are harmless, but do make a high-pitched yelping sound at night. Our friends wouldn't let us live that one down all summer. My uncle built a house on some small acreage that he has that is pretty far out there. There's not another house within two miles of his at least, and most of that is woods and cow pastures. But his place is beautiful. He built it all by hand and has a wonderful wraparound deck, perfect for family get-togethers. We were all out there, probably 20 adults and five or six kids for a party one day. It was one of those summer times when it's blazing hot out, but the light breeze is cool enough that you don't notice it after a while. I had been there hanging out all day when I was asked to run into town and grab some more groceries. So I packed up and headed out. I got the groceries and everything was fine. As I drove back, it was starting to get dark, and it was at a time of the year when dark comes fast. It was pitch black out there when I finally arrived. As I pull up, I notice something is setting in front of my car, facing the house. It was not disturbed by my headlights, but it does glance back at me once. It's a panther, just chilling there, watching the party. And as I sat there for a second watching it, I notice that it has specifically placed itself near the edge, where all the kids are running around. After I have my headlights on it for a minute or so, It kind of looked back at me again as if to say, okay, I was caught, oh well. And then it gave the most human looking sigh and just walked off into the woods. I sat there for a bit before building myself up to getting out of the car and going to the party and telling everyone. I went to Guatemala with my girlfriend, did a three-day hike through the jungle to Tikal, slept in a tent at two tiny ranger campsites deep in the woods. During the second night, a massive thunderstorm was coming down above us. At 4 a.m., I woke up and heard some male voices, and I left the tent to check it out. Two guys with rifles approached me, told my girlfriend to stay in the tent because it was scary. She didn't comply and joined me. Turns out, those guys were local hunters looking for shelter in the camp. We offered them coffee. They were more than happy. 
About 30 seconds later, the storm got so intense that a big tree fell and crashed onto our tent. If I had not left to check out the guys or worse, my girlfriend would have listened. We both would be very dead right now. When I was a kid around eight or nine, my mom, grandma, brothers, and I went camping at a small camp about two hours from the town that we lived in. We went there a lot and even had a particular campsite that we had slowly built up over the years. On this particular trip, we had my aunt and uncle's dogs with us since they were doing military tours. They were both very well-trained bird dogs, but usually really calm and friendly. The first night on this particular trip, and one of the dogs, Star, starts growling in the tent at about one in the morning. My mom is thinking something is outside and arms herself and investigates with the dogs. As she gets out the tent, Star and Ariel would not let her move to the other edge of the campsite and both get into attack position while hurting my mom towards the car. This is while also keeping themselves in front of the tent. By this point, we're all up, and with a group of kids under 10 freaking out. For a reason, she can't even explain today, my mother packs up camp and gets us all into the car to head home. After about 10 minutes out of the campsite, a car starts following us, and the dogs get in the back and just growl. By this point, everyone was in borderline panic mode, and my brothers were crying the entire car ride home. As the town came into view, you have to cross a huge bridge to drive in, and the car was still following us. And as a kid, you make stories to yourself that nothing is wrong, and the car behind you is just full of scared people too. Yet, as we start across the bridge, the car stops and just turns around, speeding back the way we came. We stopped at a gas station, and everyone was near meltdown mode, and my mom goes in to get cigarettes. But Star would not let her back into the car, until she could see her clearly. This, and a camping trip a few years ago, later convinced me that camping is no longer my thing. I had a pretty long stint in the Boy Scouts, and one time we were camping on a reserve in the Midwestern United States that's normally used in the summer for large sessions, i.e. 1,500 scouts scattered across a large campground. We were camping in October, however, and camp wasn't in session, so it was just our troop of 30 or so guys, plus the adult leaders on this massive, empty reserve. Now, the summer session has a pseudo-Native American society that serves as a leadership-slash-craftsmanship program, sort of an extension of Boy Scouts. The Order of the Arrow would be a similar example. Part of being in the society means crafting a lot of ceremonial outfit type things. So A, you learn how to work with your hands, and B, the ceremonies look pretty cool. Well, it was the last day of our trip, and it had been unusually hot and calm for October. The last thing we do before piling into the cars is a litter line. Everyone lines up, and we walk the campsite to ensure we leave no trace. We were walking along when one of the guys says, Hey, I think I found a coup. Now, coup are fairly valuable out there, because they're a specially shaped bead that you can only get when you join the society. Everyone's coup is unique, and it's usually shaped to reflect the person who joined. Whoa, man, what kind of coup is it? Well, it looks like... Or tornado. Whoosh. This cold, hard wind came out of nowhere and started pushing the trees and kicking up leaves everywhere. The timing. What in the heck? Hadn't had so much as a breeze for three days. We decided our litter line was good and got the heck out of there. Society members don't just lose their coup. I wonder what happened.
A few friends and I had a long weekend, five days off from school, and we decided to go camping in the North Georgia mountains. We packed a big 10-person tent. There were five of us, two guys, three girls, and we loaded up into my buddy's truck. He and I had some experience being outdoors, camping, hiking, and hunting, and he's an army veteran. So we packed really well and had all sorts of amenities, like a propane stove slash grill, fold-up cots, a portable shower, etc. We were in it for the whole weekend. We left Wednesday afternoon and parked the truck in a small town and started hiking into the woods to find a spot. It was a fairly normal hike until we got about four to five miles in. The first time we noticed something strange was when we came into a little clearing in the woods with a big pond slash tiny lake in it. We stepped into the open area and everything stopped. No birds chirping, no squirrels running around, even the clouds and wind seemed to stop moving. My buddy and I both thought, well crap, there's got to be a predator nearby, and took out our handguns. It's the law in Kennesaw, just in case. I've never seen a bear in Georgia, so we figured that it was a mountain lion or maybe some coyotes. My friend and I were looking through the edge of the clearing, and he grabbed me. He nodded across the water, and when I looked, I saw what seemed to be a woman standing just at the tree line. She was maybe 150 yards away. We assumed that she must live somewhere nearby, and so we continued walking past the water and clearing. As we headed back into the woods, I looked over my shoulder at where she was standing, but she was gone. The sounds of the forest returned once we got into the trees. We made a campsite about two miles past that, as it was getting late and we didn't want to be stuck building a camp in the dark. We got everything unpacked and set up and built a fire, popped a couple beers and sat down to hang out. There was a girl that I was interested in on the trip, and we had been flirting, so after a few beers and the sun was down, we snuck away from the fire under the pretense that she wanted help setting up part of the tent. We started fooling around, and after a few minutes, she stopped and looked at me funny. I asked what was wrong, and she said, Nothing. It just got really quiet. We both quickly dressed and headed back outside to the fire. The others hadn't noticed anything strange and didn't mention anything wrong, except joking with us that it took us a long time to fix the tent. On the first morning, we found that the propane stove had been turned on, but not ignited, and had gone empty overnight. None of us had used it. The second morning, we noticed some things had gone missing. A lantern we left outside by the fire was gone. My crush's sweatshirt that she left on a little folding chair slash stool. We figured we just misplaced things, or that someone had used them and put them somewhere else. During the second full day, Friday, we were looking for a waterfall that we read online was in the area. We were following the river upstream when everything went silent again. My buddy nudged me while we were walking and indicated up to the top of a hill next to the river. I looked up through the trees and was just able to make out the figure of the same woman, same clothes and all, just standing. I couldn't tell if she was looking at us or not, but she was standing there. My buddy told the girls that he saw a mountain lion following us and that he was going to go scare it off. He hustled up the hill, making a lot of noise, and came back about ten minutes later. He said he scared it off to the girls, but told me aside that the woman wasn't there when he got up there. We found the waterfall and put it out of our minds as the girls decided to skinny dip in the river. We hiked back to camp and found it a mess. It wasn't totally trashed, but it was clear that something had gone into our stuff. We told the girls it was probably raccoons. We both took our guns to bed with us. That night, stuff went sideways. I remember waking up because my crush was squeezing my arm. We had been sleeping cuddled up together. I opened my eyes, and she hushed me before I could ask what was wrong. There was complete silence all around the tent. I looked across the tent, and my buddy was sitting halfway up looking around. We both stayed awake for the next two-ish hours until the sun started coming up, and then packed our stuff and we all headed out. The entire hike back to town was eerily silent. There were a couple of points that I thought that I saw the woman through the trees, but I never got a clear sight of her. 
We avoided the lake completely and got back into the truck in what seemed like half of the time that it took to get out to the camp. After we were safely on the road back home, the girls and my buddy all started to tell everyone about moments that they thought that they heard slash saw the woman all weekend, but were too freaked out to mention it out loud, like she would go away if we ignored her. The wild part was that none of us could describe her face. It's almost like it was blurry. I have no idea who she was, but I have never been camping or hiking at night ever since. I went camping by myself way out in the middle of nowhere in north central Pennsylvania, drove on dirt forest service roads for over an hour, and then hiked about six miles in on a barely recognizable trail. There were no signs that anyone had been in the area recently. The trail was almost completely overgrown, no footprints, spider webs everywhere, etc. I didn't really have a planned stopping point. I was just looking for a nice place to camp, but the trail followed a creek in a valley and was very rocky and not flat. As the sun is starting to set, I came upon a fork in the creek with a nice flat spot just on the other side. As I got closer, I saw all sorts of stuff laying about. I crossed the creek and started looking around. There was a tarp on the ground by a stone fire ring, a log about a foot in diameter that had been chopped with an axe. A little bit away, I found the entire contents of what you'd imagine to find in a hiker's backpack. Food, a cooking set, camping pad, first aid kit, etc. All strewn about on the ground, but no backpack in sight. There was a pile of clothes down by the creek that looked like it had just sat through the last rain, which was the day prior, and a towel hanging from a tree. There was an area that had clearly been used as a toilet, for maybe 10 to 14 days based on the amount of toilet paper piles. The strangest thing, though, was this cage about four foot square made out of saplings tied together. It was framed where the edges of a cube would be and then had crossbars diagonally on each face. But it wouldn't have kept anything inside because of how much open space there was and obviously wouldn't have been very sturdy since it was only made from saplings. I ended up deciding to set up camp there because it was nearly dark and I didn't really have much choice unless I wanted to hike out in the dark on an unrecognizable trail. I had a 12 inch knife on me and I kept that thing in one hand the whole time that I was there, thinking that some crazy guy was going to jump out and try and eat me. All night I barely slept and kept thinking that I was hearing things. And then as soon as the sun came up, I packed up and got the F out of there. Everything turned out fine, no crazy cannibals or anything, but it still really bugs me because I don't know what that stupid wooden cube frame cage thing was. I called the forest service for the area and told them about it. I even sent them pictures. They said they'd send a ranger in to check it out and clean it up, but I never followed up to see if they figured out what it was. The ranger on the phone told me that it was probably either someone with a still nearby, someone growing pot or just some loner living out in the woods. I roamed up the sides of the valley before I set up camp and didn't see anything. A still seems unlikely because of how far you would have to carry equipment in, and the area really isn't great for growing pot. So maybe it was just some guy living out in the woods. But why the cage? If there's any interest, I can probably find the pictures. Oh yeah, and last year I was camping out in Colorado and woke up at about 2 a.m. to a pack of coyotes running through my camp howling. Sounded like at least 20 of them. My dog was asleep next to me the entire time. Probably best that he didn't wake up though. He would have gone nuts. And I'm told that coyotes are much bolder in packs. I went to Shenandoah National Park in Virginia with a college buddy. JMU was super close, so he and I took some camping gear from work, 
and headed up there to catch that Perseid meteor shower. We hiked a good ways in, on, and out and back trail that ended up with a cliff overlooking the Blue Ridge Mountains and was awestruck. I set up my two-person tent and he rigged his hammock with a tarp a few yards back. And then we sat on a cliff and watched the stars go by. Here's where life got real for me. We go to bed pretty early that night and around what I could only guess was 3 a.m., I start hearing tapping sounds all around my tiny tent. Now I knew it wasn't rain or him playing a joke on me, so I started to panic a little. At this point, I've been fully awake and alert for 10 minutes and I can easily hear his tapping. I finally grow a pair and decided to turn on my flashlight. And what do I see when looking straight up through the mesh top of this tent? Hundreds and hundreds of centipedes. They were falling like a gentle drizzle all around my tent. And I felt like I was on an episode of Fear Factor. Long story short, I didn't sleep that night, obviously. But my buddy, who was about 15 feet away, was out like a rock. In the morning, there were dead centipedes everywhere. I'm normally fine with bugs and insects, but not swarms. I don't know how we didn't see any centipede carcasses the day before, or when setting up camp. I went on a group retreat type thing over a fall weekend about eight years ago. My husband and I and our three girls, all under age 10. This was an annual occurrence, but we were flush that year as a result of our company doing well. As a result, we avoided the communal bunkhouses and decided to rent a camper. The RV rental place explained that it would cost the same for three nights as it would for two. So we decided we'd return it on Monday despite the retreat being over earlier on Sunday. So the weekend went great. It was super hot and we were happy to have AC. We didn't notice it at the time. Different people being in and out all day, not staying in the RV much over the weekend because of activities. But the previous renters hadn't bothered to clear out the septic lines in the camper. By six o'clock Sunday evening, it stunk horribly and was backing up into the toilet. My husband was anxious about the rental company blaming us so he decided to go to the Walmart in the neighboring town for some Drano. Mind you, this particular location, while open all year, is rarely occupied outside of retreats. I'll confess that we haven't been back since this occasion, so the details of why don't really come to mind. But as I recall, it was privately owned by a church in the area, and they used it mostly for their own purposes and events. So my husband leaves around 8.30 p.m. for Walmart, it's an hour plus round trip thanks to the rural area and skinny back roads. I start straightening the camper, packing our belongings and getting the kids settled. He'd been gone for about 40 minutes when I had gotten everything squared away and delivered the last glass of water to an overexcited child who'd been on the move all day and was having trouble relaxing. I curled up in the bed to read and wait for my husband to get back in case he needed help. The lights had been out for about 20 minutes when I started hearing a clicking sound coming from the window behind the bed. I stilled instantly and ran through a self-reassuring checklist. It's the trees scraping against the glass. Nature. A sound in the environment nearby. Or an axe murderer. That was option two. I got up and walked very slowly to the kitchen. The noise followed. As I was climbing up into the loft area over the trunk can, I hear the door handle rattle and then the scraping sound. I'd gotten a knife as I passed through the kitchen, which I was sweatily clutching as I hauled down on the edge of the bed in the loft, guarding my children. I eyed the cabin, making sure every access point was locked and hoped that whoever it was, it was definitely a whoever at this point, would go away. I leaned left and right trying to get signal on my cell phone to call camp security or my husband or anyone, but it wouldn't dial. I waited, panicking. It was about five minutes of torture later that I saw headlights through the portholes on the side. Coming along, the winding road to the RV sites, and my husband entered the cabin, looking at me weird. 
he scoffed at me for being a city girl and told me that people didn't break out of prison and attack women and children in random rural campgrounds. I expressed that I'd heard the door rattling and that it wasn't a coincidence of nature, but he brushed me off. We passed the test of the night without incident, though I was too on edge to sleep. The next morning, we drove into the town to return the RV. On the once-over, demanded by the rental agreement, the manager came around to my husband and asked if he knew what had happened to the rear window. It seems that someone had used a switchblade or some similar item to remove the gasket from around the window where the back bedroom was, where I'd been reading the night before. There were gashes in the paint consistent with knife marks, and the gasket had been sliced off. The window lock was also damaged. It seems whoever had done it had also tried inserting the knife into the door's lock and between the jam and the lock in another attempt to gain entry. Fortunately, they didn't get in, and we were not charged for the damage to the RV. Needless to say, I never consented to a solo camping trip again, and I always go in a larger group now. Safety and numbers and all that. But it still makes the hair on the back of my neck stand up. In the late 80s, I was in my early 20s, and two friends and I went camping in Central Florida. Two of us were working for the park service at that time, so we were able to camp for free in other parks in the state. Both of us had done a lot of camping before. Me, I grew up camping with my family on every single vacation, all over the state. For the other friend with us, this was her first camping trip ever. We were camping in the youth area, which was empty that weekend and was quieter and more isolated than the regular campsites. Later in the afternoon, on the second day of our trip, we were all sort of spread out in the area of the campsite, being within shouting distance but enjoying a little solitude. I was collecting firewood. Every now and then, I'd kind of feel like someone was watching me. I'd look around, see and hear nothing, and then shrug it off and just go back to what I was doing. Later on around sunset, we had the bonfire started. One of the rangers who lived on site, about a quarter of a mile away, came over with a truckload of firewood and a six-pack of beer. We all sat around talking for a while. Well after dark, we could suddenly hear what was probably a bunch of teenagers fooling around on one of the trails a couple of miles away. Since the trails were closed at sunset, the ranger and my co-worker drove off to shoo them back to their campsites. My other friend and I were just relaxing around the fire, talking a little, mostly enjoying the night and the peace and quiet. All of a sudden, I had a cold chill go over me. The hair stood up on the back of my neck, and out of nowhere, I was terrified. I tried to ignore it, but it kept building. I didn't say anything to my friend. I didn't want to scare her. Then I glanced over at her just as she glanced at me, and she said, Do you feel that? I said, Yeah. I think maybe we'd better go to the car. We both felt like we were in deadly danger, but no idea from what. We started walking at a casual pace, not wanting to appear scared. Then, halfway to the car, we looked at each other again, and simultaneously broke into a dead run. We reached the car, jumped in and locked the doors, and turned on the headlights. I just sat there with my pistol, feeling like it was totally inadequate for whatever was out there. We both just sat, looking straight ahead. We were afraid to look around. I had the feeling at one point that if I turned my head and looked out the window, I'd see something that would drive me insane. I don't know how long we sat there. It was probably just a few minutes, but it felt like forever. Then it just left. We could actually feel it going away. A few minutes after that, the other two came back in the truck. We kind of laughed it off afterward. But I'll tell you, I've never been that scared before or since. I've faced a lot in my life. And nothing has so completely terrified me like that. I don't know what it was. But I'm still convinced 
that we were in terrible danger. I lived by a state park as a kid, one of those places super close to a city, so it's very overhiked. Like, you can't walk a single minute without passing several other people. This area eventually leads up into a vast mountainous area, but that's many, many miles away. Rumors of wild pigs, but no bears, and the most dangerous thing are rattlesnakes that just want to be left alone. All that to set up for this point. Wildlife has been basically chased out of their refuge. The biggest animal I had seen was a squirrel until I was 10 years old. The first incident, my dad and I were taking the slightly less used path. It was basically an out of the way trial that ended the same, but was rougher, no bicycles, and an added risk of seeing the aforementioned rattlesnakes. I was watching my footing when my dad let out an, oh crap. I looked up and saw two of the biggest bucks I have ever seen in person. This is a no hunting park, so really big. And we were really close as my dad had been watching out for me. My dad is desperately looking around for a tree that I would learn later while I go, oh dear. Sedina, no, my dad yells as I step towards the deer so I can see if they're friendly. One lowers his head and I'm thinking it wants to be petted. My dad realizes that I'm closer to the deer than I am to him, and this causes him to freak out. The deer are focused on me, one head down still, till a branch hits it across the face. It barely phases it, though the other one takes off immediately. After some cursing from my dad, it finally prances away like no big deal. My dad was convinced that the buck was about to charge me. I got an education that day that even nice animals can be dangerous. I would learn that lesson again with a nice herd of cows on the beach a year later. Later that fall, a mountain lion was spotted from a very busy trail, kind of far, but it's been like 20 years since a sighting. It turns out, despite the crowds of people, conservation efforts were paying off. By the time I was in my 20s, deer were jumping in our backyard to eat our roses. Owls were nexting right next to the main parking lot. The wild pigs weren't rumors anymore. The lions could be heard screaming in the distance at night. And the rattlesnakes still just wanted to be left alone. I really love through hiking and climbing, so I sleep outside for a great part of summer each year, almost never using tents because they're super heavy and also prohibited at most parts of my mountains. I had many scary encounters with animals, mostly due to the inhuman shrieks that they can produce. But I tell you this, in all of nature, nothing is so scary as people. This is why I prefer camping deep in the woods to being just outside of the city limits because it's always better to find family of wild hogs going through your stuff at 3 a.m. than to find a family of coked out drug addicts going through your stuff at 3 a.m. But anyways, here are two of the stories of encountering people that came to my mind. The first one, we were actually using tents because this was a more of a get together and get drunk sort of thing with my classmates at a nearby lake. So the night is surely upon us. So we decide to gather some wood in the nearby forest to keep the fire going through the night. Me and my pal take on this task. And as we approach the woods, we see that there is another tent pitched right outside of the site of our camping site. As we pass it, a dude pops out of the tent. We make small friendly chat about us staying there and him just camping and whatnot. And then we excuse ourselves that we need to get some wood for the fire all fine and dandy, nothing unusual. Camping folks are usually chatty and friendly, except for two things. By the setup of the tent and campground, he must have been there for a few days 
and he planned to stay there for a while, which is okay. There are a lot of photographers doing this, as the place is famous for its sunrises. Although I still shiver thinking about all the heavy tarps lying around. And secondly, he advises us to split, as there were two paths going through the woods, so that we can cover more ground. Which we did, because why not? It looked like he knew the area. So I'm walking alone through the woods, my friend taking the other path, which is directly above mine, and he could still see down my trail. When I hear him shout my name, I turn around to see what's happening, and I see the guy from the tent following me on the trail, which he saw from above, wielding a machete. The guy says that after we left, he realized that we didn't have any axe or anything to chop down the wood, although we said collecting the wood, also chopping it down would be illegal there. So he thought that he would help me with that, which I politely refused and got the heck out of there, meeting my mate who was already on this route earlier. So we came back to the camping site with next to no fuel for the fire, and everyone keeps making fun of us, that we're paranoid and the guy just surely wanted to help. Whatever. We proceed to drink in nightfalls, we had almost forgotten about the incident, and all is well again, when I see a headlamp approaching our campsite. It's that guy from the tent coming to our site. He's bearing a bunch of wood in his arms, saying that he knew that we didn't take much of the fuel, so he brought us some. Then he walks all around our campsite before putting it down. I mean, there was really no need for that as the fire was in the middle. Checking the tents, asking whether this is all of us, and if someone else is coming. Not creepy at all. After a moment of uncomfortable silence, he tells us to enjoy our night and gets out. Understandably, everybody is creeped out by now, and different theories pop up, such as that he brought the wood, only to make sure that he wouldn't kill the fire before we go to sleep, so that he knows when that happens, or that the occasional flash from the direction of his campsite is the flash from his binoculars. Well, no one went to sleep that night, and we were not drinking anymore. After the sun went up, we took our two-hour nap rotating guards, and we packed our stuff and left as soon as possible. The other one. We were on a climbing trip and slept under the stars really deep in the woods and well off all of the well-known trails and places in the areas, as sleeping there is prohibited and the rangers are very strict about this, issuing very large fines if they catch you. So essentially, we were hiding deep in the woods. We cooked some great dinner. Man, nothing tastes as good as an MRE after a full day of climbing, camped out in the mountains. We drank some wine. We talked for a bit, and we went to sleep as we were really tired. At about 2 a.m., we were all woken up. There was four of us. We were woken up by voices. It sounded like a school trip somewhere in the distance. Lots of kids talking to each other, presumably walking in a group. That itself was super scary. A bunch of kids walking in the woods at 2 a.m., and they must have been off any trail, as we went on purpose out of reach of any known trails. No one is talking. We all sit there and listen. The voices pass. Then the second wave of similar group of voices passes nearby, and then we hear someone approach our sight through the woods. There must be more of them based on the sounds they're making. And then it happened. It was a group of five kids, roughly 13 years old, walking in the direction of the voices. They walk around our sight, silently greeting us and nodding in our direction as they pass about three meters from our sleeping bags and continue towards all the voices. To make it all more creepy, none of them had any headlamps or flashlights or any sources of light. It was a full moon, so the visibility was good, but still. I have no idea what was that supposed to mean, but it was really weird and honestly scary. It could have been some scouts as well that was well-established outdoorsy place, the whole area. But still, a bunch of kids alone in the woods well off of any well-known trail, walking without any source of light at 2 a.m., just right by us? That's creepy. 
There are lots of weird things happening when you camp. But trust me, nothing is as scary as other human beings. I'm pretty late to the party, but my mother has a great camping story. In their late 20s, her and my father were teaching in Lesotho. On the holidays, they would go on camping trips in the massive parks in Zimbabwe. They were young and stupid, and didn't know the dangers of camping in Africa. And they had my sister with them, who would have been less than a year old at the time. One night, they were camping in a tent, and my sister was between them, when they heard sounds inside. They say it sort of sounded like someone coughing. My sister was making baby noises, and it seemed like it attracted more coughing animals outside. Soon, it sounded like a whole pack of something was outside the tent. My parents had no firearms and no knife or axe close by. One of the animals then started sniffing the tent, and it seems like it was trying to dig under it to get to my now crying sister. My panicked parents were trying to find a way to save themselves and my sister, and in a panic-induced rage, my mother, with all the might and glory that only a mother who is scared for her child's life can produce, punches the snout of the hyena sniffing the tent. To this day, my parents swear that the animal screamed in terror, and the whole pack ran off. Growing up in the woods and going camping, my family and I have had our fair share of bizarre and scary stories. This one, I just can't seem to wrap my head around, even to this day. My parents own 35 acres of property in the Deep Rockies, about two to three hours away from our home. We spent as much time as we could camping there, as we all loved it. It was secluded and beautiful, and we had a lot of freedom there as kids. My parents were both experienced campers and backpackers and had both grown up in the mountains. One day we head up at night, arriving at the property at around 9 or 10 p.m. We were all pretty tired and start to unpack the tents and such from the car. The minute we get out, though, we all get a strange feeling. It didn't seem normal or good. We had encountered wild predators at this point and knew the feeling of being watched but this was like being watched from all sides. We also all notice that there are no sounds. It is dead silent. Normally, we would be hearing all of the insects and occasional howls, night hawks, or bats, and just the general hum of a forest. Nothing too serious. We all kind of laughed nervously and maybe mentioned a few things, but got to work setting up our tents nearby. This is when the real strange stuff starts to happen. We begin to hear rustling in the branches around us, about 10 feet off the ground, it seems. It almost sounded like large creatures like monkeys or raccoons, jumping from tree to tree loudly. And many of them. I have never seen raccoons have the ability to do something like that. And these sounds were clumsy, unlike birds. It gets louder and louder and becomes extremely unnerving. At this point, the tent is set up and my parents put my brother and I there, telling us to stay inside. They go out with flashlights, trying to make sense of this bizarre activity. As they're outside, we start to hear these bizarre calls. I've never heard anything like this before or since. Honestly, it almost sounded like humans mimicking some kind of primate holler or screech. There was an odd human-like aspect to it, and it's like they were calling and responding to each other from every direction, along with the branches crackling and rustling. My parents came back to the tent and tell us that they couldn't see anything at all. I remember how shocked and frightened my mom looked, and it scared me because she was not scared of anything, and she would stalk bears just to get a good photo. Both of my parents were not easily frightened in nature, or at all. 
were all huddled together in the tent, confused, scared, and unsure of what to do. The sounds are so loud, and everywhere it almost sounds like some crazy storm outside. Our dogs are covered in between us all, totally freaked out. My dad decides to go out again, and I remember as he finishes unzipping the tent, the sounds stop, just like that, in an instant. And the oppressive, weird feeling is gone. He and my mom go out again to investigate, and again find nothing, except fallen branches and some strange marks up high on some trees. They come back, talk us down, and somehow manage to get us asleep. We still talk about this to this day. None of us know what happened and have no explanation. Like I said, we had some crazy and strange things happen to us, but never anything remotely similar to what happened that night. I was living in Brazil, and a friend and I decided to do a one night out and back through mountainous rainforest terrain in one of the southern states. We mostly wanted to get some exercise and do a gear shakeout before going on a longer trip in Patagonia. The experience started out really tough. We were doing almost constant climbing, and it was hot. Humidity was near 100% through lush vegetation. Eventually, we were pretty much in clouds and completely drenched from sweat and humidity. It was kind of hellish, soaked to the bone with no chance of drying out. Fortunately, at that altitude, it gets below freezing quite frequently at night, so there weren't many insects or animals, only birds. We hiked for probably eight hours with little progress. It was slow going through tough terrain. At early evening, we came to a flat spot, the first we'd seen in hours, and decided to make camp as it was starting to pour. I basically made camp in several inches of standing water. I was beat anyways, so I just sat in my tent reading. At around 3 a.m., I woke up to a girl singing in the distance. The singing kept coming closer until she was singing right at our tents. She pushed past us, and the singing drifted off. She was singing maybe a lullaby or a children's song about rain in Portuguese, but it sounded very strange. An hour later, I got woken up to the singing in the distance again. She was coming back towards us, singing the same rain song. As she passed us, I could hear a little exasperation in her voice. She continued singing and went back in the direction of the trailhead. Another hour later, I was again woken up by her singing as she was again coming back towards us. Except now, she was also crying. She continued to cry and sing as she moved past us for the final time. We woke up that morning, looked at each other, said what the heck was that, and then got on our way. It was very eerie at the time, and I don't have an explanation for it. We were in an extremely isolated location, and the trail was definitely only used by recreational hikers. So I really can't say why this woman was out wandering, singing, and crying at 3 a.m. My family has a cabin It's really just an old mobile home in the middle of the woods in northern Michigan. We've had it for years and years, but only recently some unexplained odd things have happened, and the police have been out to search the place. The last time I went to the cabin was the worst experience. I went up with my friend. For context purposes, we're two girls in our late 20s, and we arrived at dark. We got out and unloaded, but had trouble turning on the power. It has an outside electrical box, because the lock was frozen shut. We were trying to get it unstuck, but kept hearing noises around the cabin. Finally, it sounded like the noises were very close to us, and as we weren't getting anywhere with the lock, 
we rushed inside in case it was a bear milling around. We sat inside for maybe five minutes before deciding to drive out to the nearest town to get a motel for the night. We would come back once it was light to get the power on. We grabbed a few things and headed back out to the car. I got in and turned the car on, but nothing. The car was 100% unresponsive. The doors wouldn't even lock. My car had absolutely no issues. We had just driven three hours to the cabin without any problems. Something had to have happened to the car in the few minutes that we were inside. I told my friend we needed to get back inside. We got to the door and locked up behind us. We looked at each other, suddenly scared. Our car was totally dead. We had absolutely zero cell phone service and we had no power. We tried to stay calm. We made a new game plan. We were just going to rough it for the night. And then, at first light, walk in the direction of civilization until we got cell signal or ran in to help. Only a short time later, we were sitting together in the living room, quietly talking. Suddenly, there was two sharp, loud knocks on the back door of the cabin. We absolutely both froze. We sat there, horrified and shaking, just waiting for someone to push their way into the door or window. This was a mobile home, so it would take very minimal effort to break in. We were met with only silence, but now knew someone was outside. What did they want? It was much scarier to think that they hadn't broke in. They just potentially sabotaged our car and were now knocking on our door to toy with us. We sat, silent and terrified. After a while, we started talking again, only to have someone bang on a window. Just one loud smack. I've never been so scared in my life. We quickly realized that we had to stay alert and awake until morning. We just had to hope that whoever was outside didn't try to get in. It didn't, but the pattern of the knocks on the window continued for hours. As soon as the sun was up, we ventured outside. We took a look under the hood of my car next. It turns out the bolt that clamps the metal piece to the battery terminal was loosened almost completely. The nut was all the way loosened. One or two turns more, and it would have fallen off. Completely. I'm not sure what I saw. I've lived at my current house in North Carolina for about three years. When I first moved in, I had all kinds of weird encounters at night. I would be outside burning off tree limbs and things like that. I always felt like something was watching me. After the first few nights, I heard what sounded like someone calling for help, very muffled from the woods that surround my house. I shrugged it off. After a few times of that, I was walking the tree line and looking for more wood to throw on the fire. Keep in mind, this was at about 1 to 2 a.m., and I had a 3030 shell thrown at me. I don't own a 3030, so I thought it was very weird. Anyway, this goes on for a few months until my ex came and we brought our kids to live in the house. My ex had chickens and a pig that got out of their enclosure and were killed. She threw the carcasses into the woods. I know, I don't know why she did that either. But after that, all the spooky stuff stopped. No more eerie feelings, no noises, nothing. Now fast forward to last month. I've since gotten a new girlfriend and she takes our dogs out in the early morning hours before she leaves for work. I leave the house at 4.15 a.m. So it's probably about 5.30 a.m. or so when she's out with them. Twice in the last two months, she's seen what she described as something large and pale in the wood line. The first time was last month. It saw her and hurried off. This morning, as she was walking the dogs, our large dog was barking like crazy, and she saw this white creature again. She said it moved like it was scuttling, larger than a deer and on all fours, but almost like what a human looks like running on all fours. 
As soon as the dogs got a good look at it, they began trying to run back into the house. She and the dogs flew back inside, and she got ready to leave for work. She didn't see anything else so far, but I'm just wondering what's up. What could we do? What does it sound like? All the other encounters I've had, I never saw a physical form. Only noises and eerie feelings. According to her, this thing has moved closer to the house up the wood line. I'm just kind of lost. I doubt shooting at it would help. Any advice or theories would be welcome. I'm not sure if this is the right place to post this, but I would like to know if anyone has seen something similar. Around two years ago, one of my friends was moving from the Appalachia region to Florida in a few days, and we decided to go catfishing before he left. We didn't catch anything that night on the river, and we left around 2 to 3 a.m. On the drive back, we hit a fog. I remember the window was cracked because I was smoking a stogie. My friend was half asleep in the passenger seat, but still conscious. I had just looked up from changing the song on my phone, and right in front of the car was what I can only describe as a shadow being. It was tall and stood on two legs. It had no color or details, just a black void in the shape of an upright silhouette. It was right in front of my headlight too, and it still didn't show any detail. The thing about this whole experience that terrified me the most was after it had passed us, It smacked the weeds and tall grass on the side of the road, and it made such a loud sound because of how fast it was moving. Hearing that noise after what I had just saw sent a chill down my spine. My friend and I didn't say much, except to confirm to ourselves that we had indeed saw what we saw, an Appalachian shadow man. I've never seen something like that before or since. Please comment if someone has seen something like this. It would be interesting to get more insight on what I saw that night. Last year in Michigan's Upper Peninsula, I took my girlfriend out hunting. A couple of hours in and we weren't really seeing anything. I bent down to grab a beer, which was on the other side of my girlfriend. As I came back up, I glanced out the window to see if there were any deer, but I saw this tall, lanky, pale and bald creature of some sort running through the woods faster than anything I've ever seen. I'd have to say it cleared a hundred foot section of the woods in at least a couple of seconds. Luckily, it never saw me, or so I think. It looked like it was trying to run behind the blind. Safe to say that my girlfriend and I got the heck out of there ASAP with a fully loaded 30-30 and not much else. Not that that would have done anything to that thing. The scariest part about this story is that my girlfriend finally got to see it with her own eyes, running across the highway right by my land. Meaning, it's still stalking my woods. What do you guys think this is? I've been teetering on a skinwalker for about a year now, but now that I've found this subreddit, I like to get others' opinions. Thank you for reading. This was a few years ago, but I remember it like it was yesterday. A friend and I were in the woods just taking a hike. While on our way, we noticed that the forest had gone completely silent, and there was a chill to the air that hadn't been there earlier. Now, I live in the North Georgia mountains, so a sudden change in weather isn't that strange. But this was different. Along with the silence, there was this sense that something was very wrong, and something very dangerous was near. It was such a strong feeling that we became frozen in fear and apprehension, It all came to a head when our eyes caught movement behind a rather large tree. Now, for a bit of context, the air had gotten so cold that we could see our breath, and it was August. 
what we saw was a creature that had a deer skull for a head with antlers that extended more flat out than up and a pitch black cloak that seemed to suck the very daylight and it became noticeably darker. It had bone hands with sharp claws at the ends that it had stretched around the tree as it leaned around to stare at us with its pitch black eyes that felt like a void of darkness and terror. We could see its breath in the chilly air and as it stared at us, we both had this complete belief that if we turned our backs and ran, we would disappear forever. After what felt like an hour, but was maybe just a few seconds, it seemed to have gotten or done whatever it wanted and leaned back behind the tree and disappeared. And the temperature returned, and so too did the sounds of the woods slowly, but surely. My friend won't talk about it to anyone, and I've only told one other person about what I saw that day. It was so terrifying that I won't ever forget what I saw. It will forever haunt my dreams and memories. I don't know what I saw that afternoon, but I was hoping that maybe if I shared it, someone else might have seen something similar and might have an idea as to what we saw. So I live in a rural area, which in the past used to be a farmland, but since has been reclaimed by the forest. There is very dense undergrowth, such as thorns and vines and a lot of stuff to trip over. Anyway, there's a trail that I walk every day multiple times, as I like to smoke back, but there's this trail, it's the only clear path through the woods. It leads in for about 150 feet and then stops in a dead end. This was my favorite spot. I still walk it today and have for four years. Usually I wake up and go straight to my trail before I'm even fully awake. So one day last summer, it's 11 o'clock AM because typical teenager. I'm half awake and walking the trail. I'm almost at the end when I hear the underbrush rustling with the sound of something bipedal moving fast. So naturally, I'm like, what the heck? And I'm looking for the source of the sound when I see about 20 feet away from me, past the end of the trail, a large black figure taking off away from me. Now I stand an even six feet tall, and whatever this was was probably just as tall or taller than me. Once I realized what was going on, I took off running back to my house. Now I realized that it was most likely a person who got caught, but they weren't supposed to be there but it's fun to think that I could have encountered a Bigfoot in my own backyard. And ever since this happened, I'm always paranoid that someone or something is watching me in those woods. It's made me extremely hyper aware, and I feel like those woods aren't mine anymore. Also, if it was a person, what the heck were they doing sneaking through the woods so close to my house, and then sprinting away when they got caught? I don't really know where to post this, or if it's even going to be seen, but I had seen a ferry in the west half of Colorado. I was camping and hiking, and decided to go off the trail a bit, but keep it in sight so that I wouldn't get lost. I was going around this tree and saw something flying towards me. I thought it was a sparrow or something at first, because it was brown and tan. It then hovered, and I saw its arms and legs, and I thought that it was odd, not realizing what it might have been. Its face was almost human, but had bug qualities. It flew off before I was able to react fully, and I haven't seen anything like it since. This story takes place at a church camp, which is sort of like a Christian church camp when I was eight years old. It started at night when I was trying to sleep. It was hot, and I felt something heavy was on my chest. Not like a weight, but like a hand. 
I could feel each individual finger pressing down, almost like it was trying to pierce my chest with its fingertips. When I opened my eyes, I was so scared that I almost burst into tears right then and there. But I felt like if I did, something even worse would happen. Not just to me, but to the other kids in the room with me as well. Instead, I just laid there in my bunk, trying not to keep it from knowing that I was awake. After a few hours, it stopped and left. What I saw when I opened my eyes was a tall, skinny figure with long arms. It had black eyes with red pupils that almost glowed in the dark, large hands with slender fingers, and a mouth so wide, if it opened its mouth, it would look like a hole. When I woke up in the morning, I felt a burning sensation on my chest. When I looked, I saw red marks where the thing had touched me. Things were pretty much normal until the middle of the day, when everyone would go to the main building where we would all attend church and pray. While we were in the middle of a prayer, I opened my eyes to look up at the front of the room, and I saw the figure standing in front of me. And when I saw it, it put one hand over my mouth and pushed the other hand into my chest. It didn't tear a hole in my chest. Instead, it just went inside like it wasn't there. But I could still feel it inside my chest, its hand wrapped around my heart. Not a squeezing feeling, but a burning feeling almost like a red-hot fire poker touching bare skin. I was crying the whole time, trying to pull its hand out of my chest, but I wasn't strong enough. And it only stopped after the prayer was over. It just disappeared and was gone. But I could still feel the burning sensation in my chest. After we were done in the church that day, the day continued like normal, like the thing was done doing what it needed to do. After this incident... I never went back to church camp again, and I also stopped going to church because I never wanted to see that thing ever again. And to this day, I'm happy to say that I haven't seen it since. In 2009, in southeastern Wisconsin, I was in the car home from my mom's. I was in the passenger seat and gazing at the scenery when I saw what looked to be a shadow of a giant bird slash pterosaur. It was on the outer wall of a huge factory. I looked up to the sky and saw it disappear into cloud cover. The entire experience lasted about 15 seconds. For years, I assumed that my eyes were playing tricks on me until I met my new manager at work two months ago, who told me a similar story of a giant bird-like creature that he came across while driving. I was instantly brought back to that day and was assured that although I might be crazy, I did see what I saw. This story is 100% true, and I'm writing it on here to warn other people and let them know that there's definitely something out there, and to this day, I still don't know what it was, nor have I gone into any woods or forest whatsoever. If you don't believe me, that's completely fine. Read this as a fun story at your own expense. But for those of you out there with an open mind, or you've seen something yourself, just know that you're not alone. And just typing out and remembering this account is causing me to shake with anxiety and fear. First off, I'm a girl, and I live in North Carolina of the United States. I was 15 at the time of my encounter, and was definitely not a believer in anything supernatural, paranormal, or anything of the sort. It happened while I was at a local summer camp. There was absolutely nothing special about that day. No weird lights, people, animals sounds. Nothing. It was just the same camp schedule as I'd grown used to in the past two weeks that I'd been there. My age group had just finished lunch and was able to persuade our counselor to let us play a game called Scatter down by the lake. It's like a giant hide-and-seek game in the woods. Now we had played this at least 20 times before that day, 
and nothing weird had happened to any of us. And we all grew up playing in the woods, so it's not like we had an aversion or fear of it. But for some reason, that day when our counselor shouted scatter, and I ran to find a hiding place, it became a whole new ball game. I had run as far as I could while still being able to see the lake, as were the rules, and had found a huge old uprooted tree that I decided would be the perfect hiding place. So I laid down as close as I could against the ground and waited. I had been there for about five minutes when I suddenly heard a voice calling my name in a weird dreamy-like voice, and not just any voice, my mom's. Now, me and my mom are extremely close, thick as thieves, so I'd know her voice anywhere, and I would swear on my own grave that it was hers without a doubt. But I knew that it couldn't be her. She was 20 miles away at work, and even if it had actually been her, and she'd come to pick me up early, the voice wasn't coming from the lake. It was coming from further out in the woods, beyond the border of the camp. I knew I should have run away from this strange mimic mom voice, but I couldn't. It was almost hypnotic. It messed with my thoughts and gave me doubts, like, well, it could be mom, or what if she's hurt, and I have to get her. All these things were flooding into my mind, like someone had broken a dam that I didn't know was there, until they finally overwhelmed me, and emotions got the better of me and I took off running in the direction that the voice was coming from. I ran as far as I could, with only this strange voice as my guide. I couldn't have run for more than five or seven minutes, when I got to a clearing and the voice suddenly stopped. When I entered the clearing and didn't hear my mom's voice calling me anymore, could I finally think clearly again, and started to have little alarm bells going off inside my head, saying, you idiot, that's not mom, and run. But I couldn't run. I didn't know where to run. I had gotten so far away that I had lost sight of the lake by camp and had absolutely no idea where I was, and I was completely exhausted to boot. With no other options than to sit and catch my breath, I did just that. No sooner had I sat down, more warning bells went off in my mind, I quickly did a 360 survey around the clearing and noticed a strange noise. It wasn't the continuation of the voice before. No, it was the distinct sound of chattering teeth, like if you were cold, only there was no one else around and it was the middle of June in North Carolina. There's no way that someone could be cold. And that's when I heard it. Leaves and sticks crunch on the edge of the small clearing and I realized something was watching me. And then whatever it was moved and fast in circles around the clearing, almost like it was circling prey. And it was at that moment that I knew whatever it was had led me out there, away from the rest of my group. Exactly like the predator my instincts had been screaming at me that this was. Without any other option other than to try and escape, I took off in the direction that I thought I came from and sprinted as fast as I could, all the while hearing the chittering of teeth and sticks crunching behind me. I didn't know what to do. I didn't dare turn around to see what was chasing me. I knew that if I did, I would slow down, and I absolutely would not. It felt like a lifetime running away from this thing before I finally saw the lake. And even though I didn't think that I could, I ran faster than I ever have in my life when I broke the tree line and ran to the lake where I knew that my friends were. At that point, I felt safe enough to stop and look back and just see what had been chasing me. But when I did, I only saw a fleeting form running back the way that I had come from and the distinct sound of chittering teeth. When I finally found my counselor, who was the seeker to find all of us. I was hysterical with fear and hugged her as tight as I could. When I finally calmed down, she tried to get me to tell her what happened, but I just asked, were you calling my name? Before she even said anything, I already knew the answer. After all, it had been my mom's voice that led me away from everyone else. 
but what she said and what she replied with was so much more bone chilling to me. She told me, no one called for you. We didn't know you were gone. Everyone is still hiding. The game isn't over yet. So I just found out that this truly horrifying experience is actually a cryptid. Okay, so this was and still is a truly horrifying and scarring experience that I had last year. Even typing about this gives me anxiety and flashbacks. So the story is very simple, because there's only three other encounters with this being that is documented that I know of, and it was very fast but very traumatizing like I stated earlier in this post. So I stayed up in my room a little bit later than I intended. I was on my computer facing away from my door, and out of the corner of my eye I see him waving at me, from around the wall, only exposing his hand and his face. I quickly spun my head around to look and he was gone, instantly. I sat there, frozen in fear for maybe 10 to 20 minutes. I finally got up and checked behind the wall, and he was gone. Nowhere to be seen. I thought it was some hallucination. But now, I know that I saw Indrid, the grinning man. Back when I was about three or four years old, I lived and still live in the same apartment. Whenever I would walk down the hallway to my bathroom or my mom's bedroom, I would see strange figures in the dark. Not just shadows, but physical beings that I was able to touch. When I turned six years old, I didn't see the figures as often as I used to. But one night, while I was walking down to the bathroom, I was tripped by one of the figures. It didn't just stick its foot out in front of me or anything like that. Instead, it came up through the floor and grabbed me by my ankles. I fell and hit my head on the kitchen bar to my right and got knocked out. When I woke back up, I saw another figure in front of me, and I immediately covered my face, because as a six-year-old, I still thought that it made the figures ignore me. But instead of it just going past me, it picked me up and put me back on my feet. To this day, I still don't know why the figure helped me, but I do know that not all of the figures were good. Now, I will never go down that hallway without the lights on, even during the day, ever again. I was fishing with a friend and we heard trees shaking and the tree line was just not right. When my friend said, hey, get over here, and he showed me where he had seen something watching me, we start to feel unsettled. Then we started to pack up. And when we got on our four wheelers is when things started to get weird. We revved it to scare it away. Then we drove off. We were driving off when I dropped a fishing pole. We went back. And when I got back, we looked back and there was a tall, smoke-gray, skinny creature. We drove off, and we kept seeing it until we hit the main road. We continued to drive and didn't see anything. But as soon as we drove on a dirt road again, we saw it again. Please, let me know of any information you can give me. This goes back several days slash months. I saw what I thought was a dog slash wolf's feet running down the road. Couldn't see if it was a dog or a wolf because of the blinds. One to three days later, at certain times during the day and night, it would sound like something would jump up and crawl over the ventilation unit next to my house. So I looked outside and nothing was there. So I got suspicious 
especially because there was no one near the unit. And it would have taken them a long time to get away because I looked at it immediately through my bedroom window that is one to two feet away from it to the left. And at night, the noises would come from multiple sides of the house. I thought it was raccoons. One to three days later, friends that I invited over were complaining about smells like rotten fish slash flesh. One to five days later, the smell went away on its own. And that night, I accidentally stayed up to 2.30 a.m., and I had this feeling to get out of my room and make myself hidden. So I decided to do it because I was bored. I got out of my room and hid behind the wall connecting my room to the kitchen. Then there was a huge bang against the wall next to my window in my room, the place my feeling told me to avoid. Then I froze in fear in my kitchen as I heard the sounds of loud bangs, the sounds of running, and the sounds of trash cans falling all over around my house including on the roof. I managed to make myself move to get my computer and frantically research about what the heck was going on. And I found out, according to this source, that they are most frequently seen as coyotes, wolves, foxes, eagles, owls, or crows. My grandmother also saw a coyote or wolf when she was coming to visit me. I also heard that they smell like things rotting because of their flesh and that they try to break into the house or harass you by doing most of the noises that I listed. These creatures were trying to lure me outside the whole time that I was researching by mimicking a woman's voice. Today, the smell is back, and I don't know how to ward them off. My grandpa was telling me a story in the summertime, and I guess I never felt the need to share because I didn't know what platform to share it on, but I found one. I apologize if some of the details are left out. I've forgotten some of the things that he told me, such as names and what year this happened in. I believe it happened in the 60s. It happened near the Sandy Bay Aboriginal Reserve, which is in southern Manitoba. It was midwinter and Manitoba gets plenty of snow. My grandpa told me that his two friends, a wife and husband, were walking from their car to their house, carrying all of their luggage. It was just their cabin, not their house, so they were carrying the luggage up to the cabin. The first thing they noticed was a bright, bright light shining into the cabin. It illuminated the entire cabin and was a fluorescent shade of icy blue. The husband thought he saw a silhouette of a strange tall humanoid in the home. It was lanky and very tall, standing alone, before it walked out of sight. Quickly, he ran into the house with his wife. They searched the house, and there was nothing. So the wife went back out to grab more luggage. The husband said that he heard a shriek from outside, and quickly ran out to make sure that she was okay. He was shocked to find her footprints leading up to the car. Yet she was about 25 feet away from the car in the woods, with no tracks leading towards her. If she were to walk out there by herself, her tracks would obviously be there. He ran out to her. She was distraught and hollering and screaming, and her eyes were glazed over. He took her in and she refused to speak. She was admitted into the mental hospital soon after, and to this day has the same glossed over eyes and she still can't speak. She experienced a horrible trauma out there, and I believe that it's because of whatever the humanoid creature was. My grandpa still talks to her husband sometimes, and I believe that he visited her about 30 years ago at the hospital, since he doesn't live too many hours away. If anyone has any theories about this, feel free to comment. Or, if there are any more questions, I'll try to answer them to the best of my ability. I used to work at a cheese factory on the edge of a cornfield in southwestern Minnesota. There were a series of days in the summer of 04 or 05 
where it was so hot that the milk being delivered to us in trucks would evaporate before we got it. It made work easy. The dearth of milk denied us any actual labor, but management wouldn't let us not come to work, so we would show up and mess around all shift. I was working nights at the time. It was 2 or 3 a.m., and I was out on the loading dock watching bats fly around the floodlights because I liked being out in the cool night air. The corn was about as high as my shoulder, so about 5 foot 10. As I was watching the bats, I looked down at the edge of the cornfield. Something was moving there. It was the size of a small child and very, very skinny. Pale, with something that looked like a head of straight black hair. It moved in a sort of jerky gait, like someone dancing the robot really badly. It moved in chunks. Legs then hips, then torso, shoulders, neck, and finally head. It was looking back into the cornfield, or at least I felt like it was. I felt prickly all over. I didn't know what it was. I thought it was a heron or something at first, but it looked too much like a person. It didn't move like a person, though. Gradually, step by step, it moved towards me, Letting my curiosity better my fear, I moved towards the edge of the dock, which was raised a few feet off the ground. When I got within a few feet of the edge, the thing looked at me. I was paralyzed. I could have run, but I was stuck somewhere between terrified and intrigued. It moved, its face still pointed at me. It ratcheted its body in that disconcerting jerky movement toward the cornfield and went into it. I tried to watch where the field moved as it passed, but the corn remained perfectly still. I noticed that all the crickets were silent. After a few minutes, nothing happened. I stood out there for an hour, but it never came back, and I never saw it again. I'm an outdoorsman. I'm very experienced in hunting, camping, hiking, and general survival. I'm familiar and used to wildlife, and I was charged by what I believe was a cryptid called a dog man. It charged me and my cousin. It was not a bear. A bear cannot move how it did. And it was not a normal wolf, as they can't comfortably run on two legs whereas what charged us seemed natural at doing that. This happened around June or July of 2007, I believe. I was around 17 years old and more cocky then, but still somewhat knowledgeable of the outdoors. My family used to own a cabin in northwestern Wisconsin. I basically grew up there in the summer. I knew the woods well, but at night, it was wise to stay in the cabin or at least by the bonfire by the beach, because of bears, wolves, and cougars. One of the creepiest things was if you were having a bonfire. The tree line was visible from the fire pit and beach, and at night, you always felt like you were being watched from that tree line. But during the day, the woods always seemed normal, not so creepy. That is, until this incident. So this happened somewhere between 12 o'clock and 2 o'clock in the afternoon. Me and my cousin were having an airsoft battle. I was in full woodland camo. He was not. I retreated onto the ATV trail into the woods for a tactical advantage, and our battle took us about 200 meters into about a third of the way up the trail. We had enough at this point, and were standing at the edge of a clearing on the trail, talking, and he was maybe 10 feet from me. When I decided to mess with him, I shushed him and said, We're being watched. He froze. Then I realized that the woods were dead quiet, and I got spooked, and started scanning the tree line and the other edge of the clearing from left to right when I saw it. Its teeth gave it away. It was panting and staring at my cousin. I don't expect you to believe me, but what I saw was a wolf as big as a black bear, at least 300 pounds. But it wasn't normal. 
This wolf was on two legs crouching next to the tree, with its arm grasping the tree, grasping with a clawed hand. It had reddish brown fur. I told my cousin that we have to go, and the next thing I know he is sprinting, and I look back at Wolfie who had locked on and sprinted a few steps on two feet, and then I turn and ran when it looked like Wolfie was dropping to all fours. It charged us and sounded like it was right on our butts barreling through the brush. But for whatever reason, it let us go when we broke out of the tree line and headed for the cabin. What stuck with me the most was the sheer size. Wolfie appeared to be nearly seven feet tall when upright. And that's where I should have expected had front paws. It appeared to have large clawed hands. Now, I'm not sure how to explain it away rationally. I've heard wolves will occasionally kind of walk upright, but as far as I know, they can't sprint on two legs, nor do wolves get that big, and black bears more waddle on two legs. The closest description is silly, a werewolf or a dogman. I just wanted to share an incident that I experienced in Point Pleasant, West Virginia, where I went to high school. I was in a video production class, right around the time the movie The Mothman Prophecies with Richard Gere was being made. So we decided to make a documentary. We spoke to a woman in her 70s, who, during the time of the original sightings back in the 60s, said that she was out riding her horse one day, and she said that she suddenly felt someone sit down behind her. All of a sudden, the horse bucked her off and went crazy. She chased the horse down and then looked at the horse. Burned into the flesh of the horse were the legs of a humanoid. She immediately got in contact with a veterinarian who came to her farm to treat the horse. The veterinarian never asked how the horse got burned, as if he had seen this type of burn before. Other than the burn, the horse was fine. Later that week, she confided to a friend that whatever it was that sat behind her on the horse had very thin insect-like legs. She also said that it had the odor of ammonia. She also said that when she backed off of the horse, she caught a glimpse of the being on the horse. She saw huge butterfly-like wings that were yellow in color. She swears up and down that this was the Mothman. Also, it turns out that the veterinarian was one of the 46 victims who died during the Silver Bridge Collapse on December 15, 1967. I just thought that that was an interesting story. When I was about nine or 10 years old, my uncle told me a story that has stuck with me ever since. Growing up in Kentucky, I've always heard tales of, you know, Bigfoot or the Pope Lick Goat Man, the usual run of the mill urban legend campfire story. But in the case of the story my uncle had told me, it was different than all the other tall tales that I had heard before or since. Kentucky is home to the world's largest cave system in the world. Mammoth Cave. Since its founding on July 1st of 1941, only about 365 miles have been surveyed by the human eye. It's believed that there are still over 600 miles of passageways and caverns yet to be discovered. The National Park is stretched over three counties, spanning more than 50,000 acres. Edmondson, Hart, and Barron counties. My uncle owned land in Edmondson County since the early 1980s. I remember hearing about how when they were out hunting for deer, they would occasionally come across pits in the ground of various sizes. They were the mouths of cave entrances. They would usually just toss a barrel or a large tree branch into the hole so no one would stumble across it, fall in, and become trapped. Besides wildlife or just getting lost in the woods, there really wasn't much else that you had to worry about according to most people. This story takes place in the early 1990s, 
about five years after my uncle had purchased the land. His closest neighbor, who I'll call Ken, lived about a half a mile down the dirt road that ran parallel to both of their properties. They naturally became good friends over time and on occasion would accompany each other hunting. My uncle lived in Louisville and would visit his property whenever he had days off or needed to do upkeep, like mowing or restocking his pond. So unlike his neighbor Ken, he spent more than most of the year in Louisville. On this particular weekend, Ken went out hunting for deer. He left his cabin and headed off into the woods, as he had done a hundred times before. He followed a path that he had used plenty of times to a small grouping of trees overlooking a large meadow. According to him, it was a perfect sunny fall day with not many clouds in the sky. He sat in the shadows underneath some low-hanging tree branches, feeling hidden from any would-be prey that might come by. Despite it being the ideal weather for hunting, he didn't see much in terms of game. Just a few fawn and a doe, not the big trophy buck that he was hoping for. He had been entertaining the idea of just grabbing his gear and heading back to the cabin. But not wanting to go home empty-handed, he decided to stick around for just a little while longer in hopes that his luck would change. His chest fluttered when he looked across the meadow to the left and seen movement in the tree line opposite of him. He pulled his rifle to his shoulder and looked down the scope. The thick trees and foliage at the edge of the tree line prevented him from getting a good view of the animal in his sights. From what he could tell, it was heading towards the edge of the woods. He just had to be patient. When it stepped out of the shadows of the trees about 50 yards away and into the clearing, he knew almost immediately that he wasn't looking at a deer. He tried to keep his hands from shaking as he desperately tried to identify exactly what it was that he was looking at. He described its body of that of a panther, but the upper torso where the shoulders and neck were sat noticeably higher than its lower back and hind legs. He was looking at its side profile, which he claimed while in mid-stride, this thing had to be close to seven feet in length. He said it was quiet like a cat. It never made a noise when it moved. The front legs, he said, looked more like arms, significantly longer and skinnier than its hind legs. It had brittle dark brown hair that started from the back of its head and running down the length of its back. He also claimed that the creature's skin looked waxy, almost like a chimpanzee's skin, dark brown, almost black. Its face was long like a dog's, but he said he noticed no ears. He said the corners of its mouth ended by the neck, where the ears should be. The most unsettling detail that I can remember of his account, though, was the thing's back legs. He described them as looking frog-like, as in the back legs were tucked up close to the creature's sides. When it walked, the leading leg would reach almost to the front half of its body, and the other leg would stretch way back, flat, like a frog when it crawls. He watched it for about two or three minutes, slowly and quietly moving through the long golden grass, a black shadow surrounded by color. He watched it disappear into the tree line directly across from the woods that he'd seen it come from initially. After a few moments, he left and headed back to his cabin. Now... I don't know how long it was after this incident occurred that Ken told my uncle about it, but he was reluctant to speak on it. He dubbed it the Kentucky Holler Crawler. Eventually, Ken explained the story in full one night while sat around a fire with my uncle. Ever since then, Ken refused to go into the woods. He claimed to only hunt from the dirt road running through his property afterward. Both my uncle and Ken have sadly passed away since but their story never changed over the years. I even had my uncle retell the story to me a few years back, just so that I knew I had all the details right. Maybe this was just another tall tale, used to scare me and my brother when we were kids, camping on my uncle's land. But I know one thing for sure, he was an honest man, and his eyes told the truth when he would tell me that story. He had his fair share of unexplainable incidents as well, I'm sure that anybody would after frequenting a cabin in the middle of nowhere in Kentucky over 30 years. The thing that keeps me up at night, though, isn't the thought of the creature. It's the thought of where it came from. 
who's to say this thing didn't crawl up from one of the caves, spanning hundreds of miles in every direction. Hidden from civilization, thriving off the ecosystem. Nothing is impossible when it comes to nature. Nobody really knows for sure what is out there in the dark. This took place in the Rockies in Colorado a few days ago. I just seek help trying to figure out if I'm crazy or bumped into something. I'd heard the stories, read plenty of them online, and seen the videos about them as well. I was never sure about them, never sure if they were real, probably because I didn't want them to be, because whether I'd admit it or not, they were creepy, but I couldn't rule them out. I was camping half an hour outside of a small town in Colorado at about 8,500 feet. Snow covered the dirt road I took to get to the campsite. I'd only set it up earlier that day. 10 to 15 minutes of my drive out of town was through the park, with campsites essentially clearings with stone fire pits in them. I set up at the fourth or fifth one. I was the only camper there at the time. On one of my returns to camp, After visiting in town about a hundred feet down the one to one and a half miles into the park, I saw a herd of deer off to the left side of my trail, probably seven to eight of them. There were only a few feet from the trail and all spooked, save for one deer. The deer was facing the same direction of the car before I came and was the closest to the pathway. While the other deer retreated 15 to 20 feet deeper into the woods, he turned to face my car. Already only going five to 10 miles per hour and on a rough part of the trail, I wasn't passing very quickly. So I slowed and stopped. He followed the whole way. For some reason, I spoke to him. I, unsure and slightly uneasy at this fearless deer. After all, I'm treading on his land. I was protected in the car and he was an average sized deer so there was no reason to think that it did do anything to me. But somehow, some way, an animal demanded respect. I don't think I ever saw it blink. For what felt like forever, but was likely five minutes we stared at each other. The deer never moving anything about him. I thought to take a picture of him and his herd watching from behind him down the hill. But something told me not to. I talk to my dogs, and I know they hear what I say, but I don't know if they listen. He listened. I told the deer I was here to visit, that I wished for a brief stay and to hopefully enjoy nature again, and grow appreciation for nature once more. As if satisfied by the answer, he backed up. Only a couple of steps. But he backed up, and I kept on. I drove and watched him in the mirror. He returned to the herd, not taking an eye off of me. I've been on plenty of camping trips, been spooked by people and critter alike wandering around camp, even having opened the flap to a deer walking through on many a trip with the scouts. But this was one of my first alone. Up there, it dropped to around zero degrees. And when I was in the tent, all I wanted to do was huddle in my sleeping bag. So that's what I did. The sun went down quick when you're tucked between peaks. The mountains hide the sun even sooner, so it got dark and cold. If you ever watched a four-legged animal walk, you'll know its pattern. Having been around dogs all my life, it's something that I've mildly found interesting. Almost always after a forefoot comes down a rear foot follows, giving a distinct sound to their footsteps. When I was woken up at around 2 to 3 in the morning, my first thought was a bear late to hibernate. Knowing I had no food in the tent and only had food in the car, I stayed huddled as to not startle it or give it any reason to think that I smelled like food after all. I tried to listen to it to see where it was walking. That's when I got scared. There was snow surrounding my camp. There was no mistaking every single footstep it made. Slow one on front of the other. No matter how hard I tried to imagine, 
There was no rear foot following. Just one, two, one, two. Then the pause. That was the worst part. I slipped my hand out of my bag that I was huddled in and grabbed the hatchet that I was carrying with me, trying to reassure myself that I was making stuff up. I pulled my hand back in and I heard it start to walk off again, keeping on its way. The direction that it had been going before, stepping into my camp and eventually I couldn't hear its slow steps anymore. It was light and two-legged. That's all that I could discern. The next morning I went to look. Even with the snow, it was so packed around my sight from cars and footsteps that it was either too packed or already walked over to really discern any new tracks. I stayed in a hotel the night after this happened, abandoning my gear to pack in the sunlight. Three to four inches of fresh dry snow had come down over the night, and when I walked into my camp, I noticed a trail of tracks. While the terrain was still uneven, I couldn't help but notice what looked like a set of tracks slightly together like you would see a deer's tracks. And suddenly, as they left the grass and entered the dirty snow of camp, they seemed to be spaced out, almost like my own footsteps that I left behind walking over to them were. If it were a skinwalker, it makes sense if it were the deer that I spoke to, as they tend to not be violent in the day. But being a hunter, it saw and paid attention to where its next target would be going. But when it went on the prowl, only finding a quiet tent. Or it could have been a wendigo, content with my goals of the forest, letting me leave, but coming by in the night as a warning of what was to come, seeing as what I drove into was headed for the mountains. One of my best buds from college was a geologist major that ended up becoming a ranger in the southeastern United States. We haven't spoken in years, as is the case with age, but I remember about eight to nine years back, he was telling me about an old married couple that he had recently helped out. He had seen them come to the park for several days in a row and found out that they were visiting from out west and they had gotten engaged there decades prior. They had been searching for a spot that they'd taken pictures of, where he'd popped the question, but were having trouble. After looking at the pictures and figuring out roughly where they were trying to get to, he escorted them in his vehicle, then hiked with them to where he thought that it would be. They found it, and he left them there and went back to his station at the entrance. He said he got a weird feeling once he got back, and felt like he needed to wait to see them whenever they left. Well... Once it came time to lock up at night, he still hadn't seen them leave, so he reported it, left his assistant to wait at the shack at the entrance, and went back to where he left them. He found both of them lying down, spooning along the bank of the river. Neither were alive. He called the cops, went through the nine yards, and went home. The police were able to disclose to him their identities, but weren't sure anything else initially. Later, he learned that the wife was terminally ill with cancer, and they had both unalived themselves by ingesting some sort of chemical-slash-pill combination medley. They just chose to do it where they had gotten engaged at. My friend wasn't torn up about it, but he was obviously sad about them dying, but said that he thought that they hadn't asked for help earlier because they didn't want anyone to think that they helped kill them. I once asked a park ranger for his strangest story and he told me this. He worked at this park in the summer and had for several years. He was driving home, alone, into the park to begin his summer's work when he heard a male voice say very clearly and loudly, Welcome back.
My story is the exact reverse of the others here. I'm not traditionally a ranger, but when I was in the scouts, legally adult scouts had to do the three feather challenge. One day without food, one day without speaking, and one day and night alone in the woods with only a knife and a tarp, unseen by any human. After which one has to sneak back to the scout camp unnoticed by the sentries and report to the camp master. It was my third day, so I took off walked for miles through the woods and found the most remote spot in the wildest, most overgrown part of the woods. Spent a spooky but uneventful night until almost before dawn when I decided to go for a morning swim in the lake right before taking off to go back. I stripped nude and went towards the lake but noticed a group of guys fishing so I decided to go back. Suddenly the ground underneath my feet caved in and I found myself submerged up to my armpits in the absolute vilest mass I have ever smelled. It was a pit where poachers dumped the guts and leftovers of illegally hunted deer, and it fermented for weeks. Imagine the scene. A group of anglers near some ungodly screaming from the direction of the woods, and run there to see if someone needs help. What they see is a teenager-shaped ghoul covered completely in blood and rotten offal, who was crawling out of a bloody hole in the ground while shrieking and weeping, then runs at them to get to the lake to wash off. In 2016, my boyfriend, my now husband, and I went camping in eastern Pennsylvania. The place we decided to stop for the night was primitive. Camping was free, no cell service, barely a road, etc. We did counter two other people. They might not factor into what happened later at all, but they were creepy, so I'll describe them. The first was a woman who had her truck off to the side of the road a little as we drove past. She had the hood open and seemed to be waiting for someone to stop and offer to help. Usually my boyfriend had no problem helping someone, but he said this time that something about her put him off. She didn't really seem like she needed help and usually people who need help look at you hopefully as you approach. She looked like she just expected that we would stop. That's what my boyfriend said anyway. I hadn't really noticed anything that strange about her. The next person came when we had chosen a spot and were setting up a fire for hot dogs. I had noticed people drive by a few times, but my boyfriend pointed out each time was the same car and the man in the car watched us each time he passed. My boyfriend was a little uneasy about this, but we had driven around for a while before finding a place we liked. It had been raining and everything was muddy, and we wanted the driest sight possible. He could have been doing the same thing. We briefly thought about moving, but the road was muddy too. If he wanted to find us, all he had to do was follow the tracks. There were some other tracks, but not many. He'd only have to backtrack a little to locate us again. He didn't come by another time. So we stayed and spent the several remaining hours before dark goofing off. No one else drove by. Whether or not those two had anything to do with our experience, the real fear came later. We had gone to sleep in our tent, and sometime around 3 a.m. we were awoken by this very loud noise. I can't describe it very well, or even remember exactly what it sounded like but my boyfriend said that it reminded him of a chain gun revving up. It was also similar to how it would sound if someone recorded a shovel being dragged over gravel and played it over a loudspeaker. He jumped up and looked out a little window, but couldn't really see anything. The sound repeated itself a few other times. I was so scared that I couldn't speak. So my boyfriend whispered that it was probably miles off and I should just go back to sleep. I didn't question this as I figured loud sounds could be easily heard miles off. After we left, 
He told me it sounded like it had actually been coming from just down the road, but he didn't want to freak me out. Looking back, I probably should have wondered why he would bother to whisper, if apparently the sound was that far off. I was still terrified. Every little thing I heard outside sounded like someone was walking around the tent. We laid there for a while longer, when finally my boyfriend told me to get dressed, because we were leaving. I had gotten alarmed by this, and even more alarmed when he unwrapped the machete that we had brought, just for this trip from its plastic before opening the tent. We quickly packed up and loaded the car. I looked around for footprints that weren't our own, but despite the moon providing plenty of light, I couldn't really see. I did point out something that my boyfriend hadn't noticed though before we got into our car. There was a beer can by our dead fire that hadn't been there before. We didn't even bring beer. While we were driving away, my boyfriend explained that he was nervous that someone might have been trying to lure us out, so he didn't think that it was a good idea to run from the tent right away. He also half expected to find out the gas tank had been siphoned, but that wouldn't have stopped us because we had a hybrid car. We joked that that would have made a funny hybrid commercial. Number of brutal murders avoided by driving a hybrid? Two. We only joked because we were about to crap ourselves from fear and even adrenaline. The rest of our trip, we only stayed in well-populated campsites. Or got a hotel. My cousin is with the Forest Service in the Montana slash Wyoming area, and I decided to go up there to her to literally test the waters. She does hydrology and has to ride out to the middle of nowhere to test streams and snow runoff to ensure that there are no contaminants. So I thought that that sounded fun and wanted to do a bit of a tour with her. We were going to have to camp out there for two nights. So we packed up all our gear in saddlebags and saddle bundles and started out. The first day and night was amazing. Beautiful scenery and amazing air quality. It's really so peaceful out there. I love that area, and I wish that I got to go up there more often. Anyway, we started out on the second day, and my cousin said, Do you want to see something weird? Of course I said yes. So she led me on a bit of a side journey to this tiny little ravine. We ended up traveling about two hours away from our actual path that we had laid out. At the very end of this fold in the land, she dismounts and tells me to get off my horse too. We tie them up in this gorgeous little clearing and she tells me to follow this tiny wildlife path and bring our little rechargeable radio. It's one of those that you can plug in or wind up. And it also acts as a lantern if you really need it to, but that kills the batteries very quickly. I do, and out in the middle of nowhere, there is this huge coil of wire sticking out of the ground. The wire itself was not weirdly large, like some buried transmission wire, but small, like 10 or 12 gauge wiring for a house. It trailed off into the brush and trees, so naturally, I decided to follow the thing out of curiosity. My cousin trails behind me as I do, and this wire, after coming straight up from the ground, is strung across limbs of trees and then back to the ground. Then it snakes around rocks and finally descends into an outlet. That outlet is mounted on the side of a desk. It looks like a school teacher's desk from when I was growing up, with a metal base and a pseudo wood slash plastic top thing. No chair, no building, no nothing. Just this outlet and this desk. I'm staring confused as all heck at this desk in the middle of a forest when my cousin takes the radio, pulls out the cord and plugs it into the outlet. It then lit up and started blaring static. The wire was being fed from somewhere. Now, the place where we were had no road access, no buildings for many miles, and no other people around. And yet, there was a live outlet. Super weird. No spooky jump scares or bodies. 
just one lone power desk in the middle of the woods. I wish to God I had taken a picture of it. I'm a ranger, and I work at a pretty remote desert park. This happened before I got there, but the other rangers that I work with were there. They went to do a patrol during the summer, our off-season, at one of our seldom-used campgrounds. On a patrol, our maintenance ranger found a burnt-out car in one of the sites. The desert is a weird place, so he just calls the sheriff and waits. Sheriff arrives, and it turns out there's a body in the driver's seat with no arms and no legs, just a torso and a head, burnt. Sheriff just marked it as a self unaliving and removed the vehicle. We're close to Mexico, and we get a lot of illegal drug traffic, so I guess they don't even bother trying to solve those. But it was super sketchy. I'm an ex-park ranger. We had a group of frat boys making way too much noise. We came by twice, and at the second stop I told them, this is your last warning. Not only is it rude for other campers to be so loud, it's exceptionally dangerous. Everyone knows that the local mountain lions are attracted to loud noises at night, and these ghost cats, as they're called, can creep right up on you without hearing or seeing them. Whatever you do, don't leave your tent tonight. If you hear anything, don't make a sound. We went back to the station, grabbed the lion pelt from the interp center and the night vision goggles. The head ranger had to blow what was left of the budget at the end of the previous year. Once they were all in their tents, we crept into the campsite and made fake lion tracks everywhere. We set up the lion pelt propped up over some sticks. The other ranger got out the PA and from a distance started doing fake lion calls slowly getting closer. I pulled the jeep forward like we were arriving on scene and got out, turned on my mag light, and illuminated the silhouette of the lion pelt. Because I was moving quickly, the shadow of the lion appeared to be moving. At this point, the frat boys were losing it. Jim, the other ranger, shouted, stay in your tents. Followed shortly by, she's coming around at us, and then there's another one. And finally, Let's get out of here. At that point, we turned off the flashlights, grabbed the lion pelt in the darkness, and jumped in the jeep and sped off. Just after sunrise, they started peeking out of the tents. Nobody was brave enough to get out until about 8.30. When they saw all huge paw and claw prints everywhere, they really freaked out. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is your tax dollar at work. I'm not a ranger, but I lived on the outskirts of a national park in a cabin. It was a four mile drive from the main road just to get to the property, and we had no plumbing or power. This property was right next to where the park started. To call it the middle of nowhere is an understatement. My roommate at the time was interning with the park service, but he is a city kid. Every evening at the dead of night, I had been hearing noises in the woods but I thought it was someone walking. But then, they'd just stop in particularly overgrown areas of the jungle, so your mind starts to doubt itself. Is it a pig? A cat? Is it just the wind? The cabin didn't have a locking door, and the owners didn't want me to install one, so I began sleeping in my car. Now this is a huge property, and I'd park my car over an acre away from the cabin, and where I was hearing something. I started hearing those footsteps again. I moved out. My roommate, who thought I was bonkers, stayed and still slept there without a locking door. He got robbed, not once, but twice after I moved out. So he finally put up motion-triggered cameras. 
There was a man with a long rifle who'd hike up the property, set up in the bushes, and watch us. I'm not a ranger, but back in 2010, I had just finished a wilderness leadership class and decided to go to Colorado to get some solo wilderness time. I found out about some hot springs near the Colorado River that were only accessible during the winter. During the summer, the snowmelt raises the water level of the river and they become submerged. And I decided to go spend a few weeks out there. It was on BLM land and I had about a four mile hike from where I parked to where I was camping. The BLM lady who watched the land saw me when I arrived and asked me to just write the date on my windshield every week to let her know that I'm still alive out there. Anyways, it was pretty pleasant out there, but every night I was terrified of the bears. They should be sleeping. But if they aren't, it means that they are super hungry and I'm for dinner. For this reason, I decided to set up camp close to a cliff. It was about 40 foot down to the river, and I figured worst case scenario, I could jump and then get to the hot springs to prevent hypothermia. It's a crazy plan, but once you're out there, you realize that bear spray is kind of useless inside the tent. So one early morning, I hear these loud animal noises coming from outside my tent. They're getting closer and very loud, accompanied by grunting and breathing noises. I was too scared to open my tent. I just froze, and the steps kept getting closer and closer and closer. At this point, I could hear it sniffing my tent. I don't dare move. I just lay there. It starts to move away from my tent, but it's still out there. And now, I hear more than one animal. I finally poke my head out, and it's a herd of elk. I swear, though, it was probably the most scared that I've ever been while out camping. I'm not a ranger, but I used to be in a group that's somewhat like the scouts. So we spent a lot of time in the woods and some weird stuff happened often but most of the time it was really easy to explain. One thing happened though that to this day scares the living crap out of me. I was a leader for the age group eight to 10 years old and we were out on a camping trip. It was the first year that we stayed on that terrain and it was huge. Normally, we tend to explore the majority of a terrain before the kids arrive. So we are aware of any possible dangerous spots to avoid. This time it was impossible. Every camp, we have to do what we call a night game. It's usually a scary game in which the kids have to complete several tasks, while the leaders scare the ever-loving crap out of them. Obviously, we had one, too, during that camp. We masked up as monsters and hid out in the woods close to the checkpoints that they had to pass. While running in between checkpoints, I found an open stretch of forest with little to no foliage, so it was ideal for chasing after them. There was no real room to hide, besides behind trees, so I couldn't use my flashlight or they'd be able to see me from miles away. It was dark, like the unsettling kind of dark that plays tricks on your eyes and you start imagining things that aren't real. During my stay there, I saw a shadow that was around my size running past me a few times. I couldn't see it very well, so I just assumed that I was imagining things because nothing was there when I turned my flashlight on. The game was nearing its end, and I saw the shadow again. This time, I could see it vaguely standing near a tree not too far away from me. I thought it was one of the other leaders hiding to scare kids, and I decided to go over there, as it was about time to go back. I aimed my flashlight towards the tree, and while getting closer, I noticed that there was indeed someone standing there, dressed in what looked like a torn burlap sack and had their head covered with a few white plastic bags that looked like they were tied together. I started to feel pure dread. Something felt really off. I asked if everything was okay, but they didn't respond. 
The only thing I heard was this weird sound that sounded like someone knocking on wood. Nevertheless, I went a bit closer until I was about 10 meters away from this person. The knocking sound turned out to be that person smacking his head repeatedly into the tree, and I noticed that he looked like a male. He was barefoot, and his arms and legs were covered with crusted mud. His hands were in a weird cramped position. I was convinced that this was just one of the other leaders pulling a prank, so I told them to knock it off. He slowly turned his head and started walking towards me. Something inside me just told me to run. It didn't matter if it was just a stupid prank, and I ran away scared for nothing. If this wasn't a prank, it felt like I was in serious danger, so I ran as fast as I could. I heard him running after me, but I didn't want to turn around to look as I'd probably run into a tree. I arrived back at the campsite, and every single person that could be dressed like was already there. They couldn't have gotten there before me, and if they did, they sure as heck didn't have time to change into their regular clothes. Still, I told them, and they gave me a good scare with that. They just looked weird at me, thinking I was trying to scare them, and we left it at that. Next day, I wanted to go check it out. Who knows? Maybe some weirdo ate the wrong mushroom and might be out there dying from hypothermia. I took someone else with me just in case, and there was nothing but endless trees. We arrived at the tree where I saw the person banging his head, and there was a dead, skinned, decomposing rabbit nailed to the tree. We called the cops. They looked around quickly and brushed it off as a prank from another scouting group or some kids from the nearby town and left it at that. I didn't notice anything weird after that, so it probably was just a dumb prank. But seriously, some people have a messed up sense of humor. Also, I want to clarify that I'm 99% sure that it was a prank by locals. The cops reacted in a way that looked more like not this stuff again than, oh no, evil murder in the woods and we won't stop it. The cop's reaction definitely makes me think that it's happened before. I was a lone recreation ranger in a small district in southern Idaho. Nearest town from the guard station was about an hour and a half away by car. After moving into the guard station, solar power was not working, and I hadn't slept for about a month due to various factors. Bats in the cabin, something walking on the deck at night. The woods always had an eerie feeling to them, unlike the southwest Ponderosa forest that I was used to. About two months into the seasonal job, I started to hear something walking and scratching on the deck at night, perhaps even on the door. Now this district was known for its badgers and beavers, so I didn't think much of it. When leaving the cabin at night, I always had an eerie feeling like I was being watched. One night I was returning from my grocery run, I always went on Tuesday nights, and I had a bad feeling. At the time, I did not have my shotgun in the vehicle. After stepping out of the vehicle, I looked to the right of the cabin, about 50 feet from my front door. All I could see were two eyes about three and a half to four feet in the air. To say that I freaked out was an understatement. I started yelling, get out of here. But the eyes only crouched down an inch closer. At this point, I could tell that it was a large animal of some kind. Definitely not a coyote. I tossed a piece of firewood in the general area, and the creature leaped back a bit, but did not make a sound. I tossed four or five more pieces, and the creature still inched forward. At this point, I fumbled with the keys. Of course, the solar power was out again. I managed to get inside and grab my shotgun. Technically, you're not supposed to have guns in government housing, but who the heck lives in the Hills Have Eyes backcountry and doesn't carry? I went outside. The creature was a bit closer. Still could not get a good look with my crappy headlamp. 
I loaded the shotgun and continued to throw pieces of wood with one hand. Finally, the creature walked back into the brush. That night, I drank about four IPAs and slept with my shotgun. In the morning, the trail crew came up and we found mountain lion tracks all over the porch, rocking bench, and compound leading back to the creek. After that event, I always heard the rocking chair move and someone or something walking on the porch, but I never found any tracks after that night. Considering that it was always muddy up there, it was weird to not find any tracks. I've been stalked by mountain lions before and never had that eerie feeling like I did in those woods. I was in the Gila wilderness, and a convoy of us campers slash fishers were making the drive on the dirt road from Mogollon to Snow Lake, when we spotted a forest ranger guy pulled over looking in a ditch. Turns out, some idiot tried to make a U-turn, and didn't realize the loose rocks makes it hard to stop. They went over the edge and high-centered, were miles from the nearest official campground, and it's early spring and the night time gets pretty cold. We get a jeep with a winch in position and start to pull the guy out of the ditch. Off a hill comes a white dude in a purple velvet sweatsuit. He's got a walking stick, fanny pack, and the purple velvet sweatsuit. That's it. He's a blonde dude and pretty skinny. He comes up to us and tells us that he's German and having a great time. We could not get over the purple velvet sweatsuit. It was a real pimp sweatsuit. The ranger is immediately suspicious, wants to know where he's staying and where he came from. It was around nine in the morning, and the only way that he could have gotten where he came from was to hike for hours. The German guy was super goofy and just points off towards the other mountain when asked where he's staying slash going. We all think it's funny, but also question how the guy is getting along with no water and no food. The sun is intense above 5,000 feet, even if it's only 75 degrees. The German guy refuses water or any other help and just crosses the road and goes off into the woods. The ranger told us that he can't really keep the guy from doing that since he seemed okay. He said he'd check a few campsites in that direction later to see if he made it. We get to Snow Lake and commence drinking like fish in order to better catch fish. That evening, the ranger pops up to tells us that nobody at the other camp had seen the dude. He radioed around, and no other rangers had abandoned camps or missing campers, and they surely hadn't seen a German dude in a purple pimp sweatsuit. That ranger rolled off duty the next day, and his replacement came by to make sure that the other ranger wasn't smoking something that we gave him. We assured him that it all happened. Never heard another word about the German dude in the purple pimp sweatsuit, but it makes for a good story. Back in the early 90s, my brothers and I were staying with my cousin and her husband, who I'll call Scott, who was a DNR officer. This was opening day of bow season in northern Michigan. While I was at least a mile away from any road or trail, I stumbled across an area that looked like people had been camping recently. They'd even built this weird outdoor kitchen. Being a naive 16 to 17 year old, the kitchen confused me, but I figured that they had left it because hunting season had started, so I just continued on my way. That night, I was telling everyone about it when Scott gets serious and asks me about what it looked like and where it was. After I told him, he warned me not to go back there and to be glad that no one was there. Apparently, some locals had multiple locations like that where they would cook meth, so they wouldn't blow up their houses and to make it harder to get caught. I guess Scott reported it to the cops, and they got raided a couple of days later. I must have missed it, but the guys had set up multiple trail cams 
which were really expensive at the time, all around the area. Based on the pictures of them, I missed the guys by a few hours. They were heavily armed, while I only had a bow and a knife. On the surface, it seems like a well-thought-out plan for some smart people, but they weren't very smart after all. Scott filled us in later on some details. Apparently, they didn't clear the images off the cameras before leaving. The images, though too low of a resolution to recognize their faces, showed them not only cooking meth, but also carrying illegal guns and riding off on customized four-wheelers known to everyone in the area. Those people ended up getting 20 years in prison. I'm not a ranger, but my uncle was. He always told me the story of when he worked in Montana. He was a solid five to 10 miles away from town, so pretty much deep into the woods. He recalled pulling his ATV on top of a semi-big hill that overlooked the valley. In between all the trees, there was this clearing that he could see through his binoculars. Through them, he saw an older lady, 60 plushish, in black, surrounded by six to eight wolves. Now, he's a lengthy distance from this woman, but he starts yelling and honking and all that and takes off down the hill as fast as he could. But when he reached the clearing, there was no one there. No wolves. No woman. Only a silver ring with a black stone in the middle. And he still has it to this day. I've been a ranger in the United States Forest Service for almost 15 years, but this story takes place about three years after I joined. We were getting calls about a lone wolf with a collar on hanging around campsites. Weird, since wolves aren't known to be in the area. But when you work in the field long enough, you start to realize that anything is possible. No calls had mentioned violent behavior from the animal, thank God. I departed from the station around noon to check out the places that it had been sighted. Wandered around for about three hours, no further calls during that time, until I took a break for water. I sat down, had a snack, drank some water and was getting ready to go out again when the thing was about 20 feet out, trotting near the tree line. It seemed friendly and had the collar, so I whistled to it and it came over to me. Getting a closer look, I could see that it wasn't a wolf. It was huge, but it was dark and didn't have the right body structure, though I could see why it would be confusing from a distance. I radioed in and reported that I had the dog with me, but as soon as I'd bring it in, the dog took off. Like he was playing to see how far he could get me to chase him. Typical dog behavior. I went after it and I swear it was a game of chase for at least five minutes as we steadily ran through the forest. Also, by the way, please don't go running through the forest unless you know the area like the back of your hand. Anyway, the dog finally slowed down near a rock bed slash creek area and started pacing around a spot. I drew closer and didn't see anything off at first. Then I noticed it. The overgrowth had almost disguised what appeared to be bones. I called it in immediately, and another team was sent over to recover the remains. When I went to retrieve the dog, he was just gone. But honestly, it wasn't a priority at that point. He was friendly enough, and I figured we'd catch up with him later. The bones were identified as a teenage male's, died by a self-inflicted gunshot wound to the head. He'd been reported missing in the area long before I became a ranger, and there'd been pretty much no hope of finding him. I spoke to his mom on the phone. She called to thank me personally, and she asked how I'd found her son. I mentioned the black dog, then thought that I'd said something wrong since there was a pause on her side of the line. 
After I gave a couple of details about the dog, she quietly explained that her son, who struggled with making connections, had sunken into a deep depression after the death of his best friend, the very dog that had led me to him. I think that I spent the rest of the day sunned. I continue to be in disbelief in a way, but I know what happened. My dad was a ranger. He said once that he was out in the forest with one other ranger. They had to camp overnight halfway to their destination. Well, that night they heard footsteps and a lot of them outside of their tent. Then they heard at least 20 people scream, get out. Needless to say, they got out and radioed it in. The next morning, the cop went out and searched and found four skinned animals pinned to the trees around their campsite. I have a friend who's a trail ranger, basically a ranger who can't get you in trouble. He told me about this time that he was gathering illegally placed wildlife cameras and knocking down hunting stands, feeders, and blinds with another actual ranger. The other ranger wasn't feeling well, so he said he was going to head back as it's a one hour ATV ride. My friend finished up the last one when he heard voices. Keep in mind, he is far off the beaten path. He called out and no one replied. As it was getting dark, he started to head back and found that his ATV wouldn't start. He then noticed that the battery wasn't connected anymore. He reconnected it and started to drive, but it wasn't going fast at all. Less than a half a mile later, the whole thing died. He radioed back basically saying, hey guys, I need someone to come pick me up. They told him they would, but it would be about an hour. He asked if the other guy got back and they said no. He settled down and started a small fire, but before long he heard voices again. It's dark. He's not happy. The voices sound like an argument now. Someone was angry and yelling at someone else who sounded more scared. He called out and asked if anyone needed help. The voices didn't seem to care. He guessed that they had to be less than a thousand feet away. He radioed again, and they said they were having trouble finding what path that he might be on, and they haven't left yet. He asked them just to get the other ranger to tell them about where they are, because he left with the iPad that had the map. They said that he still isn't back. About three more minutes go by, and he hears the voices start up again. He decides to walk to them, hoping that maybe they can stop being drunk buttholes and maybe that they have a map. He walked in their direction, but the voices seemed to be getting further as he got closer. Finally, after 20 minutes, he gave up and walked back. He got a radio call, and they said the other guy was found passed out, covered in vomit, and was being taken to the hospital, but that he crossed off everywhere that they had found a stand, so they have a general idea of where he is. Then the radio died. Then the voices came back. Bored out of his mind, he decided to listen to what they were arguing about, picking up things like, well, it wasn't yours to take, I don't care, you knew better, and so on. His guess was two hunters arguing over a kill. Then he heard the one shout something ineligible. Then silence. Then, bang, a gunshot. He doused his fire and hid. After that, he heard nothing, just his breathing for the next half hour until he saw ATV lights. He told the guy picking him up everything and they called back. They had people looking for three hours and found nothing. They came back the next day with police and dogs. After about an hour, a shallow grave was found and in it was a long dead man who had clearly been shot in the face. Thing was, it was a skeleton who had been there for years. So, 
Either the argument that he heard just ended with a bang and both parties went home last night, or he heard the murder of someone from years ago. I work at a summer camp, taking kids on canoe trips for a few days at national parks. One night after setting up a campsite and quenching the fire, I was doing the last check of the campsite. I looked at the lake and saw this lone man paddling a canoe. I thought it was pretty strange, but it's not out of the ordinary. The only weird thing being that he was alone. He waved, so being the polite Canadian that I am, I waved back. I went to bed in the staff tent and everything was normal. I had a bit of trouble sleeping that night, so I decided to go stargazing as that usually calms me down. I exit the tent and see this man in our campsite looking through our tarps and bags. For what, I don't know. Maybe drugs or food, but that's not important. This stranger is by campers that I'm responsible for. We make eye contact and this guy stands up. He's tall, and I'm quite short, so I quickly grab the first thing that I can think of, a can of bear mace. This stuff is meant to deter a charging bear, so I hold it ready to spray and tell him to get out of my campsite. He doesn't really speak, just like, oh, I, I didn't see you guys. When he's leaving, I immediately wake up the other staff, and we make sure that he leaves. We use our satellite phone to call park rangers with our position, the guy's characteristics, and tell them the story. Without a doubt, the scariest moment I had on the job. I've learned not to fear animals, as for the most part, they're predictable, dumb, and not malicious. But people, on the other hand, the scariest and most dangerous thing to encounter out in the wilderness is another person. My dad is a forestry technician, and this happened to one of his co-workers. They were up doing some sort of job in the very most northerly part of Ontario. Anyways, it was the middle of the night, and she was half asleep, and vaguely heard something outside of her tent. Then she felt something push against her tent, and the zipper was slowly opening. She opened her eyes, and saw the head of a polar bear in her tent. Polar bears are far from the cuddly toys that you see, and they're known to be super aggressive and will hunt and eat people. She laid there paralyzed with fear, thinking that it was the end. And then slowly, the bear retracted its head and left. Park Ranger here. I work at a park just outside of a metro area. 5,000 acres and a 1.5,000 acre lake. Super busy park, but we have some areas of the off-beaten path. I've stumbled on some really creepy animal sacrifice stuff once because I happened to follow the crows. You barely have to worry about animals. It's the people that we share this world with. My brother has a winter job closing parks. He drives around in a county vehicle and makes sure that no one is in the parks before closing the gates. He does this from about 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. and it's pretty dark out. The other day, he was closing one of the parks and saw a man hopping through the woods. The man then saw him and crouched down and just watched my brother do his closing duties. My brother left and went on to another park where he found a dead coyote frozen solid, standing up as if it were alive.
One winter, while patrolling trails, I came across a homeless guy who passed out, drunk in the snow. He had been there for about a week in below freezing temperatures. He was frozen solid and still had a bottle of Mad Dog 2020 in his hand. I was a ranger at Yosemite and passed every day through the gate along the Merced River. One day there was a commotion which caused a slowdown, but didn't involve us so we crept by, just slow enough to hear a man in anguish trying loudly to explain something. It was early summer, but the river was still raging from a solid snowpack that year, and we found out later that the guy was just trying to take a picture of his wife with the torrent as a backdrop. Apparently, he'd kept telling her to back up just a bit further when she disappeared. Us and the firefighting guys were tasked with finding her body. Nobody made much of a pretense that she might have survived. She turned up two months later, after the river had settled enough that we'd started swimming in it, just upstream from our swimming hole. There's this old lighthouse at the park that I work at. People from Northern Jersey might be familiar with it. Next to it sits our visitor's center, formerly the lighthouse keeper's quarters. Last summer, I got put on the graveyard shift for a pay period. While out tooling around the fort, the park is an old army base, around 2 a.m., changing all the Pokemon gems to Team Mystic, I noticed that there was a light on in the second floor of the quarters. One of the interp rangers must have forgotten to turn it off, I said to myself. So I head in, do a quick sweep of the building and turn it off. I go back outside, get in my car, and I'm about to drive away. When I look back up to the second floor, the light is back on and something just moved across the window. My mind's eye saw a human figure but I honestly just noped out of there so fast that it could have just been a bat or something like that. I'm not a park ranger, but my friend was. And the worst thing that he found was a dead body of a runner that had collapsed near a trail. It was an older guy that must have had a heart attack and had fallen to the side of the trail so people hadn't seen him. The worst part was that when he called 911, they demanded that he try to do CPR while he tried to explain that the dude's eyes were open and covered in flies and his body was stone cold. So no, he was not going to do that. This is my dad's friend's story, not mine. It was around 10 p.m. and my dad's friend was driving around locking all the gates so that people can't drive on certain roads. And he's on a gravel road. All of a sudden, he sees a cloud of dust as if someone just drove past him, but it came from the direction that he just locked the gate in. So nobody should have been able to get in. He got out of his car and started walking down the road to see if he saw any tracks. He didn't, but he saw this old truck that looked like it was just sitting there for years. Keep in mind, this is the direction that he just came from. He's starting to get sketched out, so he turns around to head back to his car, and when he does, he sees a body hanging. No joke. Someone hung themselves in the park. He called the police and the guy had no family. My dad claims that he actually saw the body. Apparently it was all skinny and blue and stunk as if it had been hanging for a couple of days. Some people say that they see the guy walking around. 
But yeah, pretty much. The road is haunted now. I wasn't a park or forest ranger, but I was a historical docent, basically a historical tour guide. And this happened when I was about 15. First, a little bit of background. I worked at a place called Blennerhassett Island in Parkers, West Virginia. Blennerhassett Island is infamous because of Aaron Burr went there with a whole plot to take over the US after he killed Alexander Hamilton. And it's actually a very interesting story but it's not relevant to this one. The island is said to have been haunted by various people slash entities because many people died there, including members of the Blennerhassett family, and sailors would bury bodies on the island if someone died in their ship. Some of the most commonly seen ghosts are the ghosts of Margaret, Harmon, and their daughter, nicknamed Baby Margaret Blennerhassett, an Indian and a groundkeeper. The Blennerhassets are often seen in their home on the island or walking around. The Indian is seen on the south tip of the island, and the groundkeeper is seen in the Putnam House or House. Margaret is seen most often and is seen in a white flowing gown, and people say they smell lilac before they see her. On to my story. One day, I was walking towards a clump of trees with a bench so I could eat for my lunch break when I saw something white out of the corner of my eye. I thought it was just one of the other docents because some people had on aprons. But when I turned and looked, it was a woman in a white gown. I knew that people had seen Margaret, but usually they saw her near dusk and this was in the middle of the day. I stopped walking and just looked at her. I started to say something to her, but when I blinked, she vanished. I immediately went back to where the others were and told them what I saw, but they didn't believe me. To this day, I'm convinced that I saw her ghost, and it was really terrifying. I'll try my best to recall this story that just popped into my memory randomly. This would have been in the late 90s in Connecticut. Maybe about 1998. I was a teenager, and some of my friends had started getting driver's licenses. So we did what any teen in the 90s did. Drive around with our friends looking for something to do in a small town. There were about five of us in a friend's car. I wasn't driving. I was on the passenger side in the back seat. We were riding around, listening to music, talking. No substances were used. We were on a wooded, windy road at night. Suddenly, the driver slammed on her brakes, and we watched as this creature crossed in front of us. Illuminated by the headlights, the creature was about toddler height, very, very pale, no clothing, bald, and very slender. It paused briefly to look at us. I remember we all got dead silent. It passed the road quickly and went into the woods. It walked on two legs. It was most certainly not an animal that I'd ever seen, especially since it was bipedal, and it definitely wasn't a kid. The only thing I can't recall is its face. I did see the creature, but from my side in the car, my view was slightly obstructed. We were all silent for a few moments, processing what we'd seen. I remember another passenger whispered, Dude, what the heck? We continued on in silence with the occasional, Did you see that thing? We kept the radio off at that point, and the driver started bringing us all to our homes. We were so creeped out, we didn't feel like having fun anymore. One of our friends, nicknamed El Chalupa, so occasionally we'd bring it up. I've lost touch with all of them at this point. I'm in my 40s now, but we never did find out what we saw. This was before most of us even had home computers, let alone a cell phone or Google. 
Any idea? When I was young, probably under 10, I was on a horseback ride with my parents. We were all riding our own horses. My horse at the time was always the lead. We were going up a slight incline in some wooded trails. I remember feeling my horse stop as if she was startled. I looked to my right, and between the trees stood a male figure. I don't remember a lot, but he was green in appearance as if he was covered in moss. He had a white tight t-shirt on. He was rather muscular, but no larger than the average man. It has stopped mid-stride and stared back at me. I looked back to see my parents, and if they were seeing what I was seeing, and when I looked back, it was gone. To this day, it still gives me the chills. I always wanted to know the significance. This happened around 2012 or 2013. Me and my friend, ages 13 and 14 respectively, were out exploring a patch of woods at the edge of my hometown in northern Minnesota. We went in a bit deeper than we usually did and spotted a well-built tarp shelter. Being the tactical tweens we were, we snuck up to it from different sides with a BB gun and a knife and called out, to which there was no reply. We went inside and found some clean tin cookware and utensils on a little handmade counter slash shelf. We came back the next day and the shelter was destroyed. The tarps cut up and there were stab marks in the cookware. I still wonder to this day whose shelter it was and why it was destroyed like that. I'm a former Brazilian Marine, eight years of active duty, and I'd like to report a well-known story among the Marines about the disappearance of a sergeant on an island where we usually conduct military training once a year, known as Ilha da Marambia. The Ilha of Marambaya, Marambaya Island, is an island that during the time when Brazil was still an empire, was refuge of slaves who fled the farms and gathered in communities in the most isolated parts of the island. These people are known as Quilombolas, and to this day, they still survive on the island through hunting and fishing. At one of these military trainings that takes place every year, a newly graduated sergeant, I don't know his name, but let's call him Ricardo to make it easier to tell the story, made friends with one of the Quilambalas who live there in the region, which is very rare to happen, as we are advised to avoid any contact with them as they are known to be hostile to the military man. During some conversations with the Quilambola, he told Sergeant Ricardo about an ancient story of an old treasure hidden inside a cave in one of the isolated areas of the island. This old treasure that was hidden there by a group of thieves who shipwrecked on the island many years ago during the time when Brazil was still an empire. However, he told Sergeant Ricardo that he should not enter the cave because any Quilombola that had already entered into it never returned again, so it was known to be inhabited by a spirit who protected the treasure from outsiders. Ricardo was skeptical and did not believe much in spirits so he asked for the Quilambala to show him where the cave was. The same refused to show the cave entrance, because he said that it was very dangerous. Ricardo then did not insist, and decided to forget that story and just focus on the military training. Years passed, and Ricardo never forgot the story of the treasure on the island, and he was thinking about how his life would be changed if he managed to find that treasure. 
The life of a marine in Brazil was very rough, and the salary was very low. So he dreamed of getting out of the Marine Corps and starting his own business, and that treasure could help him with that. So he decided that the next time that he went to attend a military training on the Marambaya Island, he would insist that the Quilambala show him where the cave entrance is, even if for that he had to offer him money to show him the way. So after a few months, Sergeant Ricardo became aware that he would be chosen to be part of the next training on the island. So that would be his chance to change his life, and he would not let that escape. Arriving on the island, he attended the usual training drills and waited until the day off, which was one of the days when there would be no training and he would have more time to explore the cave. He waited for Don to go to the Quilambala's place, without anyone from his squad seeing him, since the exploration of the island by the military was prohibited by the officers, as there have been cases of military disappearing in previous training. And then he asked one of the Quilambalas to show him the way to the cave. Before he went to the Quilambala, Ricardo invited a close friend to go with him, to help him find the treasure. This close friend is the person who spread the story that you are reading and said that if they found the treasure, he would share the treasure with him. The sergeant's friend refused to go because he said it was very dangerous and advised him to not go there either. He ignored his friend's advice and decided to go there anyway. After finding one of the Quilambalas and insisting that it showed him the way, he agreed and took Ricardo to the entrance of the cave where the sergeant entered in search of the treasure that could change his life. The next day, the sergeant's friend noticed that he had not returned from his search in the cave and told the officers what had happened. Search teams were requested, and it took about a week to find the entrance to the cave where the sergeant entered. After conducting searches inside the cave, they found the sergeant Ricardo's dead body. Probably he was lost inside and could not find the exit or was bit by a snake. Heavy rain on that island is very common, and normally snakes take refuge inside of the caves. It's said that the Marine Corps compensated the sergeant's family and hid the case from the public so that it did not appear in the newspapers. I don't know if that really happened or not, but it's a very common story in the Marine Corps that is often told by older Marines. It's said that this story happened in the early 1990s, so I think at the time, it was not very difficult to hide this kind of story from the media. This happened last night, and I'm still pretty freaked out. We're up at my father-in-law's for Christmas. He lives in South Jersey in a pretty remote area just north of Burn State Forest. It's quiet, and always a little eerie, but felt especially weird with the overcast weather and unseasonable warmth of the last few days. We did Christmas dinner at my brother-in-law's and got back pretty late. Because of the radiator heat and outside temps, we slept with the window open. I woke up in the middle of the night to use the bathroom, and as I was drifting back to sleep, I heard a low wail, building in volume for a few seconds before stopping abruptly. I figured it was just an odd sounding bird and tried to go back to sleep. It happened twice more over the course of maybe five minutes. I was basically able to put it out of my head and start drifting back to sleep when I heard a loud, shrill blast, like a too high elephant's trumpet. At that point, I shot up, heart racing, I knew I had to close the window and took a beat to build up to it. When I dragged myself out of bed, I peeked through the shutters before I reached to shut the pane. Whatever it was had tripped a motion sensor light at the back of the property and was half illuminated, standing maybe a hundred feet from the back door right at the tree line. It was cloaked with its head partially shrouded. The bottom of its face looked flat and round like the back of a dinner plate with another smaller, half-uncovered black circle at its center. I immediately slammed the window shut and it didn't move, just stood there with its face tilted towards the window. 
I shut the blinds and crept into bed and basically hid until the sun came up. I didn't hear any more sounds. I dared another look out the window after dawn and the figure was gone and I managed to drift back to sleep for a few hours. Has anyone seen anything like this or know what it might be? I'm frantically Googling, but nothing is really coming up. So to give you a little bit of background information on this story, which is 100% true, I would like to start with the fact that I am European. I posted another story a couple of months back about something that happened to me in Tuscany, Italy. As for me and my friends in this story, we are from Spain. And when this happened at the end of September of 2023, we were fairly new to the USA. I moved here a while back for law school and so did my friends. We had been living there for a few months and decided to explore the nature of this beautiful continent as we all live in New York City. So, long story short, we decided to go on a road trip to Canada, drive around Lake Ontario and then drive back to New York City through upstate New York. I'm a male, and my friends were three females. For the sake of anonymity, let's call them Lisa, Anne, and Charlotte. Everything went super smooth until last night. So for our last night, we had rented an off-grid cabin in a remote area in the woods in upstate New York. To give some locals an idea, we were like half an hour drive from Harrisburg, I think. Me and Lisa had decided to spend one night in this cabin because it was one with nature. The cabin was super old, made from log wood, and there was no running water or electricity. Both me and Lisa had experience with survival in the wild in Europe. I, for myself, had been a boy scout my whole life and even was a scout leader for a while. Our other two friends were, as much as I love them, purebred city girls. They had pretty much zero experience with camping or to just be in a place where there is no service for the phones, as was the case in this cabin. We had been driving all day to get there and when we reached the beginning of the forest, it was already past 10 p.m., and it was really dark that night. While driving to this place, we lost internet connection with the GPS, so I had to drive to the cabin on intuition, paired with a good old-fashioned map, hoping for the best, while trying to drive safe on these muddy trails. It was also rainy the whole day. On the way there, Anna and Charlotte were in the back of the car, and the moment they lost phone service, they got pretty uneasy for the rest of the ride. All of a sudden, in the pitch black darkness of the forest, we all saw a campfire, but there were no houses around or people, just a campfire, a well-organized one since the fire was not spreading and it was not as big as a bonfire. It kind of startled all of us as this was a little bit weird since there was no one around and we were really deep in the forest already. Plus, it was getting very late. When this happened, we also reached the end of the trail, and we figured we had taken the wrong trail at a crossroad before. So I turned around and we were on our way again. Half an hour later, and a couple of wrong trails later, we finally had arrived at our destination, as we could finally see the first glimpse of this godforsaken cabin in the middle of nowhere. To give you an idea of how old it was, the outhouse was made of wood and was outside of the cabin. When we arrived, it was still raining and both Anne and Lisa were definitely not in the mood for getting out of the car and getting in the cabin with zero lights. So me and Lisa left the lights on at the car and we went inside the cabin while also using our phone flashlights to check the cabin out and see if we could find any old flashlights which we did, and to see if we could turn on the fireplace, which we didn't, because all of the wood was still wet from the rain, and it seemed that no one had prepared dry wood anywhere. So with a couple of old flashlights and a small improvised fire that I managed to make in the stove, we all four got in the cabin and started to make some pasta for ourselves. Meanwhile, 
The girls were preparing the beds and closing the windows since it was already cold in this part of the state. The cabin had a small ladder which led to an elevated room slash space with a bed where all three of the girls could fit in and I would sleep downstairs in a bunk bed that seemed older than the First World War. While making pasta, Anna, one of the city girls, came up to me, and knowing that both Lisa and Charlotte did not like to hear anything scary at night, told me that she had seen an old cemetery in the middle of the forest on the way to our cabin, and that she had seen a figure walk around there. I first laugh it off as nothing, as I mentioned in my previous story, I do not consider myself a big believer of scary stuff. Being from Spain, we take promises very seriously. To swear to God is very serious for us. And she swore to God that she was not lying. I told her then that I believed her, but that there was no need to panic as I would lock all the doors when we would go to sleep. We had some pasta, managed to make a couple of s'mores, which were lovely by the way, and drank a couple of beers, or at least I did. They all had just one. I can assure you that I am not drunk after just a couple of beers and that I would never start to hallucinate. Just saying that in case anyone thinks that I saw stuff because of the beer. They all three went to sleep pretty early after finishing the s'mores and their beer. And I, considering that I really love the outdoors and that I don't really mind a little bit of rain, decided to take my last beer and a flashlight outside to the front porch, also very old and made of wood, and sat myself down with my beer while enjoying the sound of the rain and the lovely sight of not seeing a single light in the distance. I could greatly appreciate this coming from New York City, and I just scanned the area around with my flashlight. There was nothing much really to see, besides a lot of trees and a small creek a little bit further away. All I could hear was the wind, the rain, and the running water down in the creek. That was until I suddenly heard what I would describe as a weird roar. The first thing that came to my mind was a bear, but I had researched well before our trip, and I knew that bears were not common at all in this part of the state. I also know what a bear roar would sound like, and it did not resemble it a lot, except from the fact that it was a deep roar, if you get what I mean. Startled, but not really scared, I continued to scan the rest of the forest for as far as I could see from the porch. It was then when my eyes caught the glimpse of a figure, well hidden deep into a tree line. I would describe the figure as tall. For a reference, I'm six foot four, and I thought that this thing was at least a foot or two higher than me. It was well hidden because with its brown fur, that is what I think it was at least, or the skin in any case, blended in well with the trees in autumn. It was definitely aware of our presence, as I saw two eyes glimpsing into my flashlight. I could not tell you what it was, but I swear to God that it was not a bear. It was bipedal, and had rather long arms, I would say. We looked at each other for what seemed like an eternity, but in reality it was more like five seconds before it vanished behind a tree and I heard another roar. It was then when I felt all the hair stand up, and I was definitely very much scared. I went inside as quick as I could and locked all the doors and closed all the curtains. I quickly went to bed and tried to wave it off as just my exhaustion of driving all day playing tricks on my mind. But I promise you, this was very real. After an hour or so, I had calmed down and finally fell asleep. The rest of the night was uneventful, and the next morning when I went to relieve myself after having drank beer the night before, the weather had cleared and it was rather sunny, and as far as I could see the forest was calm and beautiful, no sight of any animals or anything abnormal. We had a nice breakfast that morning, and left for our way back to the city that never sleeps, and so also ends my story of that night. I never talked about what I saw that night, because I know all three girls did not like to hear scary stories, and I figured after these months that this was the best place to share it. If anyone has an idea of what it could have been, please feel free to enlighten me, especially if it is backed up with rational reasoning.
Hi everyone. I've debated posting this for a long time, but never got around to it, mainly because I try to keep calm and keep this memory out of my brain. This might be a long one, but this is a creepy thing that happened to me about four years ago. For starters, I grew up in southwest Saskatchewan and moved onto my aunt's farm in 2019 to live in the other house that is on their property. The house is fairly old, but I loved it. It wasn't long after I moved in, though, that I started to feel uneasy in the house alone. I would close every window when it got dark, as it felt like something was watching me through them every night. Eventually, I decided to get a puppy to keep myself company when my boyfriend at the time was at work or away from the house. It helped to have the company, but I always dreaded having to take her outside when it was dark. For a bit of scene setting, our house sat on the left side of the gravel road. At the back of the house, there was about 10 meters of backyard, and then there was a cow pasture in the cow barn. We didn't own cows, but in the summer, another farmer would rent our pasture space, and we would have them on the property. It wasn't uncommon at night to hear coyotes surround the farm either, and there were tons. Every so often when I'd go out with my puppy, we'd hear them all around us, too close for comfort. We had a farm dog too, who would keep the coyotes away for the most part, as she was huge. But every so often, she'd wander elsewhere on the property to scout, and the coyotes would get a little too close for comfort. They always tried to lure my puppy out to them, but luckily I kept her leashed. Now, one thing you should know about my pup is that it takes her forever to find a spot to go potty. This is still a problem today, four years later, but back then, it was the bane of my existence. She would pace for at least five minutes, and that was only after finding a suitable spot. Sometimes we would be out there for almost a half an hour, just so that she would go and not go in the house. Another problem of hers. Huskies, am I right? On this particular night, it was raining pretty heavily. I was not happy to be out there, and she had decided that she wasn't going to go until she found her perfect spot. We had already been out there for 15 minutes, and at this point she was also getting frustrated with the rain and wanted to go inside. But I wanted her to go before we went in, since we'd already been out there for so long. So, as any annoyed puppy mother would do, I started getting a little frustrated and would repeat, go, go potty, every time she'd get distracted from her objective. It was dark. I was cold and annoyed. And to make matters worse, the cows behind us were fussing fairly loudly. This was out of the ordinary for them. They were usually quiet and sleeping at this time of night. I was also hearing what sounded like a strange bird whistling, but shook it off as probably being an owl. I tried to keep it off my mind as I kept shouting and pleading go through the rain to my small, fuzzy, white dog. I was facing away from the pasture, and suddenly, in my left ear, I heard it. Go. Now, one thing you should know about me is I have a very strong flight response typically, but this froze me on the spot as I was mostly confused at what the heck I had just heard. I tried telling myself that I didn't hear it. I tried telling myself that it was just a moo from a cow that I had heard wrong. But again, as if spoken directly behind me, I heard it again. Go. Go. It sounded unnatural. It was as if it came from someone who had never spoken a word before. A raspy, deep, monotone, go. It almost sounded like it was coming out of an old radio. But of course, there were no radios out there. Every time it said it, it sounded the exact same as the first time it was said. And whatever it was had started repeating it as if it had been taught its new favorite word. At this point, I spun around to the pasture to find nothing there. Then again from behind me, go. This had all happened in the span of about three seconds, 
And at this point, I remember shouting out loud, all right, don't have to tell me twice, as I picked up my little fur ball and made a mad dash for my front door. I swiftly locked both doors behind me and sat bewildered in my kitchen. The puppy went back to puppying immediately, obviously unbothered by it all, and happy mom wasn't making her stay out in the rain any longer. I picked up my phone and called my aunt, asking her if my uncle had been out in the field with the cows. She said no, and I explained to her what had just happened to me. She sent my uncle over to the pasture to check it out, but soon after told me that he hadn't seen or heard anything. He said he'd check the pasture again in the morning. I spent my night hiding from the windows, with the lights and TV on loud enough to not hear anything outside. The next morning, when my uncle checked the pasture, he found two calves dead. Explains the colossal cow panic that had ensued the night before. I regret this, but I didn't push for more information, as I honestly just didn't want to know. But they told me other than that, they didn't find anything out of the ordinary. A few months later, I moved off the farm. I couldn't be in that house alone anymore, and my boyfriend and I had parted ways. A few months after that, I started to go to therapy for the paranoia that this had caused me. I started feeling like people were watching me, out to get me. Another few months after that, I moved out of the province for good and finally felt safe. I'm wondering if any of you here have any idea what the heck this could have been. There's no chance there would have been someone in our field, as we were fairly far away from town and neighbors, and we have cameras that would have seen anyone enter our property. Coyotes are common, but I don't think that they are capable of mimicking words. Any ideas? In many rural areas of the American West, cutting firewood in national forests is a necessary chore if you want a warm house through the winter. Our home in mountainous central Idaho was no exception. It was normal for my dad to pick me and my brothers up after school and head into the mountains for an afternoon of firewood gathering. My dad would fell the dead trees, then saw them into chunks. My brothers and I had the task of rolling the wood to the truck and loading it, we would continue this assembly line process until we had a truckload of wood, usually before nightfall. Hot, sweaty, and exhausted, we would pile into the truck cab and make our way down the mountain. At home the next day, we would unload and split the wood and stack it into neat little rows. This process was repeated until we had a winter's worth of fuel for our house, our grandma's cabin, and any extra for elderly neighbors. This particular afternoon, we decided to try a different logging road on the other side of the valley. This was well outside our familiar logging area. No real reason for the change, but my dad said he wanted a change of scenery. This logging road hadn't been maintenanced in some time. Large rocks and fallen branches littered the path. My brothers and I had to walk out in front, pushing rocks and wood out of the way as my dad lurched the truck up the switchbacks. Yard by yard, we slowly made our way up the mountain. That hike was physically brutal. As we ascended the mountain and got farther into TBE trees, this odd feeling started to set in. I wasn't sure if it was the exhaustion from the hike or something more. There was electricity in the air, like the whole mountain was buzzing at a wavelength just below my senses. In some odd way, it felt like the mountain knew we were there, and it wasn't welcome to that fact. I wanted to say something to my brothers, but before I opened my mouth, my younger brother said, does anyone else feel like we're not welcome here? My older brother and I stopped in our tracks and looked back at him. Both of us nodded in agreement. This moment was broken by my dad honking and motioning us to continue clearing the path. Reluctantly, we pushed forward to a small clearing in the woods where we finally stopped the truck. My dad, oblivious to our apprehension, or simply choosing to ignore it, grabbed his saw and went to work. As the wood was felled and loaded, 
I couldn't shake this ominous feeling enveloping me like a dark shroud. I noticed my brothers were taking occasional glances over their shoulders as we worked. Everyone but my dad, it seemed, was on edge. The sun nestled down into the trees and twilight began to set in. As the light drained from the sky, my anxiety only intensified. It wasn't until my dad unexpectedly told us to load up that a wave of relief flooded over me. I could see the tension in my brothers melt away as well. The truck wasn't fully loaded, an oddity. Getting a half load was a waste, according to my dad. We would sometimes work into the dark just to make sure the truck was full. But tonight, he seemed eager to head home. With everything loaded, we started down the road. Although dead tired, everyone seemed to be in a much lighter mood. We were chatting and cracking jokes while trying to blow off steam from the afternoon. We were almost out of the tree line and into the valley desert. Going down the switchbacks, you want to be careful, especially with a load, even if it was half that. A brown blur jumped up from the downslope side of the switchback. Shit was the only word that came out of my dad's mouth as he slammed on the brakes. Loaded with wood and traveling downhill, there was no way to avoid smashing into the blur. The truck finally ground to a standstill. The four of us peered through the windshield. Nobody saying a word. Illuminated in the yellow glow of our headlights was a crumpled body of deer. Grumbling and cursing the deer's existence, my dad exited the truck to investigate. Doing as they were told, my brothers stayed put in the truck. I didn't listen following close behind my dad. The truck was fine. We hadn't been traveling fast when we smacked the deer. Just some hair and blood in the grill guard. Hitting a deer really wasn't that unusual. The mountains were full of them. What was unusual was that the deer dropped so quickly. At faster speeds, deer could still be upright and sprinting away to die in the woods after a collision. That last burst of an adrenaline dump. This one fell over like a rag doll. Before even approaching the carcass, a deep, foul smell hit us. Deer smell bad when they're alive, but this was on a whole other level. It was the smell of decay and rot. My stomach began to turn as we got closer. My nostrils were burning. Coming up on the deer, it was clearly dead. Really, really dead. The stench was so overwhelming my eyes were watering. The body was a true horror scene. The deer's eyes were gone, replaced with sunken hollow hole. As if to overcompensate for their absence, the tunge was swollen and black as coal. It could not be contained and hung out the side of its mouth. The underbelly was split open. Entrails and offal spilled into the dirt. In the dim headlights, it looked as though the deer's fur and viscera were moving, wiggling almost. Holding my breath, I bent down for a closer look, and my heart stopped. The deer, inside and out, was covered in maggots. It was dead all right, but our truck didn't kill it. Clearly, it had been dead for days, if not weeks. I backed away, retching. That electric anxiety came screaming back. My dad was always the quiet, stoic type. But right now, even in the dim headlights of the truck... I could see the abject horror in his face. His gaze wasn't on the deer, but focused down the mountain. Poorly masking the fear in his voice, he told me firmly to walk back to the truck and get inside. I obeyed without objection. As I grabbed the door handle, a loud shriek came out of the trees. Branches were shattering and breaking. Something was heading up the slope towards us. I slammed my door closed just as my dad reached the truck. Before his door was shut, he pressed on the accelerator. The truck launched forward, sending us over the deer carcass and racing downhill. With mine and my brothers yelling, it was hard to tell if the shrieking was following us. Our truck popped out of the tree line and into the desert sagebrush. Once out of the woods, everything quieted down. We were left with only the rumble of the engine and wind through the half-opened windows. Pulling into our property, the truck came to a stop. We sat in silence. No one moved to leave the truck. Everyone started talking at once. We all had questions. What was the screaming? How does a dead deer jump uphill in front of a truck? There was no way the truck killed it. 
Dad just shook his head and motioned for us to quiet down. That deer was dead when we hit it. It didn't jump out in front of us. It was thrown at us. We stared at him. He explained that all day up on the mountain he had felt uneasy. Not wanting to worry us boys, he kept it to himself. He described it like walking into a stranger's living room while they were upstairs asleep. That feeling never left him, and as twilight came, he happened to catch a shadow in the corner of his eye, not far into the woods, and saw figures moving from tree to tree. He couldn't focus on them long enough for a good look before they dodged behind trees. His stomach dropped. Working hard to keep his composure, he hurried us to the truck to leave. It was after hitting the deer and discovering it was long dead that my dad pieced together what was happening. Something threw that deer to get us to stop. Before the shrieking began, he could hear something moving in the darkness beyond the road. It was a trap. Running back to the truck could have started an ambush or triggered a prey drive. So we walked back to the truck. The second we were inside, he drove that truck downhill with no intention of stopping for anyone or anything. That feeling of electricity didn't disappear until we hit the county highway. My brothers and I never saw anything as we drove away, but those screams from the forest will never leave my mind. We didn't gather firewood the rest of the season. For the first time in his life, my dad just bought what we needed. And although we started to gather wood again the next season, we've never been back up that particular mountain. The Forest Service has permanently closed and reclaimed that road. The only way back up into those woods is a long hike, one I'm not interested in ever taking again. Whatever was on that mountain, whatever threw that deer carcass, whatever chased us out of the woods, it did not want us there. It wanted us gone. Or worse, it wanted us dead. This story happened just this summer. I'm only now getting around to writing it down. I would consider myself an outdoorsman. I grew up in the sticks. I've spent a lot of my life wandering in and enjoying the back country. I'm older now and have settled down in the suburbs. Wife, two boys, a house, a dog, a desk job, the whole suburban shtick. I want opportunities for my kids that come from suburban life but I also want them to grow up with an appreciation for the outdoors. So when my oldest son was big enough for his first solo father-son camping trip, I was excited. My wife and younger son stayed home for this midsummer trip. It was going to be a great bonding experience for me and my son. Because my son is just five, I didn't want to do anything too extreme on our first big solo camping trip. We needed a place that wasn't too deep into the Colorado Front Range but still allowed for dispersed camping. I don't consider camping in RV parks or established campgrounds to be actual camping. You might as well be at a motel watching TV. Camping at most is a tent, sleeping bag, and a fire. A dispersed camping area called Gordon Gulch, west of Boulder, caught my attention. I had never been to this area before. There were no facilities and it was dispersed enough you couldn't see or hear other campers nearby. My son and I had a blast that day. We set up camp, collected firewood, went for a hike, saw a moose and a bobcat, tried a little fishing, and finally, as the sunlight faded, we returned to our campsite to light a fire. We had a traditional and nutritious camping meal of fire-burned hot dogs and marshmallows. It was a good day. Definitely a core memory for both my son and me. The perfect first camping experience for a preschooler. Or so I thought. After all that fun, my son and I were exhausted. It was time for bed. The sound of an evening summer breeze through the pines is better than any commercial sleep aid. I don't even remember drifting off. It was a hard, dreamless sleep that only physical exertion can bring. One thing about my son, he inherited many things from me, hair color, eye shape, disposition, and my unusually wide feet. But one peculiar thing he got from his mother was sleep talking. It's not unusual to hear him having full conversations in his sleep. 
it gets more pronounced when he's overly tired. I was catapulted out of the void of sleep. Not sure what aroused me, I sat up collecting myself. The world seemed to be at peace. It was quiet. Just me and the breeze through the treetops. I couldn't figure out what woke me so suddenly. The sound of my son laughing in his sleep cut through my groggy confusion. It was a deep belly laugh. Must be a fun dream, I thought hazily. Gently rocking him was enough to quiet him down. That must have been what startled me, I determined. As I repositioned to fall back to sleep, my son burst out laughing. I sighed and closed my eyes. He'll quiet down soon enough, I thought. He laughed again. This time, his laugh was echoed by something outside our tent. I held my breath and listened, unsure of what I just heard. It wasn't an echo. There was something out there, and it was laughing in unison with my son. My grogginess vanished as the adrenaline began to pump. It couldn't be real. It had to be my imagination. I sat up in my sleeping bag listening to the night. Hearing nothing after a minute, my muscles relaxed. I started to settle back down. Must have been hearing things. I was tired after all. Checking the time I saw it was four in the morning. The sun would be up in a couple hours. My son laughed again. And again, it was answered with laughter outside. I was now absolutely certain it was not an echo. As I tried to make sense of what was happening, the voice outside called out my son's name. My blood ran cold. That voice. It was so familiar. Then it clicked in my brain. It was the voice of my younger son. That wasn't at all possible. He was safe at home with my wife, miles and miles away. I could hear twigs crunching beyond our thin nylon tent walls. It was impossible to tell the distance from us. But there was something out there, circling us. Unprompted this time, it called out my son's name in that little toddler voice. My five-year-old, still fast asleep, called out to his brother, asking him to play. The thing outside the tent laughed in reply and urged my son to come outside. That thing with my little son's voice sounded cold, hollow, dead. The floodgates of my adrenaline burst open. Cold sweat formed on my face. I was frightened out of my mind, but my primal caveman brain roared to life. I was in Papa Bear mode. Nothing was going to take or hurt my son. I was putting a stop to this. Whatever it was out there, I didn't care. You don't mess with my kids. Say what you will. But when you're camping miles from anything, it's not worth the risk of being unarmed. Wild animals, wild people, you have to be prepared. I almost always take a firearm with me when I'm camping. Pepper spray and bear bells are great, but nothing gets attention from a conscious threat faster than the sound of chambering around. I spoke loudly into the night that I had a gun and was coming out. I hoped the fear in my voice was masked by my aggressiveness. The only reply was the breeze through the treetops. My son was still asleep. Kid's a hard sleeper. Another trait from his mom. My wife and I have joked that he could sleep through a tornado. Stepping out into the cool summer night, a gun in one hand and a flashlight in the other, I surveyed the campsite. The fire was down to embers. Our fishing gear was leaning against the pickup. The firewood was still neatly stacked. Nothing seemed out of place. Not wanting to stray far from the tent or my sleeping son, I sat down outside the entrance. I waited in the dark with the flashlight off. Not far into the trees, I heard a branch break. Then another snapped, this time closer. I stood up and flashed my light in the direction of the sound. Nothing was there. The voice called out, this time from behind, and this time focused towards me. Daddy, Daddy. It was my youngest son's voice again, crying out for me from the dark forest. I threw the light beam in that direction. A pair of shimmering green eyes were illuminated by my flashlight. They were only two or so feet above the ground, the same height as a toddler. I took a small step toward it. I wanted to see more. I needed to see more. The eyes, unblinking, remained in place. Getting closer didn't help reveal this thing. It seemed to absorb the light from my flashlight, almost devouring it. 
I couldn't make out its size or shape or color. It seemed to swallow up all the light around it, save for its two shimmering green eyes. That thing laughed in its hollow toddler's voice, this time with malice and cruelty in it. The eyes never looked away from me, never blinking, focused only on me, like a predator before the pounce. Not wanting to give up any ground to a predator, I stepped forward again. It didn't move. Not knowing what to do, I screamed as loud as I could. I waved my arms, trying futilely to shoo it away. The eyes shimmered. And as I stared back, the eyes shifted from green to amber. I watched as they began to rise up into the air. It was now apparent to me this thing had been crouching and was now standing up. I could only watch in silent terror as the eyes finally stopped rising, nearly ten feet off the ground. The night air erupted with a deep growl. I could feel the vibrations in my guts. I couldn't see a mouth, but I could hear teeth snapping and gnashing. My son in the tent behind me began to scream. That was the only time the eyes lost focus on me and shifted towards the screams of my kid. My only reaction was to fire my gun into the air. The eyes immediately vanished. My ears were ringing, but I could hear the growls turn to shrieks, followed by a cacophony of crashing branches and undergrowth. I stood there until I couldn't hear the shrieking anymore. It trailed off deep into the trees. I was left with only the sound of the breeze in the treetops and the quiet sobbing of my child. Twilight was beginning to illuminate the forest. Shaking and exhausted, I sat down in the dirt in front of the tent. I tried to collect myself. Daddy, Daddy, where are you? My five-year-old shouted. That got me out of my daze. I picked myself up and went into the tent to retrieve him. Putting him in the truck, I locked the doors and wasted little time breaking down camp. We were out of that camp and back on the road by the time the sun broke over the horizon. I have no idea what is in those woods. I do plan to camp in that area again, albeit without my family, and definitely with some friends. I want to find out more about this thing. Thankfully, my son doesn't seem phased by anything that happened that night. He thinks I was chasing a bear away from camp. And maybe he's right. I hope he is anyway. My son can't wait to go on another camping trip. But, truthfully, I'm thinking the next family camping trip might be at an RV park. Or even a motel. That's family camping, right? A few years ago, a group of friends and I went camping together. The campground we wanted to go to was full, so we ended up camping deep into the forest, several miles away from any other campers. Well, the first night we woke up at about two in the morning to drumming and singing. It sounded like a traditional Native American type of song and music. I don't know how to describe it, but I got the feeling that something was very wrong. It was like the feeling you get when something bad happens. And the sound didn't sound like it was coming from anywhere in particular, but was just all around us. Anyway, we were completely freaked out and decided to sleep in our car. The next night, we decided to see if we could find any other campers near us that might have made the noise. We literally saw no sign of life anywhere around us. And we were in a somewhat clear part of the forest. So if anyone was camped near us, we would have seen them. We were still freaked out, but decided it was probably nothing, so we spent another night. That night, we woke up at the same time again to loud music, but it sounded closer this time. We also felt like something was wrong, and were extremely freaked out. We were too freaked out to go sleep, so we just stayed in our tent awake all night. The next day when we woke up, we decided to pack up and see if the other campground was open, and it was. When we stayed, nothing else happened. To this day, I really don't have an explanation for what that noise was. I don't understand how we could have not seen any other campers, and why they would have played music in the middle of the night. We also weren't on tribal land. My best friend, who was one of the other campers, is Navajo, 
and she said the music was similar to the music that she heard in tribal dances and rituals. I'm still freaked out about the whole ordeal, and it's hard to explain, but my body was just telling me that something was very wrong when this was happening. I had moved back to Georgia from Southern Oregon. Don't worry, I later returned to Oregon for a while. And the city life was a cultural shock after the peace and tranquility of the remote state of Jefferson. I decided that I needed to go out in the woods for some sanity. So on Valentine's Day, I went camping up outside of Helen in the Appalachian foothills by myself. I drive as far as I could up the dirt road, maybe seven miles, until the rest of the road was closed off for winter. Nobody on the drive anywhere. Set up camp by the creek right there. Had a fire going. Still daylight. And a truck pulled up out of nowhere on the road. Two guys. I'm a female in my 30s, by the way. I hate to stereotype, but they looked like the Appalachian hillbilly part. They also had a bottle of liquor in their hand that they were drinking from. They asked why the road was closed. They peered around my campsite from inside of their truck. I'm sure noticing just one chair by the fire. I said that we are only staying for one night and looked at the tent maybe to insinuate my man was in the tent. They left. They were creepy. It got dark and I got in my tent and I kept thinking about those guys and I just could not shake it. I had no cell reception. I thought maybe I could sleep in my truck bed that had a camper on top. In case they came by, they would check the tent. But why would I put myself through that? So, I'm feeling defeated, because I just want some nature magic to soothe my soul. But I packed up my camp, put the embers out, and got on the road. No way would I have gotten to sleep. I pulled out of the site and around the next corner, hours after I had seen them, they were there, in their truck, just waiting in the dark. They pulled out in front of my truck after starting theirs quickly and started driving down the long, windy seven miles. I had no reception. I was super scared, thinking of what I could do if they stopped. What if they ran their truck off the cliff? What if they had a gun? I made it to the main road and they took off, and I stayed in a hotel and told the hotel clerk to call the sheriff, and this was their license plate. I know that I probably narrowly escaped an R-word or death or both. Happy Valentine's Day. Good thing I never celebrate it. I'm back in Oregon, and very happy, by the way. You ain't gonna get me. Me and my friends, Mexican graphic design students, went to the Laguna Salada, Salty Lagoon, in Baja, California, Mexico, to watch the Milky Way and shoot some star trails photography. The Laguna Salada is a vast patch of salt-encrusted land that was once a lake. It dried quite a bit ago, and you can actually find ancient bleached seashells if you check carefully. Anyways, we arrive at an entrance from the highway and drive around 500 meters deep into the Salada. We come to a nice spot with a lot of bushes at one side, while clear on the other we thought this was perfect, as the bushes would block out the car headlights from the road. We stop and get out of the car. Then we all notice this strange, hissing, rattling sound all around us. Imagine being surrounded by invisible people playing maracas some far, some closer. We are so puzzled and fascinated by the sound that we start to throw out theories about what it could be. A friend says it might be echo from the cars. Other says they're insects. And another one jokingly says, alien probes man, etc. With that put aside, we set up the tripod, camera, and shutter switch. We shoot some test shots. And after everything is right, we leave the camera with the lens open to shoot the star trails. We grab some lanterns and decide to go exploring. 
After walking about 15 minutes, one friend says in a very fearful voice, two men are coming at us. We are like, yeah, bro, nice try. But he repeats, not kidding. Two men are coming at us and they got assault rifles. Almost instantly, the two men yell, turn off the flashlights, turn of the flashlights now. And we're all like, he's right. We are scared and do as the men command. They get close and say, don't move, keep your hands down, don't do sudden movements. And then they start asking questions in a very aggressive tone. Who are you? What are you doing here? How old are you? What are your names? How long have you been here? Etc. After explaining ourselves, they start whispering to themselves while pointing their rifles at us. We are all frozen with fear, believing we were going to be executed right there for being at the wrong place at the wrong time. One of the men say, go back to your car and keep taking your photos, but do not go near that bush patch because, and I quote him, rifles tend to miss fire in there. As we are walking away from them, I was pretty sure we stumbled into a bunch of narcos doing some shady stuff there. I'm sure we are going to be sprayed from the back. I'm just walking slowly as our flashlights are off waiting for that hot lead to enter my back. You know how they say that your life flashes in front of you when you feel you're close to death? I can assure you it's not a lie. Past Christmas come to my mind. Me opening my sweet Super Nintendo, graduating from high school, past girlfriends, etc. I even start to get angry at life, telling myself, I'm gonna get killed by a bunch of scum narcos, all because of some photos. Thank God nothing happened. We get the message and decide to nope out of there. We decide to get out before we become another number in Mexico's narco wars. As we are all grabbing our stuff and packing up, we hear a loud rattling in the floor. A friend turns a flashlight and turns out it is a baby rattlesnake inches from my friend's feet and in attack posture with rattle shaking like crazy and all ready to strike. We cannot believe how stupid we were. All the sounds we heard in the beginning turned out to be rattlesnakes all around us. Narcos and rattlesnakes. We noped out of there and never came back. A few summers ago, me and a few buddies went catfishing at a local reservoir. This is rural Ohio, and the reservoir was off a dirt road about two miles from the village that it fed, which was a village of about 1,500 people. We had fished this spot tons of times, and we very rarely saw other people during the day, and we never saw anyone out there at night. So the day we went out, it was about 9 p.m., sun's going down. We had a couple of cases of beer, we were planning on staying out until the sun came back up. We didn't want to be bothered. We weren't really allowed to have alcohol around the reservoir anyways. So we actually drove a dirt service road clear around the reservoir, as far away as we could get from the road in. This service road was nothing but compacted dirt, with tree roots running across it. Areas that had washed away during flooding, fallen trees in the road that had been there for years, etc., this place was not a well-traveled road, and the only way we got around it was that we all had lifted 4x4 trucks or jeeps. The site we pick is out on a piece of land that stretches out into the water a bit in a teardrop kind of shape. Goes maybe 20 feet out into the reservoir. So we have water on all sides of us besides our back. We figure we can fish from different directions, since we will have five or six poles in the water it would give us a little bit more room to cast without tangling lines. Plus, there was remnants of a fire pit and some wood that was already collected. So, we go to start a fire, bait our poles and start drinking. We fish for two or three hours and get good and drunk. In the meantime, a thick summer fog creeps in across the pond. Then we hear a huge kersploosh, and we see the ripples coming from across the water to our right. There's maybe 50 yards of water between us and the other bank. And the fog was so thick, we could not see the bank or what caused the sound. 
but we could see the ripples in the water once they got to us. We explain it away to be a tree limb falling in the water, or maybe a beaver jumping off into the bank, and we keep fishing. About 20 minutes later, another huge kersploosh, and the ripples come again. And let me tell you, there was no mistaking the sound. It was not a fish flopping, and it was not a frog jumping in the water. It was the sound of a very large and heavy object, like the sound someone makes when they do a cannonball off the diving board. But we explain it away as we did with the first. Shortly after that, we run out of wood for the fire, so we leave one guy to watch the poles. Me and a few buddies go into the brush to find fallen sticks and whatnot. We all go our separate ways and meet back at the fire shortly after. One of my buddies comes back to the fire with a white jacket, a pair of rubber boots, and a clown mask in his arms. This was about the time when there were all the posts about the scary clowns who would lurk around towns to scare people. I knew that those stories were crap, so I figured it was just left over from some kids who had a party out there one night and left it. So we get the fire going again. We fish for a little while longer, when we hear twigs breaking in the woods across the water. And then, another huge kersploosh. At this point, we know there is someone out there with us, and the sound has to be dropping something in the water. So we call out and we say, Hey, if there's someone out there, we aren't making trouble, just fishing and drinking some beers. We'd be happy to have you join us. Dead silence. So we call out again to no response. A couple of my buddies are seriously freaking out at this point, between the booze, the clown mask, the fog, and the mystery noises. So I get that drunk courage, you know the kind, and I decide that we should all go walk around the bend and see what the heck's going on. This guy's being a butthole and trying to scare us. I convince two of my buddies to come with me, and the other two guys watch the poles. So we three trek into the bush with our flashlights, make our way through thick fog, start working around this lake. And as we go, we start finding bits of trash and saplings that have been cut down, and then more trash, and then footprints of someone in their bare feet, which is odd since it was so much work to get back to this spot on the lake. No one would be hiking around this far around the lake to fish in this spot. As I'm sweeping the woods with my flashlight, I walk over the crest of a hill, and not ten feet in front of my face is a tent. This tent had been there for a long time. There was moss growing on the sides of it, and there was trash and stuff thrown all around this campsite. Most concerning, though, was the pile of propane tanks. There had to have been 15 or 20 of these five-gallon propane tanks. So we all looked at each other and said, Well... Guess this is none of my business. And we hurriedly made our way back to the fire, threw all of our stuff in the back of the trucks, and made our way out of there in a hurry. On the way out from around the reservoir, we pulled onto the main, still dirt road and passed a crappy little Toyota Camry with five dudes in it. Watching in the rear view, they pull onto the service road that we just left out of. So for those that aren't savvy in rural southern Ohio, we busted a meth lab in the middle of the woods. The owner of said meth lab tried to scare us away by throwing stuff in the lake. I can only assume that when throwing stuff in the lake didn't scare us away, the meth cook called some of his buddies to come scare us out. Or worse yet, the meth cook called his buddies after we saw his operation. In which case, I'm glad that we got out of there before they showed up. I used to work at a Boy Scout summer camp. Every week, I had to take a big group of campers to a secluded spot for their wilderness survival badge, where they had to build a shelter out of sticks, leaves, etc., and sleep in it overnight. The spot was only about a half a mile from the main camp, but we took them a circuitous route that made it seem really secluded. Anyways, on this one night, 
all the campers had made their shelters. We had cooked dinner, and we're all just sitting around the campfire. It was getting late, maybe 11 o'clock, so I sent all the campers to their shelters for the night and started cleaning up the fire. That's when we heard in the distance what sounded like church bells. They were pretty faint, but myself and my fellow staffers could definitely hear them. They went on for about 30 minutes, ringing every 30 seconds or so. We were all a little creeped out, as there were no churches or towns within 20 miles of us. After the bells stopped, though, the singing started. It was too faint to hear the words, but it sounded like church choir music, but a lot of people and a lot more enthusiastic. Also, it was almost midnight at this point. The singing went on for well over an hour, sometimes quieting down until we almost couldn't hear it, sometimes getting so loud that we thought it was getting closer. All of the campers were super creeped out, but I lied to them, telling them that there was a church service going on in camp and that there was nothing to be scared of. Eventually, at almost 1 a.m., the singing stopped. I found out a few days later that there had been a large KKK rally only a few miles away that night, and that is the singing that we heard. I grew up down a long dirt road in rural Alabama. My family owns a decent amount of land. I still miss the peacefulness sometimes, but I'm a gamer, so I need my high-speed internet. Anyway, the first time my friend and I decided to camp by ourselves, we were about 12 years old, we picked a spot in a field that was right at the edge of the woods. We really weren't that far from the house, maybe 500, 600 yards far enough to make us feel like we were being brave, but close enough to run back to the house if needed. Everything was going fine. We had a tiny fire and plenty of junk food to gorge ourselves with. It was probably around 10 or 11 that things took a turn for the worse. We were both just sitting and staring at the flames. There wasn't much noise that night because it was early winter and the bugs had pretty much vacated by that time. So all we heard was the crackling of the fire and the occasional wind gust blowing what few dead leaves might have remained on the trees. That's when we heard it. I couldn't say exactly how far away the sound was, but it came from the woods. It was a blood-curdling scream. To this day, I've never heard anything in the wild that would make you as uneasy as that sound. We both looked at each other, and I know that we were thinking, run to the house. But we were tough kids, right? So we decided we'd lock ourselves in our tent and brave this new danger we'd discovered. Neither of us had any clue what that noise was, but we knew we weren't setting a foot outside the tent until the sun came up. My friend ended up actually falling asleep an hour or so later. I didn't have an easy time though. I could see the dying light of the fire glimmering through the tent fabric. I just laid there watching the light dance until something disturbed it. It was like the fire went out completely, but then it came back, and I immediately realized something had walked between the fire and the tent. I covered my head with my sleeping back, scared to death. I never heard a sound, no footsteps, nothing ever messed with the food we left outside. Thirty minutes later, I had to uncover my head because I was pouring sweat and about to suffocate myself. I could still see a tiny glow from what was left of the fire. I couldn't see or hear anything else. I laid there for probably another hour before I finally fell asleep. I woke to sunlight. My friend was already up and outside. We talked about the scream and I told him what I'd seen after he fell asleep. We looked around and could see no tracks or any other signs that something else had been here besides us. It wasn't until years later and a couple of sightings from different people that we found out what actually made the sound. A panther. I went on a camping retreat with a group of friends when I was just getting out of high school. 
We stayed at a campground that was made up of lots of cabins that had those metal bunk beds and a large main cabin with a kitchen and a socializing area. It was the first night up there, and I wanted to take a walk around the wood near the campgrounds. I walked along some trails until I could no longer see the lights from the cabins, and it was practically pitch black. After a little while, my night vision kicked in, and I continued my exploratory hike. After about 15 minutes of walking in the dark, I could see a shape ahead of me in the path. I stopped and tried to make out what was there. About a hundred feet ahead of me was some small guy or kid standing in the middle of the path. He was standing completely still, and it appeared that he was standing in the middle of a bridge that the path led to. I stayed really quiet and started backing away while keeping my eye on him. It was way too dark for me to make out any details about him from where I was. All I could really see was that he was standing completely still. My nerve finally broke, and I hurried back to the campground. When I got back, I told my friends about what I just saw. And of course, a bunch of them wanted to head out to check out what I found. So, a bunch of us group up, and I lead them back to the bridge where I saw the guy standing. As we get closer to the spot, I could see that he was still standing in the same spot. We all kind of stopped and waited. We started whispering to one another about what we should do now. Some wanted to turn back around, and others want me to go over to him to see if he was okay. Being stupid, I agreed. I went ahead of the group and inched my way towards the figure. I was ready to bolt the moment something seemed wrong. So I got close, and when I got to the head of the bridge, I could see what the shape actually was. It was an upright vacuum. Someone had stuck an upright vacuum in the middle of a hiking path for some reason. I guess seeing something so foreign to the surroundings, along with it being completely black and white dark, made our imaginations go a bit wonky. Overall, this was pretty mundane, but the whole experience has stuck with me for decades. So me and three of my buddies, Andy, Kurt, and Morgan, were hiking the AT over summer break. We were only going to be out three to four days doing a section in Pennsylvania. On day two, we were multiple miles into a state forest and multiple miles away from any roads or towns. As planned, we made it to a public shelter right around dinner time. It was a roof and three walls with some wooden bunks built in. We were hustling to get there as some clouds had been rolling in. We pretty much drop our bags at the shelter and it starts to rain. It was a summer rain where it blows in and pours for about 30 minutes and then blows away to reveal blue skies and sunshine. So we were glad to start building a fire and getting dinner ready. About five minutes after the rain had stopped, we hear someone coming down the trail, thinking, oh man, they must have got caught in the rain. However, first around the trail is a happy little corgi, dry with his feet barely wet. The corgi ran up to us as we all had our snacks out and started begging for food. Behind him came a middle-aged man, slowly moving down the trail. He was wearing blue jeans, a white t-shirt, cowboy boots, had no gear with him and was also bone dry. At this point, we all start looking at each other because none of this makes sense. We nervously play with the dog for a few minutes as the man takes his sweet time making his way over to the shelter. He walks up and says hello, and doesn't really engage in any conversation. Seems a bit socially awkward, and we were all too bugged out to try and ask him questions. He came within about 10 feet of us, and was just walking around and seemed to be enjoying the scenery. We all looked at him and agreed that he was totally dry. White t-shirt and jeans. It would have been easy to tell if any of it was wet. We then say goodbye, and he starts to walk back the way that he came. Started calling for the dog to follow him, saying, Toby, Toby, come on, boy. The dog had almost no reaction to these remarks. 
Granted, we had food, but you would expect some kind of reaction. Then I looked closer at the dog, and it was wearing a Barbie pink collar and had metal ring hanging, but no dog tag attached to it. The man kept walking away and called the dog a few more times. Eventually, he disappeared down the trail. The dog stayed a few more minutes and then just walked away in the opposite direction they came from, just walked off into the woods. So once they both are gone, we start talking to each other. No one saw any hikers behind us all day. No one saw any tents or shelters set up close by. We all confirmed on our map that the closest road was miles away. We all agreed that he was dry and very strange. And we all agreed that the dog seemed to have nothing to do with him, and it had a girl collar, and didn't react to the name Toby. We even tried to call it Toby and it didn't react. So, as our minds race, we decide that this man must be some kind of serial killer hiding out on the trail, living off the hikers that he kills. Killed one with a dog and decided to keep it. From there, we formulate a plan. Andy had some paracord, and we all had tin cans left from dinner. We set up a perimeter of these noise traps around the shelter and across the front opening. We also took the wooden picnic table that was next to the shelter and tipped it up on its side against the front to try and secure us inside. Nighttime, and it's absolutely pitch black. Fire pit got too wet to keep something going. We all sleep on the top bunks with our knives ready to go right by our beds. None of us really slept. At the slightest noise, we would jump and then call each other's names to make sure that we were all there. I would pass out occasionally and fire off one of my grizzly bear snores and freak everyone else out. At one point, Kurt got down to look out the front and almost got stabbed by Andy as he was trying to climb back in his bunk. Then later, poor Morgan had to pee and was trying to pee out the front and accidentally hit the string and made the cans rattle. Well, the rest of us were ready to pounce on this silhouette by the front door and he had to yell, no, it's just me, it's just me. Otherwise, he would have been a goner. Eventually, we made it through the night. Sun starts to come up, and we start taking down the table and traps. We left a note in the shelter sign-in book about Toby and the man that was with him. We diverted our path and moved over near a campground the next night, set up a concealed camp quarter mile off the trail. Then, the final morning, we got to the campground, pay phones, and called in for our extraction. None of us have ever forgotten how terrifying that night was. And since then, we often recall the story of Toby and the man that was with him. I'm a little late to the party, and it's hiking instead of camping, but it still fits the theme. I'm walking along Striding Edge at Helvelin in the British Lake District. It's a quite sharp glacial arete, which involves some scrambling. It's considered a technical grade one, suitable for beginners. I'm with a mate and it's mid-afternoon. One hazard is that fog descends on the area very, very rapidly. One minute you have a low cloud and overcast skies. The next you can't see 10 yards in any direction. So it's 10 a.m. and two of us are making our first graded hike. There's a pub on the other end. We expect to make it for at latest three. We pass other hikers on the way, exchange pleasantries, and go on our way. It's 10 past two when we reach the pub and we both order pie and a pint. The barkeep asks us if we've just done striding edge, and we confirm we have. He then asks if we saw a blonde woman, about 35 or so, with a bright red rucksack. We confirm we have. We spent five minutes with her talking about weather conditions on the day. At around half past 11, we climbed above the dew point and into dense fog. We told her about it because we descended beyond it by the time we saw her. As best the coroner knew, we were the last to see her alive. She'd lost footing on a particularly narrow part of the route and tumbled over a hundred feet. 
It's a little chilling knowing that you were the last friendly face that someone saw before their death. My boss and his dog, colleague, and I went on this hunting slash camping trip in the California desert some years ago. We all had firearms, and the plan was to do a survival camping experience where we would only carry water and food for the dog and some emergency food and communication sets. We set up camp very deep inside the desert, and the nearest town was probably an hour's drive away on our 4x4 rental truck. Two days in and we haven't caught anything, and the heat is driving us crazy. On the second evening as we're out on the hunt, we see what looks like mountain lion droppings around our camp. No big deal. We've got firearms and stuff on us. We return to base empty-handed on the third evening too, and we haven't eaten solid food in three days and are just surviving on water. We start a campfire and put our heads down for some rest, and my friend sees two sets of eyes staring at us in the distance. We bring the dog, and the dog goes crazy looking in the same direction as the eyes. We scramble into the tents and bring out our rifles and wait for something to happen. This standoff lasts for about 10 minutes, and we notice the animals move around a bit as we watch it. We don't fire our rifles because killing what looks like a mountain lion would invite a ton of trouble, so we just wait. At some point during this, the animals just turned around and left. I've never been more scared in my life. We packed up all of our stuff with one guy standing guard with a loaded gun at all times. We locked the doors of the car, rolled up our windows, and just left. Until today, we're convinced that it was a mountain lion. Occasionally, we think it was because we were crazed by the heat and hunger. But then, why did the dog bark? We don't know. I recently went winter camping at a nearby state park, had a good hike, found my campsite, and settled in for the night. The campsite was near a park road, only about 200 yards from the road, but on the other side of some trees. My tent wasn't visible from the road, which will be important later. Just as I was starting to drift off to sleep, I hear footsteps coming down the trail toward my site, and when I open my eyes, I can see a beam of light scanning the woods on the other side of the pond I'm camped by. Then the light sweeps toward me, hits my tent, and turns off. Footsteps retreat. I'm a little spooked, and by now I'm definitely making sure my knife is handy but figure it was maybe another hiker looking for a place to camp, who saw me and turned off the light once he realized someone was already in the site. Either that, or it was the rangers checking on me. I'd filed an itinerary with them. So then I finally do drift off to sleep, only to be awoken about 30 minutes later by a vehicle coming down the trail toward my tent. I can hear it crunching on the gravel trail, steadily growing louder as it gets closer. Again, I see lights sweeping the woods across the pond, this time headlights, and again they come around the bend in the trail, shining directly onto my tent. At this point, I'm spooked. Knife in hand, I call out, Hello? When I do, the vehicle backs up, turns around, and retreats back up the trail. At this point, I'm really spooked. I call the park office and have service, thankfully. No answer. So I call 911. I tell them where I'm at, and she tells me to hold on, puts me on hold. When she comes back, she tells me that officers are in the area, looking for someone. I ask if she can give me any more idea about what the problem is, so I can help. I'm an experienced backpacker and my day job is 911 operator, but she won't tell me anything. I tell her I'm a dispatcher, and if it's a missing hiker or suspect, I'll keep an eye out if she gives me the description but she still won't tell me anything, so we disconnect. No idea who they were looking for, but I'm pretty sure it had to have been a suspect. It was the middle of winter, and I only saw one other person in the park all day. 
an old man walking his dog close to the trailhead where I started. Between the cold and the incident, it was definitely my second worst night out backpacking. So I was around 19 camping with my buddy up in the mountains of North Carolina. We had hiked a few miles up a mountain from a campsite his grandparents were staying in and made a little lean-to shelter off a big rock we found near a stream. This wasn't on any trail. We walked up through the stream. Everything was awesome. No worries at all. Flash forward to a little after midnight. It's really dark. Light can barely make out your hand looking up at the sky dark. The fire is nothing but coals, and I'm on the outside half of the lean-to looking out into the woods. Then, I see a light. Just for a moment, mind you. So naturally, I continue to watch that same spot. A few minutes later, I see it again, pretty much in the same spot. My first thought was we had somehow gotten up close to a road on our climb, and I was seeing some headlights through the trees. While well, I kept watching to confirm my suspicions, when the light did some crazy flip maneuver. So either someone had a crazy wreck, or it's actually someone with a flashlight walking around in the woods in the middle of the night. So I'm just frozen, staring off into the darkness waiting for Hillbilly Joe to murder me. And my friend is just snoring gently behind me up against the rock. After about 10 minutes with no more sightings of any lights, suddenly a light appears at my feet, out of nowhere. It was an orb, maybe the size of a golf ball, I've had people say, oh, it was just a firefly, but it was white. Like, perfect light? I'm still not sure how to describe it, but it didn't seem to cast light on its surroundings. It just was light. But it went from the base of our shelter where my feet were, and moved silently in a perfectly straight line, all the way past my head, then disappeared. I am literally frozen solid now. Couldn't move if my life depended on it and for all I knew it did. About 15 agonizingly long minutes after it scanned me, or whatever, it went back to flitting around near its original spot. But now it wasn't going off. It just stayed on, all the time. At this point, my friend rolled over in his sleep and was close enough for me to bump him with my elbow, while not making any noise and keeping basically totally still. He was immediately awake and alert, thinking there could be an animal nearby. He leaned up on my back and peeked over my shoulder after I whispered, Look in the woods. After a few seconds, I heard him whisper, What the is that? I'm not crazy. It wasn't a dream. We stayed watching the light dance around for a few minutes until he turned and looked up the hill from our shelter, and there were two more lights flitting around up there. We remained awake until the sun came up watching them. They stayed until about an hour before dawn. Once the sun was up, we passed out for a few hours, and then packed our stuff and left. We still don't have an explanation for what they could have been. Spirits, ghosts, aliens, mutant fireflies. I will mention that when I finally fell asleep that morning when the sun rose, I had a dream reliving it. Except this time when the light scanned me, I sat up and said, what are you? At which point it went from its perfect white over to red and flew directly into my face. I woke up at that point. Whew. That was a lot to type. Anyone else have anything like that? My cousins and I used to do a lot of camping in all seasons. One fall, we went to one of our usual places this little ridge that made almost a bowl shape, perfect for us and our supplies. It's about a mile hike into the woods from where we parked. Well, that night, it was late, and we were all sitting around the fire, talking and smoking some weed. We can hear coyotes off in the distance. After a few minutes of hearing the coyotes sound off a few ridges away from us, we start hearing rustling from the ridge above us, and then we hear more coyotes sounding off even closer than the first ones. The first ones sounded off again, 
and the rising we heard seemed intensified. They were getting excited and restless. We're all looking at each other, completely silent by this point. One of my cousins reaches behind him and grabs his gun and a big mag light. He stands up and walks to the edge of the fire's light and shines his mag light up to the ridge above us. And the eyes, all the pairs of eyes. There had to have been at least a dozen, just on that ridge. He shined the light all the way around us and everywhere there were more eyes. In total, there had to have been three dozen coyotes, the biggest pack I have ever seen. My cousin fired off a few shots, hoping to scare them off, but they barely so much as flinched. It was a long night. We took turns sleeping in shifts, making sure that our fire never went out. The coyotes would come in closer, just feet outside of the firelight, and wait. It was maddening. Knowing that we were being hunted, knowing that to these animals, we were prey. Sometime before dawn, they slipped away without us noticing. My cousin said he looked up, and they were just gone. There wasn't a single set of eyes left. Easily the most terrifying thing that's happened to me while camping. This will probably get lost in the mix, but I used to live on the big island of Hawaii where the current lava eruption is going on. My girlfriend and I at the time decided to go camping at McKenzie State Park along the coast in the Puna District. We had planned on staying for four nights, but ended up only staying for two nights. I had heard about it being haunted before, but sort of wrote it off and was sure not to mention this to my girlfriend. The first night around 2 a.m., we woke up to what sounded like multiple people using a pickaxe on lava rock and groaning. This went on for what seemed like a few minutes and then stopped. It was really weird as there was only two other people at the park that night and I was sure that they weren't using a pickaxe. We eventually fell back asleep and asked the other people the next morning if they heard it and they had not. The second night it was just my girlfriend and I at the park. I'm getting chicken skin right now thinking of what happened. It was around midnight when I woke up to what sounded like someone sprinting back and forth outside of our tent. Like they were sprinting back and forth at full speed. I was the only one up and turned my light on and it stopped. It freaked me out, but eventually I fell back asleep. A couple of hours later, my girlfriend is squeezing my arm and whispering directly into my ear. Someone is outside the tent. It sounded exactly like a couple of hours earlier of someone running back and forth. The corner of the tent closest to me was then lifted off the ground and shaken back and forth. We both started yelling and the tent was dropped. I immediately grabbed my light and small machete and went outside. Nothing. Nobody around. Just us in the middle of the night along the coastline. My girlfriend was panicking at this point. So we literally picked up the tent with everything in it, threw it in the back of my truck and just got out of there. After that happened, I talked to locals and said stories like this were not uncommon at all. If you look up McKenzie State Park, you'll find many different stories related to the park being haunted. We are definitely not the only ones to have heard people outside of our tent and have our tent messed with. And needless to say, we never camped there again. My best friend's parents live on this little dead-end dirt road outside of a real small town. Their house sits on a few acres of land and is mostly woods. About a half a mile down the road lives this old man who grew ginseng for a living. When I was about 16 or so, this guy named Bobby Joe went missing. 
He was last seen on that road where his mom dropped him off, and no one had any idea where he went. My friend and I used to walk up on those woods all the time, and there was a rumor around town that Bobby was trying to steal that old man's ginseng plants, then ran off and was hiding in the woods. So what else does a stupid teenager decide to do other than go investigate? There was a trail that we always walked on that was a good 20 minute hike from my friend's house. So we stayed on that same trail looking for any signs of someone camping out or something. All of a sudden, in the middle of the daylight, we heard a man yelling help from a distance. We just stopped and stared at each other and froze. We heard it over and over again and could still hear it from the distance, even as we were running back to his house as fast as we could. They found Bobby's body the next day, buried on that man's property. He had been shot twice, and his arm was ripped off from where his body had been removed. The old man only spent a little bit of time in jail, because he hadn't told the police up front that he killed him. Definitely one of the scariest things that has ever happened to me. I was a leader of backpacking trips in upstate New York for people ages 14 through college age individuals. Once, I was leading a group of 14 year old boys on a bushwhack, off trail hiking, navigating with a map and compass, from one trail set to another. While deep in the woods, we look up and see that we've all but walked into a pretty elaborate hunting shelter that had intense camouflage and well constructed insulated walls in a semi-permanent canvas tent. We were hesitant at first, but it looked like no one was using it, so we decided to take a closer look. The inside was pretty filled with old gear, but it also had some equipment that was in pretty good repair. We left the site after marking it on our maps to alert the rangers, as camps like that are illegal in the state park where we were hiking. After the trip, we contacted the ranger's office and they said they'd be out in the next few days to destroy it. Well, my friend and I knew there as a decent bit of good gear to salvage. So on our day off, we decided to hike back in and see if we could get any of the gear before it was taken by the rangers. We hiked back, following our old bearing in reverse and found the shelter no problem. The only issue was when we got there, all the newer gear was gone. There were even rings in the dust where the camping stove had been. We turned to leave, and there was the largest buck that I have ever seen in my entire life. Nine or so points, standing, blocking our way back. The buck saw us and kind of puffs his chest out. We stood calm and tall, facing the buck for about three to five minutes that felt like hours. It starts to dip his head and make threatening sounds. So we decided to pick up some nearby sticks and wave them around, yelling, in hopes that it scares this guy away. Eventually the buck grunted and walked away very slowly with his chest still puffed out. The relief was wonderful. Admittedly, this didn't happen during a camping trip, but I do camp a fair bit as well. I was in Yosemite with my dad, doing a pretty strenuous five to six-ish mile hike loop up to some waterfalls while staying in a cabin within the park. So, kind of like diet camping. Maybe halfway up the cliff slash mountain slash ridge, we hear this weird raspy chirping and meowing noise. Definitely a baby animal. It sounded very close, maybe a dozen or so yards away. We could hear it over the fairly loud gurgling of a nearby creek. My dad and I froze and looked at each other. Literally, two hours before, we saw a mountain lion, warning, and were joking about my dad fighting one off with his hiking stick. Now it was less funny because it was a distinct possibility. 
We walked the next mile or two with me walking backwards behind my dad, so we couldn't get ambushed in case the mother was around. We couldn't relax the rest of the hike, even though the waterfall ended up being spectacular. We get back to our cabin and look up baby cougar cries on YouTube. And yeah, that's exactly what we heard. I'm not sure how defensive those cats are of their young, but knowing there was absolutely a mountain lion within six miles of us that may want to eat us or would see us as a threat against its cubs, no thanks. I'll never forget the cold fear that I felt when I first heard those meows, even though realistically, we weren't in much immediate danger. I've had a few of what could be considered paranormal experiences in my life, but this was the most recent and unnerving. I'm an avid outdoorsman and love to hunt and camp around Francis Marion and Sumter National Forest. Back in 2018, I took my young son and dog out to a remote area in the National Forest to test out a new camper shell on my recently purchased truck. We found a secluded area off of a dirt road made dinner, and then packed it in for the night as soon as it got dark. At around 11 p.m. at night, I sat up and looked out the back of the truck due to my dog growling. In the distance, I saw what looked like hundreds of small white balls of light darting around, then hovering for a few seconds and slowly converging to our campsite. They looked just like the dust orbs that you see on videos, but these were producing light in a completely dark forest. They soon surrounded my truck. Seemed like hundreds of them. They were a soft white light and they didn't blink. Lightning bugs were out early evening, but those were yellow and blinking. After 30 minutes of them floating around and concentrating to us, I finally worked up the nerve to open the truck and lit a lantern and they promptly disappeared. After turning off the lights and locking back up, they came back. My son was fast asleep, thank goodness. I watched them until I finally fell asleep around 1 a.m. The next morning when we tried to leave, the battery was dead on the new truck. There wasn't any lights in the back cab where we would have used any power. A week later, I had to replace the electric control module. Not sure if that was relevant info, but I thought I would add it. Has anyone had a similar experience? Just thinking about them again makes the hair on the back of my neck stand up. Hello. To start this story, I want to say that I have not seen anything like this in my life. At the time, I was 15 years old, pet-sitting a friend of mine's dogs. While they were out of town in Benson, Arizona is where this took place. This property had a lot of acres, and it took about 15 minutes to get to their little house right in the middle of the property, about 75 acres. At the time, it was about, I want to say 10 p.m. My friend had eight dogs, and they usually stayed outside for the most part because they were big watchdogs who seemed to have been able to defend themselves in the past. Before everything happened, I was inside of their tiny home, making food, and when I heard their biggest dog start squealing kind of quietly, very scared and in pain, but loud enough for me to hear, I knew the sounds were unusual that this dog was making. I shot up and ran outside to see what was going on. I thought maybe the dog might have hurt himself or something similar. But this was not the case, and I ended up seeing a five to six foot tall, pale, very skinny creature hunched over this dog, sucking on its head. I was very stunned, almost too stunned to speak, but I managed to shake that feeling off. I start yelling at this thing because the dog started yelping loud, and I'm telling the creature to get out of here and trying to scare it, and I run over to her dog as fast as I could 
because I've heard of these things before. Perhaps a chupacabra. And I know that they would likely eat a dog if I didn't do something. But I stop about 10 feet in front of it to see this creature jump up and run as fast as it can away. I couldn't help but keep looking over my shoulder the rest of the time that I was there. I also didn't let those dogs out at night, and I didn't care to go out there either. So when my friends came back, I told everyone what happened and what I saw. It felt like everyone was just as frightened as I was, and made me even more unsettled. I ended up leaving that desert and did not look back. I still don't know what to make about it to this day, except that I know that it was something. I was talking with my stepmom about late night driving experiences, and she told me about an encounter that she had in Leroy, Montana, on a road trip from Washington to North Dakota. She was on Route 87 and she was running low on gas. The Fort Benton exit had a lot of construction going on, and she couldn't see any way to get the gas stations from the exit ramp, so she got back on the highway. After a while, she saw an exit sign for Leroy, Montana, and it said that there was gas and food available. She took the exit and saw another sign reading Leroy five miles. At this point, they had no service and were relying solely on an atlas. The road took them through a dark wooded forest, and after a while, my stepmom realized that the odometer had gone up 15 miles, and they still hadn't found any sign of a town. But she kept driving and waiting for a friend, who was holding the atlas, to say something. After a few more minutes, her friend spoke up and said that she thinks that they passed Leroy somehow, and my stepmom agreed. They found a fat shoulder to turn around, and as they were pulling off to make their turnaround, they both had an image flash into their heads. A man standing in the middle of the road. Neither of them actually saw him in real life, but both could describe the man in exact detail. He was tall, with a brown flannel, and what looked to be a scythe, broken in half, with the handle wrapped in a white bloody cloth. He also had a thick scar across his forearm. While that by itself is weird enough that my stepmom planned never to go anywhere near that place again, for the next eight months she received frequent phone calls from Leroy, Montana. After my own research, I've come to find out that Leroy is a ghost town unmarked on Google Maps unless you specifically search it up. Me and some friends have already planned to go to Leroy over spring break this year and see if we can find anything. I'm posting this here to see if anybody else might have seen or heard of anything similar in the area or any insight as to what might have happened. I was homeless for a few years from 18 to 21, and I used to stay in a tent with my ex. I always had to end up moving my tent spot eventually because the cops would find us. Either way, I had spent a lot of the time in the woods at night. One night when walking back to my tent, I heard something down the trail a bit. I shined my light in the direction of the sound to be met with glowing eyes reflecting my flashlight. However, where the eyes were made, it was so whatever I was looking at was taller than me, and I'm five foot eight. There is no animal that tall in my area. I turn to my ex and tell him to start going to the tent faster. He could tell something was off, so he asked if I was alright. I told him that I'll tell him when we get back to the tent, because I've always been told not to acknowledge such creatures or spirits, as it gives them more power. Then some nights there would be smacking on our tent. It would hit all sides of the tent. We would look out the tent windows and check outside the tent, but we would never find anything or hear any footsteps. Another night during the summer, we had decided to go for a small hike at night because it was way more of a tolerable temperature. About 15 minutes into the hike, I had started feeling paranoid, like I was being watched. About five minutes later, 
I heard a maniacal laugh coming from somewhere in the woods. I couldn't pinpoint which direction, though. My ex asked what was that, and I loudly said, I don't know, but whatever it is needs to stop. As soon as I said this, multiple maniacal laughs now started. My ex and I turned around and walked back for what felt like the longest 20 minutes. Another time, I found a severed coyote head with something hung in the tree beside it that had a tooth in it. And lastly, one time, I was with my friend parked on the road far into the woods so we could smoke. The passenger window was down, which is where I was setting. The woods were right next to me. Again, the feeling of being watched overwhelmed me. Two minutes or so later, I hear a hello. And then, John coming from the woods. I tell my friend to turn around and we need to leave. I didn't tell her why, because like I said, I don't like to acknowledge these things until I'm far away from them. That's all that immediately comes to the mind at the moment. Thank you for reading. So the other night, on a mountain trail that I've gone to for years to watch the sunset, I felt like some guy was tracking me back to my car. The first time in my entire life of hiking alone, and I've done some sketchy stuff alone at dusk, that I felt uneasy. So the mountain trail I go to is huge with many different side trails on it. But there is one main trail that goes straight up and down the center of the mountain, which is usually pretty quick to get up to watch the sunset. I've done it hundreds of times at this point, for years now. I've watched the sunset and walked back to my car in pitch black many times. Never felt uneasy the way that I did that night. I get to the peak, walk back down a little bit to my usual viewing spot of the sunset, and suddenly some guy, also alone, comes off one of the side trails. I think nothing of it. Exchange a few words from a distance. Guy gets on his way, and I can see him even as a small dot as he gets down to the bottom of the trail. But I'm thinking, well, there's only one way out of here and he knows that I'm still up here. So I knew that I wasn't sticking around for it to get dark dark. The minute the sun goes behind the mountain, I start my way back down. As you get closer to the bottom of the trail, there's a section that narrows and is nothing but woods and trees on each side before it opens up again to a huge open dirt trail in the parking lot. Heads on a swivel the entire way back down. I get to the creepy dark narrow part, just before the open trail to the parking lot, and I hear someone making a noise. Like a weird noise that someone would make just to themselves, but loud enough as if they wanted me to hear it. But I see no one and keep going. I get about halfway out of the open dirt road, almost to the parking lot, and I turn around, and someone is decently far behind me out of nowhere. I don't look back again. I pick up the pace, get to my car, and book it. There was only one truck left in the parking lot by the time I got back, and it was on, and someone was definitely in the driver's seat. Call me paranoid, but again, I have never felt uneasy or like someone was following me like that ever in my entire life. And I've done about 80% of my hiking completely alone, and a lot at night. Like deep woods type stuff on sunset and dusk. And never been scared like that before. My three-year-old son suffered from chronic ear infections last year, which led to him having high fevers. I slept with him on this particular night because I needed to give him Tylenol throughout the night to keep his fever down and to keep him comfortable. I set my alarm to wake me up at around 2.30 a.m. When I woke up, I went into the kitchen to get the Tylenol. I noticed a bright light shining into the apartment from our deck door which also illuminated part of the woods behind the apartment. 
when I went over to see what it was. It turned out to be a car with those bright LED headlights in the parking lot to the far back right of the apartment. I figured they were dropping someone off. I saw movement of what resembled a dog walking near, around near the woods. I started to think that the lady who usually walks her dog, a cute little corgi, in that area, purposefully faced her car in that direction so that she could see while she walked her dog. As it got closer, I realized that there was nobody out there walking a dog, and there was no dog. I don't know what it was that I saw, but I'll describe it in the best way that I can. At first, it looked just like a dog, corgi-sized, but as it walked closer, it looked like your average house cat. Then it looked like a black bear, and then it looked like a koala. I live in North New Jersey, farmland and lots of woods, and there are no wild koalas here. At this point, my heart is pounding out of my chest and I'm scared. The fear I felt was like a primal type of fear that I've never felt before. I ran to my bedroom to wake up my boyfriend, and I shook him awake very roughly. I said, you gotta come see this. He was a bit annoyed with me. When we look outside together, we see this thing getting closer, and it looks like a skunk now. White stripe down the center with the perky, fluffy tail. I said, oh, it's just a skunk, with a little chuckle. I felt a bit embarrassed that I woke him up over a skunk. But at that moment, I also felt relieved. However, I was mistaken. As it walked, it looked as if it was struggling to find a form. I thought it looked like it was falling apart, but also coming back together again at the same time. I know this doesn't make much sense, but it's hard to find the words for what we saw. After the skunk formation, it looked almost like a person crawling on the ground with some type of fur or skin attached to them around the leg. Then it changed again and looked like a raccoon, a groundhog, a black bear, a cat, a koala, a deer, and a skunk. The part that stuck out to me the most was that whatever it seemed to be coming apart or shedding, but at the same time it was growing. Whatever had their headlights on, turned them off as soon as it went deeper into the woods. This happened pretty quick. I'd say it was only about a couple of minutes from start to finish. He ended up going back to bed, but I couldn't sleep after that so I grabbed a flashlight and shined it into the woods to see if I could see it again, but it was gone. I also opened the door to see if I could hear anything, but I couldn't. It was very quiet. I had a very hard time going back to sleep that night. My boyfriend wasn't scared, but he was confused and stunned. He didn't know what to make of it. I was scared and creeped out. I know that if I hadn't woken him up to see it for himself, he most likely wouldn't have believed me and would have chalked it up to me being groggy from just waking up or it just being an animal. Unfortunately, I know what I saw and I'll never forget it. I grew up in Belgium, Europe. Since I was young, I've been with my friends in the Scouts. It is mixed in Belgium. We don't have boys and girls separate usually. We start Scouts when we're six years old, and then we go through all the groups until we're 18. That is when we become Scouts leaders. I'm saying this to give you a little background on me and my friends. We are people who I would consider very close with nature camping and overall used to a lot. I would not say that we are your typical rough outdoors lumber type of people, but we can manage ourselves well through a forest. Back when we were around 16 years old, one of my friends invited our group to go wild camping in the forest that we have close to our homes. It's not your average American national park. I wish it was with stories of Bigfoot or worse, but it definitely has its own charm and legends. 
We got a centuries-old tale about werewolves in our forest, and a couple of legends about witches. It's not a huge forest, but one can easily get lost if they're not familiar with its trails, and all the trees look the same. This being said to describe it the best I can, we were very familiar with the forest since we were small children playing in the tree line, and afterwards as teenagers being blindly dropped with nothing but a map in the middle of it by our leaders. I do not know whether this game is popular in other countries in the Scouts, but in Belgium, it's very well known and quite safe actually. We don't have bears or, until a year back, wolves. And when dropped, we would carry lights so just in case anyone didn't manage his way or in or out, they would get spotted easily by a searching party. Again, this is not a national park, so it's not as big as a person could go missing for days. That being said, again, we were very familiar with the forest, and we were all locals from the village nearby. So we started our camping journey with our bikes from the village to the entrance of the forest. And once there, we would continue to go deeper and deeper into parts of the forest on foot. Since it was an area with lots of hills and few trails for bikes, the mood was good. It was beautiful, although a bit cold. Autumn evening with a few clouds and a beautiful sunset. We hiked our way through the forest until we got to a small clearing with some grass and prepared our tents for the night. We made a small campfire. We always learned to be safe, never putting in danger the forest. And we ate some beans and sausages for dinner, together with some tasty Belgian beers. At around 11 p.m., we decided to call it a night, and we each went to sleep in our tents and sleeping bags. Everything seemed like a normal camping day in our forest. Then, suddenly, at around 1.30 a.m., we woke up to the sound of what seemed to be like drums. A couple of us got out of our tents with our flashlights, asking what was going on. Our forest had always been quiet at that place at night, and during the day, the only noise you could hear were the critters, so you can imagine the surprise of hearing drums in the middle of the night. We were located on a flat area of the side of a hill to have a beautiful view in the morning, and at the other side of the hill over the top, we saw light and smoke of what seemed to be a bonfire. We figured that had to be the place where the drum noise was coming from. So the ones who had gotten out of our tents decided to just go over there to see what was going on, and maybe to talk with the people who decided that it was a good plan to be making noise in a calm forest at 1.30 a.m. We hiked over the hill so that we could have a glance at the people, to know that who we were dealing with first. We walked about 15 minutes before we could actually see the bonfire. It was located in a small circled clearing with lots of trees and bushes around. We crouched towards the bushes in the tree line to get a good look of what was going on. And that is when we saw the people with the drums. A couple of them. I recall a group of five or six sat around the fire playing the same tune on the drums the whole time and another group of people was dancing around the bonfire. Although I say dancing right now, I mean people making weird, unnatural movements, almost as if they were having spasms. And honestly, the best way to describe it is bodies contorting. The people dancing around the circle were wearing suits. At first glance, it would make it look like people dressing to be with one with nature. A second glance would make it look like pagan suits, almost like the original celebrations of Halloween. This was when we realized that whatever these people were doing, whether it was some sort of gag or seriously some sort of ritual, we would be better off if we did not confront them. So we decided to back off and go to our camping spot as quiet as possible. Once there, we decided to wake the rest and tell them what we had seen. We packed up the same moment and left to the entrance of the forest, got on our bikes, and we all went back home. We have since still frequented the forest, both for scouts and in our free time with friends and family, and we have never seen this circle of people again. However, it has stuck with me ever since, 
and I will never forget how we felt out of our place in the forest for the first time in our lives. It is the first, and luckily the last time, that we did not feel welcome in our own forest. Okay, so this happened when I was around 14 or so. So around 1999 or 2000-ish. And I lived in southwest Georgia at the time, outside of the small town of Moultrie. I was at my buddy's house for the weekend. We'll call him Joe. So some random other teens that were a little older than us show up at Joe's house, allegedly running from the cops after they stole a parent's car and wrecked it in a ditch. They came up to us on foot, so the story might be true. I'm not sure. They wanted to go camp out in the woods to evade pursuit, so Joe and I say screw it and go with them. We borrowed Joe's dad's tent and started walking off into the fields and woods. Given this area is not super isolated, but there was a wilderness to the air that I cannot describe. We go maybe a mile or two back, and set up camp 50 yards away from the turnaround slash end of the dirt road. There was five of us guys, including me and Joe, and I only remember one other dude's name. Let's call him Mike. The names don't really matter, but I'm just adding any detail that I can recall. Anyway, we mess around in the woods for a while. We started a fire and ate some snacks. We didn't have any drugs except for a bottle of booze, small enough that not any one of us could get drunk off of it, but we share sips anyway. Night comes around, and we've got this six-person tent for us. I can't say if I ever fell asleep or not, but I laid down with everyone and it got late. I'm not sure what time exactly it was, but likely late night or early in the morning. I begin to hear footsteps in the woods some ways out. I hear this walking in the woods. At first, I'm like, it's an armadillo. If you aren't aware, they can sound exactly like a person while foraging for food. But no, the steps are approaching our camp directly. So at this point, I'm like, what the heck? And without moving because I'm terrified, I look around to see if the other dudes got up and I missed it. No. Five dudes in the tent. My blood freezes, and there's no sound outside except this thing walking, and it's now right outside our camp. As I attempt to breathe without making a sound, either a very pointed finger or a knife slowly starts from one point on the tent outside and drags very slowly across to the other side. So, I promptly crap myself and hold my breath. The walking sounds stop about three feet on the other side of our tent, and they never start again. Daylight slowly fades in. The steps never return. I have this dazed feeling as if I've been up all night as sunrise happens. One of the guys gets up and slowly others do too, so I get up. No one is talking. No one is talking, but everyone looks exhausted. Eventually, one of us asked the others, Did you hear that last night? Apparently, four of the five guys were all awake during the invisible stalker. And we're all like, what the heck? The three guys who were running from the cops, allegedly, say that they wanted to call a friend to pick them up and go score some pot. They leave Joe and I at the camp to guard their stuff. Hooray. Now I'm paranoid at this point, because I think there's some guy out there waiting to gut us but I only have a small pocket knife on me. I take it out as they walk down the road to call for a ride. Joe and I are sitting on this discarded door that someone ditched on the edge of this dirt road turnaround like a pair of jerks when we start hearing the walking sounds again. But across the road on the other side in the woods this time, we see no one and nothing there. But it's daylight now, so I'm like, meh, it's an animal. The dirt road goes off and curves to our left, and sounds approach that slowly. 
at the same pace as before. The sound stopped. We're looking at the road. Absolutely nothing there, and the sounds pick back up on the other side of the road. Now I'm scared. I notice Joe has his head buried in his knees, like an ostrich burying his head in the sand. And since I'm scared for the second time in the past 12 hours, I also put my head in my lap. I also place the pocket knife in open and hold it closely. The steps are now slowly circling me and Joe. To say that they went kind of behind us at that same slow pace. They get directly behind me, but maybe 30 feet away. They slowly walk up to my back my spine tingling more and more the entire time. I'm pouring sweat, and as they approach directly behind me, I jump up and swing this little baby pocket knife around like I know what I'm doing. Time slowed down during this little bit, as I'm swinging the knife at a puff of air. The car with our other three guys is coming around the corner of the dirt road to pick us up. Joe and I run to the car and jump in. The three dudes ditch everything that we had at camp. No one asks Joe and I what was wrong, but I could tell that they were looking at us and knew something else happened. Joe and I never said a word about it. My husband and I were hiking to a small lake off of a lodge road in Colorado. It was a very short out and back, about four miles total, and we were the only car in the small dirt lot at the trailhead. The trail followed an old mining road and had a steep incline on one side and a granite ridge on the other. We both felt very off, but foolishly kept on hiking, eager to see a remote lake. At one point, my husband saw a shovel leaning against a tree on the granite ridge, but chose not to tell me. Before the lake, the trail narrowed and led us through a thicket with the lake on the other side. Right before the thicket, we stopped in shock. The trail was completely torn up, and there were man-dug holes. They were large holes and about one to two feet deep. We should have turned around immediately but again wanted to see the lake on the other side of the thicket. So we walked around the holes, got to the lake and paused to take a few pictures. We weren't going to bother relaxing at the lake because we were both very unsettled by the holes. As we turned around to leave and head back through the thicket, we both stopped and looked at each other. The look we exchanged confirmed that we both smelled it. Cinnamon gum, strong enough that the person chewing it had to be close. There was a little wind, and turning around after the lake must have blown the smell our way. We silently walked back through the thicket, and back over the holes in the trail that now seemed much more ominous. The hike back was a terrifying two miles. My husband, who is six foot three, pulled out his foraging knife, and I did too. I also pulled out my bear spray. I keep it around for people more than bears when hiking alone. We both assumed our tires would be slashed when we got back to the parking lot, but thankfully they were not. Once we were safely away from the trailhead, my husband told me that he thought he saw someone tracking us from the granite ridge line on our way back. The lesson, if it doesn't feel right, it probably isn't, and you should leave. Back when I was younger, I did some survey work for a logging company in Alaska, and I was fit and liked to hike. They sent me in first to check out the terrain and figure out the best ways into the area that they wanted to harvest. I always traveled light, just a backpack with a U.S. Army mess kit, some MREs, a few spare clothes, a fire kit, a bivouac sack, an axe, a knife, some bear spray, and my late granddad's revolver. I also used to cut me a nice thick hiking stick. With all that gear packed, I set out on foot. 
The first night was largely very quiet, and I got a good night's sleep. Only one time I woke up to what I thought was the wind rustling through the forest, and I didn't think much of it. The next day I arrived at the designated logging area and started to do my work. Around noon, I started to get that eerie feeling of being watched. I had had this feeling before, but I always blamed my imagination for it. Well, it grew more and more over the day. Right when I was about to set up camp for the night, I heard some rustling in the brush again and caught a glimpse of something big huddling out of sight. Needless to say, I skipped setting up the camp and booked it out of there. I walked about 10 miles until I was too tired to move on. The feeling of being watched had stopped, and I deemed it safe to set up my camp. I woke up in the morning, and the first thing I saw were bear tracks of what I think was a huge grizzly going all over my campsite. I've never broke up the camp this fast again. I made sure that my revolver was loaded and within arm's reach at all times, and I kept my bear spray at the ready on my way back, but nothing happened anymore. I told the logging company about my encounter, and they said that they will take the necessary precautions. A few months later, when the logging operation was in full swing, a worker was attacked by what was later described as a huge male grizzly bear. A year or so later, hunters in that area shot one of the biggest grizzlies I have ever seen, and judging by the size of its paws, it could have been that very bear stalking me on that hike. I shared this story on another subreddit a little while ago, so I'm just pasting it here. It wasn't unsettling to me during the experience, but thinking back on it, it is very weird. My mom and I were visiting family and staying in a cabin at my uncle's ranch. There's a main house, a bunch of animal pens and fields, a dog kennel, and then the guest cabin across the lot from the main house. There are other homes nearby, so it wasn't super remote, but we were surrounded by forest, mountains, and fields. So, middle of the night, my mom and I are sleeping, and we both wake up because there's suddenly a really strong, weird smell permeating the cabin. We commented that it must be a skunk. Also, both of our dogs sat up and got restless, but didn't bark or make any noise. I was having trouble getting back to sleep with the smell and getting the dogs to lay down again, so I went outside to have a cigarette. It was nearly pitch black out, but I could see my immediate area from a dim porch light. I was leaning against my car, and I started to hear someone walking across the gravel. From the sound, I presumed that the footsteps originated from the forest area behind the barn, then walked through the gravel parking lot and turned towards the cabin. I thought it was weird that whoever it was seemed to have passed by the kennel, and the dogs weren't making any noise. None of the animals were. But I figured it had to be my uncle or one of my cousins out doing something. I was curious what they were doing out so late at night. I was tracking where the footsteps were from the sound as they were getting closer and just waiting for someone to walk near enough that I would see who they were. I almost called out but decided to wait. Eventually, I saw what appeared to be someone wearing a hairy, brown coat walking toward the field next to me. So this is where it got weird. It was getting closer and about to walk by me, parallel by about 6 to 10 feet. It was close enough that I realized that what I thought was a person in a hairy brown coat was actually the bottom half of a large creature on two legs. The bottom half, two legs and hindquarters, were about the size of an average adult and appeared brown. The top half that could only barely make out in a silhouette appeared black. I couldn't tell how tall it was in the dark. It just walked by and into the field that was next to the cabin. The gate was not open. I checked the next morning. So it would have to have stepped over it to get into the field. I kind of registered what I saw thought that I should probably be freaking out. 
that I just went back inside and back to bed. I did a little walk around the property the next day to make sure that all the animals were there and unharmed, but I only told my mom about the experience. We ended up coming back the next month, and she told my aunt and uncle about it then. I fully expected them to make fun of me for talking about Bigfoot, but my aunt asked for some clarification and said that her sister had told them about seeing something similar. Back in the 80s, I was camping with some high school friends deep in the forest, about 10 miles down this old logging road. We were far away from anyone and anything, and drinking around a campfire. We were just fooling around, when suddenly we heard a massive, loud, and deep roar from the forest. It stopped all the fun dead in its tracks. We didn't want to drive because we'd been drinking. So we put the fire out and spent an uncomfortable and sleepless night in our cars. Back then, there weren't supposed to be any bears around here, though I had seen one on the other side of the country a few years before, but I've never heard a bear make a noise like that. You could tell by the echo that it wasn't very close, but it was so loud that it sounded close. It wasn't anything like the typical roar of a bear, more like a high-pitched scream or howl with a huge bass rumble underneath it. The echo seemed to last forever. It only happened once. I know we didn't drunkenly imagine or exaggerate it, because we had a boombox and were recording us telling each other jokes. The roar was so loud that it distorted the microphone on the boombox. A while back, I ran into the guy who owned the tape. We were both still mystified about what that could have been. And sadly, his basement flooded years ago, and the cassette was ruined. A few years ago, my husband and I decided to go camping at a campsite in the Ozarks that was a private camping area near a couple of cabins that you could rent and someone with a permanent on-home site. I've always had creepy experiences in the woods and rarely sleep, so I foolishly thought that I'd sleep better near other humans. I also decided to take an edible that night to help me sleep, but I ended up staying awake with anxiety instead. My husband is a sound sleeper. Meanwhile, I hear every sound. It was probably about 2 a.m., and my husband is sound asleep, sawing logs when I realize that he's gone silent outside. There have been a lot of normal forest noises, armadillos walking around, deer, etc., but now it was eerily silent. The next sound I hear is a tree falling down. It sounded huge, loudly crashing. It wasn't anywhere near enough for me to see from my point, but I definitely heard it. I should also say that at least this is the third time that I've been in the woods and either seen or heard a tree falling down, and once a lone tree in the middle of the sunny woods. It's weird enough when it starts happening in broad daylight, but this was really creepy. No other noises afterward. Eventually, the forest noises returned, but you can bet your butt that I never went to sleep. The next day, I tried to look around for it, but the property we were on bordered private land that I couldn't hike on and never did see where it might have been. I realized that nothing really happened, but I couldn't help but thinking about the old question. If a tree falls in the woods and there's no one around to hear it, does it make a sound? Yeah, it does. I live in a small mountain town, so not way out in the woods, but I could walk a quarter mile from my house and be out in sagebrush hills on BLM or state land. 
I've posted this story elsewhere, but I'll include it here since it still creeps me out to think about it. About 10 or so years ago, I was running one evening after dark on an unlit pedestrian bike path that goes behind my subdivision with my dog. It was late October or early November after the time change and fully dark, but no snow on the ground yet. I got a couple of miles from my house with the dog running off leash, sniffing and doing her own thing. She started sniffing around one fence line and stalled out at a good smell. Normally she was super responsive, but she was fixated on this one spot. I walked back towards her and let out a low whistle and said, come on, sweetie, let's go. Immediately after I closed my mouth, something on the other side of the fence, not six inches from my right ear, mimicked the whistle exactly, and then the phrase that I'd said. I got instant chills. There was something just not right slash not human sounding about it. It got the annotation and rise and fall just right, but the voice itself was off. Literally, my first thought was someone having their parrot hanging outside by my fence. But it was night in October at 5,300 feet. Like, it wasn't cold cold, but I was in tights and a couple of long sleeve shirts. No one would have their macaw out there like that. And the more I reflected on it, the more there was a mechanical element to the voice too. Like a buzzy aspect. I never heard any other sounds behind that fence either. No rustling of leaves or a person talking or anything. Anyway, it scared the crap out of me. I grabbed my dog's collar and made a quick decision on which way to run, since there was no close exit from the bike path in that spot. As soon as I could cut into the neighborhood where there were a few street lights, I did. Probably set a PR on how fast I got home. I cannot imagine if I heard that somewhere in the wilderness where there was no timely exit or possibility of human help. Not sure if it's related, but a few years later I was driving on the highway very near that same spot. The bike path is sandwiched between the highway and the subdivision. At about 5.30 in the morning, still completely dark out. I saw what I first thought was a person dressed in all black, wearing a hoodie with the hood up, walking on the side of the highway towards me. My first thought is what is this idiot doing? They're gonna get hit. The bike path is right there. As I got closer, I realized this figure was huge, broad-shouldered, could easily see over the cab of my truck, looked like they had no neck, which is why I thought it was someone with a hood over their head. The weirdest thing though, as I passed by them, there was not one bit of light reflecting off the figure from my headlights. I couldn't see any facial features, no eye shine, no metal zippers from clothing or reflective patches on their shoes, just a massive, all black humanoid shape striding down the highway, almost directly across from where I'd heard the voice about five years earlier. Back in 2019, as a graduation present to myself, I took a cross-country trip from Chicago all the way to the Humboldt County Redwoods, where I camped for a week. It had been a bucket list dream of mine to do ever since I was a kid, and I wanted to treat myself. Now keep in mind, I'd been in several road trips with friends, been to the same Redwoods five years earlier on a hiking trip, so I was prepared for the trip. It was just my first solo trip. The trip went well with no accidents or issues, but I definitely got spooked on one hike. I was staying at the Elk Prairie campground, so I was in prime distance from all the trails. Still, I drove up to the Big Tree Wayside Parkside as I planned to grab dinner in Eureka after the hike. I parked the car, started my hike, and enjoyed the scenery. I'm a hobbyist photographer, so I was getting lots of pictures in and just generally enjoying myself on the trail. It was a semi-cloudy day, the kind where the sun goes in and out. I was too engrossed in the scenery to ever get that watched feeling until I hit one spot. All of a sudden, I noticed the trail seemed thinner. The brush on either side felt taller, and the forest seemed to just get darker. I got the sudden feeling that if I were to encounter a predator, I'd never see them coming. I got that you're being watched feeling. 
Now, I'd been inadvertently following a bachelor herd of elk the entire time. I had two encounters with the herd earlier in that hike. Once I saw a bull through the foliage, and a second time I almost accidentally walked into the herd, rounding a bend in the trail. So I was very aware that they were there, but I had no idea if they were what was watching me. I took stock of my surroundings and could hear birds chirping and normal forest sounds, so I knew that a natural predator wasn't nearby. That's when I realized I hadn't seen a human hiker in a while. The sky had also completely clouded over, and I couldn't tell if I was north or south of the parking lot, as I'd crossed the road onto another trail. It was just after Memorial Day weekend, so the park was fairly well populated with fellow campers. But being alone in a darkened forest like that, surrounded by high brush and the world's tallest trees, you feel isolated and vulnerable. I pulled my buck 120 and a can of bear mace and booked it out of that spot. I ran a good 10 minutes until I saw a direction sign. Turned out, I had hiked my happy butt nearly back to the campground. At that point, I just followed the road north, back to my car. A ranger notified me that the elk herd I'd been following had planted themselves around the lot. I told him I'd be careful and not try to pet the big deer. I got some great shots with my telephoto lens, though. I don't know what was watching me, but I always trust my gut feelings. I used to go to this low water crossing that was smack dab in the middle of the woods. It was a peaceful place to relax and skip a few rocks. One day, upon entering the pathway down towards the bridge, I noticed a dead baby goat laying off to the side. It struck me as odd, but I still continued down the bridge. After about five minutes of skipping rocks, I got an overwhelming feeling of being watched. I stopped for a second and kind of did a quick scan of the area. I'm not even sure how I even noticed amongst so many trees, but off in the distance there was a gray-haired lady just standing between some trees, with a blank expression staring right at me. It was literally like something you would see in a movie. I immediately left, and about 30 seconds later I'm still trying to make my way back out of the woods, and out of nowhere a big hawk dropped a bunny on my hood. Scared the ever-loving life out of me. In recent years, hiking and camping trip on the Appalachian Trail, we set up camp, all is well, ran into a few other people during the hike. But later that night, after we were all in our tents, a person walking the trail lights up our tents with a flashlight. They probably didn't see us at first. No big deal. It was a remote area, but instead of just continuing to walk the trail with the light on, they turned the light off and it was hard to tell if they continued walking or were hanging around our site. So we started talking from the tent. It wasn't scary considering all four of us are grown men and we all had firearms on us. It was just a little unsettling that they continued to choose to turn off the flashlight. It was pitch black. The woods were thick and this part of the Appalachian Trail is extremely rocky and hard to not fall, even in the daytime. My boyfriend went camping with friends once before we met. His friends went to bed one by one, and he was the last one at the fire, waiting for it to die down while he finished a beer. Said he got the distinct feeling that someone was watching him, and he's an avid camper, so he said it really struck him as odd that he was feeling nervous. Anyway, it was enough to make him put out the fire and go to sleep in his car with the doors locked. So he falls asleep in the middle of the night, hears a big noise that wakes him up. He wasn't sure what it was because he had been sleeping and doesn't hear anything else. He thought that maybe he dreamt it, but it's still pitch black out 
so he stays in the car and goes back to sleep. The next morning, he wakes up, and the first thing he sees is a big handprint on his passenger side window, like someone had smacked the glass. His friends swear it wasn't them, and I believe them. They're not the type to prank each other like that. Still freaks me out, and I think about it sometimes, when I camp now. I went solo backpacking near Skinwalker Ranch and nearly got abducted by aliens. I woke up in the middle of the night to a beam of light directly over my tent. I thought someone might be standing over my tent with a headlamp on, but there was no sound and no response to my hellos. I finally got the courage to open the window, but nobody was there, but the light was still shining down in a perfect beam. So I got my knife and bear spray and was ready to give E.T. the good old welcome to Earth. When I got out of the tent and looked up, it was the moon. The full moon had come out from behind the mountains, under the cover of the clouds, and the clouds had finally parted. But it definitely scared the heck out of me. I was sitting by my fire on a solo trip one night, sipping a little too much whiskey. I keep hearing leaves crinkle behind me. I convince myself that it's just the fire. For a bit. Until it gets close enough that I know darn well that it's something trying to eat me. I set my flask down, hatchet in one hand, flashlight in the other, and I stand up and turn as quickly and gracefully as I can. My light lands on the hideous monster that wanted to eat me. Only it's no monster, just a deer. Admittedly, he was quite close. The deer immediately turns and runs off towards his two friends, who I am convinced were laughing. I assume that they were playing the classic reindeer game of who can get the closest to the human without getting caught. I also had a similar story where I was backcountry camping by myself. I had just settled in my tent and turned off my lantern when I realized there was a light show going on outside all around my tent. It was glowing and the lights were flickering all over the place. It wasn't the moon, more like a lightning show without lightning or a disco. I had no clue what was going on outside, either aliens or a forest poltergeist. I was scared but I opened the zipper a bit and peeked out, and it was fireflies. The whole clearing where I was camping was lit up full of fireflies. I've never seen so many, and it was quite pretty. I just never noticed them until I turned my lantern off. I was camping in the Linville Gorge for the first time and was down a dead-end trail beside the river. I was in my hammock with a bug net and tarp. About 1.30 in the morning, my entire hammock lit up brighter than the sun for about three or four seconds, but it felt like forever. I was sure that I was going to get abducted by aliens. Then it stopped, and I never heard anything. I was too scared to look outside, so I just stayed still and eventually went back to sleep. Last year, my family and I went camping in Little Nakus here in Washington. It was during that really bad fire up by Bumping Lake. Anyways, one day during the dead of night, my girlfriend and I start hearing a loud clanking noise, as if someone was slamming very thick sticks against trees. We hear it repeatedly in one direction for a while, maybe intervals of ten at a time. Then it goes quiet for a few minutes. 
then we would hear it in another direction outside of the camp. Once even coming from the direction of a smallish hill that we were camping next to. It kept coming from different directions all night. It always sounded as if the noise was coming from about 25 yards outside of the camp, give or take. We ended up falling asleep, and the next day everybody said that they were hearing it as well. A family friend even left his tent that night to investigate, but couldn't find anything or hear anyone. He thought he was just tripping out, because it was his first time camping. Anyways, the noises were of course accompanied by twigs snapping on the ground. We couldn't find any animal footprints the next day. No scratches on trees from an antler or bear claws. Just my grandmother telling us that my little brother actually started sleepwalking towards one corner of the tent, to which he explained that he thought that my grandma was outside of the tent calling him in his dream. My grandmother found a small pennant of an angel outside her tent that next morning. Could have been something random that an earlier camper had dropped, but it just made the story that much more weird. I was on a four-day canoe trip down a river in Victoria, Australia, and on the third night, we set up camp in a camping area that is really only accessible by water. While searching for firewood, one girl and I smell something terrible, definitely something large and dead. We keep going down a little game trail and found a mound of branches and sticks. The smell is also strong now, so strong that we didn't even know the direction it's coming from. I kind of peer into this mysterious mound, and we push the few top branches off, giving ourselves the creep, imagining as if this is where the smell's from. We uncover nothing, and make our way back to camp, and tell the other girls that we assume there is a dead kangaroo up further. That night we toast marshmallows and head to our tents late. A few hours later, I'm awoken by weird coughing sounds, and heavy, fast running through our camp between our tents. It's so frantic, but so purposeful. Now, the smell of earlier is definitely a murdered canoeer, and we are next because we have stumbled into this psycho's territory, and we don't even know how to leave other than by water. I figure I'd rather die first than be chased through the brush, wondering if my friends are alive. So I grab my head torch and slowly, slowly unzip the tent. Nothing. No sounds at all. This guy must be right next to the tent now and ready to pounce. The girls that I'm with are heavy sleepers, so they won't even hear the struggle. I turn on my light, and I'm surrounded by dozens of eyes littered around the camp. Eyes eating our marshmallows. Possums. Huge brush tail possums having a turf war in the middle of our tents. The three girls that I was with never heard a thing. I was in Sequoia with three friends a couple of years ago. We had set up camp, made a fire, and were just hanging out as it got dark. It was the first night and we were only about eight miles from the trailhead. I'm not sure why I did it, but I had my headlamp on and swung the beam through the woods uphill from us. There was a guy just sitting there in the dark with his pack. Alone. No lights. I was a little weirded out, but figured maybe he was just waiting for someone. I ignored it and didn't let my light linger on him or say anything. Thirty minutes later, I checked again and he was still there. At that point, I told my friends, and not knowing if he had seen us hide our bear cans, he sneakily relocated our food without using lights. When we checked again, ten minutes later, we couldn't find him. Luckily, we didn't see or hear from him again, but the fact that he was setting above our camp with a good view of everything and no lights to give away his location just gave me a bad feeling. I'm sure it was nothing. 
but it was definitely a little bit hard to sleep that night. A long time ago, I did a six-day hike through the Shenandoah, Virginia part of the Appalachian Trail, from Front Royal to Big Meadows. Now, this was the first time I had ever hiked. Not only was I an amateur, but I was completely naive. My hero at the time was a man who walked from the middle of the Congo Basin out to the Western Ocean in Africa. He hiked it in sandals, so I hiked in sandals. So I was very green to everything about the Appalachian Trail. I was along a ridge line walking where the path was really thin and covered by grass about a foot high on both sides. I'm in my own thoughts, and I see this hiker coming the other way. He was about six foot two and lean with thick curly brown hair. I'm a big guy, six foot one and 250 pounds. He saw me coming the other way and stepped off the trail. He said, go ahead, jerk. He said it so oddly with a blank face, like it was a casual thing. I went past him completely weirded out. Needless to say, I was weirded out for a while. So two days later, I came across a designated campsite with a constructed platform lean-to. I was so tired with my feet bandaged and raw. It was still around four, so I was debating whether or not to keep going when two women came into the camp. They were of the good-looking granola variety. They looked happy and tired. They said that they might stay there, so staying at that campsite was looking better. About 20 minutes later, that same weird guy walked into camp and started to unpack. It looks like they knew each other. I was bummed out. I did not want to be in camp with this guy. I started to pack up. The two girls were heating up dinner, their potable stoves firing. As I was leaving, the guy takes out his dish, goes up to one of the women, shakes the dish in her face and says, jerk, make me dinner. That's when I left. I thought it was some kind of weird joke. So I continued hiking until dark and ended up making camp off the trail in the brush. So two days later, I was at another campsite. I got there early. So as a friendly gesture, I made a campfire. Everyone who camped there was friendly. Just before dark, to my surprise, the two girls showed up. I asked if their friend was with them and they asked who. I said the tall guy. They began to explain that they did not know him and they had never seen him before. They just had this feeling of being weirded out. They cooked some food for him and then they left with mace in hand. I felt like I missed my chance to be gallon or something. But mostly, we all had the feeling of being weirded out kind of like we avoided a serial killer or something. I was camping in the White Mountains of New Hampshire with my wife. Late in the night, something ran into the side of our tent, made a noise but no real damage. We went back to sleep. The next morning, outside of the door of the tent were neatly laid a vole, three mice, and one squirrel, all dead. That was creepy. Someone once told me that cats will sometimes do that in the wild, leave presents for humans, especially if they had once been domesticated. But whatever it was, we packed up and hightailed it out of there. This happened in Utah. Be one of the three adults with three teens. Long hike goes into the night. We didn't make the planned location. We stop for the night around 11 p.m., eat and then go to bed. We wake up at 3 a.m. after a dream of a creature looking down upon us from the hill, then charging at camp. I bolt awake, see the other two adults sitting up right in bed. Did you just have a dream? All three of us had the same dream. We noticed that we were in a round clearing with a mound in the middle soaked moonlight. 
we wake up the kids, pack, and get the heck out of there. We had hiked in about 10 miles to go trout fishing, finished for the day, had supper, and the four of us were in a tent for the night. At about 3 a.m., one of the guys woke us up. There was a snuffling, sniffing, slash something moving around the camp. It finally started sniffing and snuffling and pushing against the tent door. I mean really trying to get in. Nose outline pushed into the fabric. They all thought it was a bear. I was tasked with pointing my pistol at the door, while one of the other guys unzipped it a little bit and rolled away, so we could see what the creature was. It poked its nose through the tent door. Everyone screamed, shoot it, shoot it. I was safety off. Trigger halfway pulled, when I realized that it was a coon dog nose poking through the door. It was just lost, and spent the rest of the night in the tent with us and was our best dog buddy for the next several days. My boyfriend, our dog, and I were camping in Beaver, Utah. I'm usually a heavy sleeper, but when it comes to being out in the woods, I'm not. My boyfriend is the opposite. Once the sun was setting, it was getting freezing cold. My dog went into my sleeping bag and cuddled me, making the night so perfect. Until, I think around 2 a.m., I woke up to some sounds. Trying to brush it off and fall asleep, I hear it louder and closer. I start freaking out, and my boyfriend is well asleep. The sounds were like coyotes or wolves, maybe. In my head at the time, I would convince myself that it was a pack of wolves because I assumed the worst, and at the time, didn't know the difference in what they sound like. They kept on howling and crying, from all sides of the camp, getting closer and closer. Finally, my boyfriend wakes up, and he brushes it off, saying, oh, it's fine, we're safe. Well, I didn't feel safe. At one point, they were so close, they were freaking out my dog, and she started barking, and I didn't know whether that would help or make it worse so I tried shushing her a bit. They ended up being so close to camp, I could hear them walking around, twigs snapping. I slept terribly. I was trembling. My dog was trembling. And my boyfriend was sleeping peacefully. Still to this day, I don't know if it was coyotes or wolves, but we live. It was a beautiful spot though. Would love to camp there again. Maybe bring a wildlife cam and something to put me in a deep sleep. A half hour from my house in the state forest, there are backpacking shelters that you can rent. It's like a single group campsite with a crude cabin with no door a fire ring, and a single pit toilet outhouse. They're in the middle of nowhere, several miles apart. Not like a campground at all. Very secluded. There are five sites on a 32-mile trail. About 15 to 20 years ago, my parents' friends were staying out there partying for a few days. We hiked out there for a day trip to visit. I was a kid, maybe 12 or so. I was hiking the trails around the campsite with my dog. I heard a very distinct cry for help. Help me. Really loud, plain as day. It was a soft, higher-pitched voice. Either a woman or an older child. I didn't hesitate. I started running towards the voice with my dog. Bad idea. Should have grabbed an adult. My dog was acting weird as we searched for a half hour and came up empty. Nothing. Nobody out there. She seemed reluctant to continue further, and we turned around. I told my parents and the other adults at camp. They just kind of laughed it off. I was distraught for the rest of the day. Fast forward a couple of decades later to last year. I'm solo backpacking, which I do a lot. 
I decided to rent that very same spot for myself. It was my halfway destination and place to sleep on a 15 mile round trip. Things were going good. I made camp and fired up the single burner stove. It was dark, almost time for bed. I was enjoying my delicious ramen noodles. This uneasy feeling came over me, a feeling I've never really had before and can't fully describe. My body tensed up. I got cold. My hair stood up on the back of my neck. Right then and there, I suddenly needed to leave. I don't know why, just had to. I didn't have time to properly pack. I started stuffing my gear into my backpack. Then my LED headlamp with relatively fresh or so I thought batteries died. There's absolutely no moon. It's dark. Very dark. I pulled a tiny 50 lumen streamlight style pen light from my pocket and finished packing. I had a large heavy duty contractor garbage bag that I always kept packed away to use for a makeshift rain poncho. I finished stuffing my tent and sleeping bag in the garbage bag. I hustled out of the woods with my poorly organized pack on my back and my garbage bag of belongings over my shoulder. The strange thing about my story was it wasn't quiet in the woods when things got weird. I could hear a pack of coyotes yipping and going nuts in the distance when I was hiking out, but nothing else really. Here I am, a grown man who considers himself proficient outdoorsman, sprinting out of the woods. For what? From what? The dark? As a legal permit holder, I always carry a sidearm when doing long solo trips in the woods or hunting. People say with a good holster, you forget the things on you. Well, I was definitely very aware of the sidearm on my way out. I made it to my car in serious record time. I loaded up and sped off. It took me a while to shake the feeling. On the way back, I did get lost but Google Maps helped me backtrack to the fork in the trail. I completely, 100% forgot about the voice calling for help incident at that very spot a decade or so earlier. Then it hit me once I got home and unpacked in the middle of the night. I remembered that voice, looking for that person screaming for help, me and my dog. I got knots in my stomach. For reasons I can't explain, it all kind of started to make sense to me like there was some sort of correlation. I don't venture into that area anymore unless I'm with other people. Something strange is or was out there, or something really bad happened there in the past. I know that this story isn't that crazy, but most of the real ones aren't. I looked online into missing persons or whatever, and didn't come up with anything significant. There have been a couple of murders, but those predated my experience by 10 plus years. And although they were in the same state land, they were not what I'd consider nearby. Perhaps something was attempting to lure me as a kid. That same thing was enough to tip me off as an adult. Maybe I was just a dumb kid with an active imagination. Maybe as an adult, the stress of life got to me as I was left with my thoughts in the wilderness and I had a panic attack. But honestly, who really knows? Camping at La Wis Wis Campground in Washington, there was a nearby party at a different site. No biggie. My friend and I, who are both women, were drinking and smoking weed, minding our own business. We had a trail running next to our site that led to another site tucked back a bit. A family with an infant was staying there. Great people, and they walked through a few times, so any movement going through the night I just assumed it was them. I slept in a hammock roughly six feet off the ground, wrapped in a bunch of blankets. Early morning, I wake up to the sound of leaves crunching while someone slowly approached me and stood over for a few moments. Then they slowly walked away. I had the worst feeling in the pit of my stomach. I quickly unwrapped myself to find a teen slash young adult leaning over my friend in her hammock. He was reaching for something on her when she woke up and started to yell for him to get out of there. He was like, oh, I was just looking at your campsite. Turns out he was reaching for her knife on her belt. 
Mind you, we had all of our gear, Bluetooth speakers, weed, beer, and electronics, on the camp table. Bad idea. But this guy didn't care about any of that. Just wanted our knife. It was like 5 a.m., and I wasn't going back to sleep, so we left. As we're driving out of the campground, we see this same kid. He smiles and waves at us. I haven't felt safe while camping since, and will only camp if I have a guy with me. I was 12, camping with my family in New Jersey. I took our dog for a long walk around the campground perimeter, and there was farmland next door. Well, there was old barbed wire under the grass that must have been from the farm. And sure enough, I stepped into it halfway up my calf. I was yelling for help and crying from the pain. I told my dog to go get dad, and off he went. Then, gunshots. I looked and saw the farmer far away running across the field with a rifle, and every few feet he stopped and took a shot at me. I was trapped, couldn't move, couldn't lay down. Then sure enough, my dog arrives with like 15 people. He must have really made it clear. They got me free, but when I looked up, there was no farmer, and no one heard the shots. Not my story, but a close friend's. They were camping as a family, a mom, a dad, and two small girls in Washington State. They hiked up into the mountains for like 10 miles before setting up camp. Everything was great until about a half an hour after dark. They heard someone coming up the trail. No lights, just walking steps. The footsteps stopped outside their tent. My friend's spouse unzipped the tent to see who it was. There was a nearly naked man with wild hair and a huge beard standing outside staring at him. Zip in the stats is the only thing he said to them. My friend starts freaking out. Why is a nearly naked man trying to get them to zip stats? What stats exactly? How does one zip a stat? It was too far to hike back to the car in the dark. So they zipped up the tent and basically stayed awake all night while the man sat near their fire pit. At first light, they repacked and hiked back to their car. The man followed them most of the way. They didn't see him do any drugs, and he had nowhere to keep his stash since they only seen a fancy loincloth. About halfway to the car, he disappeared behind them on the trail. They hoped that they could put the incident in the past and forget about it. And they almost could, until they got to their car and saw that someone had written in car soap or chalk, zip in the stats, on every window of their car. I went car camping with my six-year-old on a private campground last year. I've camped a million times, but this was the first time I had taken her by myself. That night, we settled in after a good day on the river. The moon was nearly full, and you could see so clearly. There was no need for a flashlight, and we were in a pretty open clearing. She fell asleep almost immediately, but for some reason, I was extremely on edge and couldn't sleep. I felt like something was watching us, but I chalked it up to being alone with my small child. After a few hours of struggling to calm my nerves, she wakes up needing to use the bathroom. Now, I'm thinking I really do not want to get out of this car, but I put my brave face on and we step out of the SUV. She was totally fine, but as soon as we step into the moonlight, this child screams at the top of her lungs, what is that, while literally crawling up onto my back. The sense of dread hit me and I'm looking all around not seeing a thing. I'm asking, where? What do you see? I'm not seeing it. Trying to keep her calm, but she's screaming, right there. What is that, right there? 
as if it's directly in front of us and I'm blind. I scoop her up and run to the safety of the bathrooms because I truly believe that she saw something that I couldn't see. My heart is racing and I'm asking what she saw. She keeps saying she doesn't know what it was and can't describe it to me. We do our business and I look out not seeing anything. I pick her up and get us back in the car where she immediately falls back asleep and I do not get a wink until morning. Needless to say, we did not stay another night, but it was hands down the most scary experience I've had while camping. I don't know what she saw, but I had never seen her react like that to anything in her life. In 2020, my mom, a female in her 60s, and I, a female in my 30s, decided to go on an overnight camping trip together on the Oregon coast. I picked what looked like a pretty campsite from a campsite app, and off we went. When we get there, we realized it was right off the highway, but there were enough trees and a fence up front that you couldn't really see the road. But the gate was just a metal gate that swung into place, no locks. There was a house on either side, but the property was fenced in on both sides. We pitched the tent pretty far back, close to the woods on the back of the property. The closest house was about 100 yards away, and the highway was about 200 yards. But again, it was all mostly fenced in and surrounded by tall firs. It was a lovely sight, and my mom raved about how beautiful and peaceful it was. I will say that I got a feeling of dread as soon as we walked onto the property but we arrived late and I didn't know if we'd be able to get a new spot quickly. My mom could tell that I was nervous, but for some reason I put her enjoyment of the beauty and of the campsite over my feeling of dread. We made a nice campfire and enjoyed some hot chocolate as we watched the fire. I kept an eye out and didn't see or hear anything odd. If I remember correctly, my mom went to bed before I did and stayed up and watched the fire for a long time before going to bed. Finally, I tucked in, very exhausted from staying up. At about 2 a.m., I awoke to twigs snapping and what sounded like someone dragging their fingers on the side of the tent, up to the front. I sat up and grabbed up my phone and the only weapon I had, a large flashlight, and unzipped my sleeping bag in case I needed to fight anyone. There was a full moon that night, and I couldn't tell if it was a person's shadow falling on the tent or if it was a tree branch shadow moving from the wind. It sounded like there were two people outside trying to be quiet. We had brought our boots inside, so there was no indicator of who was in the tent. It felt like they were trying to gauge the tent while I was listening for where they were. I had made sure to make enough noise so that they knew that someone went inside was alert, but no more than that. If they know someone is awake, they can't surprise us but they also don't know who is inside and whether or not we have guns. I sat there in the dark until dawn. My mom slept through the whole thing. When we got up and out of the tent, small things had been moved. Our camp chairs had cup holders. One cup that had been in a cup holder was on the ground. A pen that had been in a cup holder was also on the ground. My mom raves about how good her sleep was and how refreshing it was to camp there so I didn't want to burst her bubble or scare her. We packed up and I didn't tell her, but I let her have a nice memory of deep rest and relaxation while camping on this beautiful property. Was it someone living in the woods? Someone walking down the highway in the middle of the night? Creepy neighbors? Who knows? My mom got a great experience, and I got a refund and a fear of camping. The property owner said that they might set up cameras to keep an eye on things in the future. People scare me more than anything else that could be out there. Anyway, listen to your gut. We should have found another campsite. Or at least a hotel. So I've been sitting on this experience a while, 
I guess just not wanting to make a big deal out of nothing. But after reading some of the stories here and on other related subs, I would really like an answer to what I experienced. Back in about March of this year, I went camping with a friend, my boyfriend and three dogs. My friend slept in his tent with his dog, and I slept in my tent with my two dogs and my boyfriend. My friend's tent was about 30 feet away from ours, and we were camping in the North Georgia mountains off an old forest service road. We were right next to a creek. For context, I'm an experienced backpacker, and am familiar with the usual nighttime sounds like rustling in the leaves, sticks breaking, cicadas, etc. I have a lot of experience camping by myself, so it's rare that I get spooked out by anything other than humans nearby, as I'm aware of the dangers of traveling solo as a woman. However, this particular night, I wake up in the middle of the night with a sense of absolute dread that I've never had before. I check my phone, and it's about 3.30 to 4 a.m. I really had to use the bathroom, and was debating on whether I wanted to try to put on my hiking boots and venture outside, or just try and hold it until daylight. I didn't want to wake up the dogs, because if they heard me putting on my boots, they'd likely want to go outside to go to the bathroom as well. I'm still in the tent. That's when I notice it. It's almost like a hum but not in the pleasant way where it's a tune or anything like that. It's a low-pitched hum that was reverberating throughout the campsite and forest and through my body. It had two tones. It started with a relatively higher pitch and would switch to the relatively lower pitch after a period of time. Then it would start over without a break in the sound at all. It wasn't soft either. It felt like it was covering the entire wooded area that we were in. It didn't sound like an animal, a person, a machine, or anything that I've ever heard before. At this point, I absolutely couldn't hold off on the bathroom trip any longer. I quickly put on my hiking boots and quietly tell the dogs to stay put. My boyfriend is still sleeping. I unzip the tent and go outside, and the entire campsite was covered in this spooky fog. But it felt like it was my vision that was foggy not the actual air. I couldn't see a thing. The two-tone humming then got louder. I'd do my business maybe five feet from the tent. Sorry, but there was no way that I was venturing any further than that. And quickly nope the heck back into my tent and bury myself into my sleeping bag with a sweatshirt over my head to try and drown out slash ignore the humming. The dogs raise their heads and growl a few times throughout this experience but that isn't unusual for them when camping. I never saw any figures or lights in the woods, but I was also not looking for them and was trying to ignore the entire experience. Does anyone know what this humming could have been? My brother is two years older than me, and we've probably spent 10,000 hours and then some in the woods together. Whether it was building forts, slash BMX tracks, to LARPing and hunting, we've traveled across the U.S. exploring caves, canyons, cliff diving, mountain biking, camping, hunting whitetail mule deer, wild boar, etc. since 2016 when we get the time off. I feel like adding this is important because there's genuinely nothing I wouldn't do or fear when I have him by my side, but this time was different and we both felt it. We've had our fair share of adventures and stories to tell of all sorts, but this one has felt like a lingering stain on my memory. We were both in our mid twenties and it was 2019 and this was probably my fifth time hunting the area and the first I brought my brother along. It's a large forest area of public land that has a few county roads, which are basically two tracks that stretch miles throughout the area. We make the trip up in my truck with our tents, three in total, one for each of us and another to change in and keep our gear in. Without making this long winded, we set up camp a couple of miles from the truck, which we drove for quite a few miles through the trails, basically the middle of nowhere. 
The nearest main road is probably 8 to 10 miles away. We arrived late in the night, set up camp, and quickly fell asleep after a long trip. We then spent the next day scouting slash tracking, then made back to camp for the night. We cooked and then ate, had some beers, and we just messed around. The night was still early, but we had a long day and decided to head off for the night. Everything up until this point was normal. I was suddenly awoken to something smacking my tent and hearing my brother's voice call my name. I knew something was off. I called back to him and he immediately unzipped my tent and made his way inside. I could tell that he was disturbed when I went to ask him what was wrong and he immediately grabbed my shoulder and told me to shush. The sun wasn't up yet, so I think it was around 4.30 to 5ish a.m. We sat in my tent and what we heard still confuses me to this day. I can only explain it as whale sounds, different tones of extremely loud noise that I could feel throughout my body. It would come and go, but there would only be a few seconds of silence in between the sounds. It would vary from high-pitched wheels and everything in between to very low sounds that had literal ground-shaking reverb. I regrettably didn't think to grab my phone or record anything because what I was hearing didn't seem real, and in the moment, I was awestruck. The sound went on until daylight started to break. I believe it was about an hour, but I'm not really sure. Neither of us spoke, and at the time, it felt like I could feel the energy around me, almost like my body was covered in white noise, if that makes any sense. It wasn't even minutes after the sound stopped. It started to rain, and one of the craziest thunderstorms while I was camping happened. The forecast didn't predict or account for any rain the days that we were going to be there prior to making the trip. All the stakes for the tent and our gear was in completely ripped out of the ground, and both of our tents had multiple stakes ripped out as well. Those things we drove into the ground with an axe, and would take some insane force to unearth even a single one. My brother dismisses it, and won't even talk to me about it, saying it was just machinery being dragged. But at the time, we both shared the same feeling of fear and dread. It just seems odd. It was still the middle of the night, and we were so far removed from any nearby communities or industry to hear and experience this occurrence. This was about five years ago. Me, my mom, and my dad were camping at Mary Jane Thurston State Park, just outside of Grand Rapids, Ohio. It was around the end of August, slash the beginning of September. Our campsite was in the front part of the campgrounds. Leading up to the two separate incidents, we occasionally heard what we thought could have been a bird or some kind of screaming or screeching up in the trees or at least it sounded like it was coming from the top of the trees. We'd hear it almost every night, but in a different location. We'd hear it in the trees behind us one night. Then the next night, it would come from the other end of the campgrounds. Then the night after, we'd hear it from across the road. I've listened to the sounds of different animals, including owls, to see if that was the noise we heard, but nothing is even close. Occasionally, we'd hear what sounded like branches being snapped, but thought nothing of it. I had my own tent, and that detail is somewhat important as it factors into the second incident. The first incident. My dad woke up in the middle of the night to what sounded like someone was rummaging through the ice chest, which was setting between our tents. He said he then heard whoever or whatever it was shut the cooler and walk away. He told my mom about it the next day, the odd thing was that nothing was missing from the cooler. The second incident happened right after the first one. I had a small little TV in my game console in my tent. I was watching a movie when I hear something approaching our campsite. Whatever it is went through the cooler again. I could hear the ice moving around as it was rummaging through the cooler. I was as still and as quiet as possible. But whoever, or I should say whatever it was, knew I was awake 
because I decided to put its massive hand on the side of my tent and push it in. I was frozen with fear and didn't know what to do. It felt like forever, but was only about 20 seconds before it took its hand from my tent and walked away. I didn't even think about looking for tracks the next day. We don't have bears in this part of Ohio, so I definitely know that it wasn't a bear. This thing didn't take anything from the ice chest, despite going through it twice. I know when it put its hand on my tent and pushed it in a little, I was frozen with fear. We know it wasn't some homeless person or anyone else, because there was maybe five campsites that had anyone, and they were in the back part of the campground. In May of 2009, I had just broken up with my girlfriend of almost three years. We had moved from Calgary to Toronto, and we were still stuck living together after the breakup, as we didn't know many people in the city yet. Needless to say, the situation was pretty stressful and upsetting. So when a buddy I was going to school with at the time suggested a weekend camping slash fishing trip, I jumped at the chance. He grew up in an area about an hour outside of Toronto, called Flamborough. It's really beautiful. Loads of lush forests, farmer's fields, and small rivers and creeks. We decided to camp and fish along a creek called Grindstone Creek. It's close to some wetlands and the fishing is supposed to be great. We ended up setting up our camp in what was probably a farmer's field. I'm guessing it was trespassing on our part, bordered by a gorgeous forest we spent the evening fishing, shooting the crap, and drinking some quality craft beers. As it got darker, we made a little fire and roasted potatoes and hot dogs. All in all, it was a really good night. We turned in just after midnight. We shared a tent. My buddy fell asleep before me, and I stayed up playing on my phone until probably 1.30. I must have drifted off because the next thing I remember was being woken up by a high-pitched yipping type noise. I was kind of groggy, and it took me a moment to fully wake up. The yipping was incessant, and it sounded like a weird coyote. I laid there for a moment listening, and then started playing on my phone again. The noise was annoying. I tried ignoring it, but it sounded like it was getting closer. Finally, it sounded like it had to be no more than 10 feet from the tent. At this point, I was getting a little unsettled. I had seen coyotes in Calgary before, and I thought of them as pretty harmless. They never looked much bigger than a smallish dog. But what if this one was rabbit or something? What if it could smell our food? I have a pretty bad anxiety disorder, so I'm prone to worrying about these types of things. I nudged my buddy to see if he was awake, and he was. The noise woke him up too. We discussed what to do about the coyote, as we hadn't brought anything to scare off critters. Not a BB gun, nothing. Finally, he decided he would shine the flashlight on it and holler a lot, hopefully scaring him off. He unzipped the tent, and I watched him pointing the flashlight out into the darkness. I'll never forget what happened next. His legs suddenly went all wobbly, and he sort of stumbled backwards into the tent. He had a really dumbfounded look on his face when he looked at me and babbled. It's not a coyote dude. It's a dude. Some weird dude. Normally, I would have thought he was messing with me. I'm a huge wimp and scare easily. I won't even watch horror movies. But I've never seen someone look that scared. And I never want to see that expression on someone's face again. So I knew that he wasn't pulling my leg. The weird yipping and howling noises were still going on, and in retrospect, it really didn't sound like a coyote. But I guess in our groggy states, it was a way for our brains to make sense of it. Anyways, he kept telling me to just look out the tent flap to make sure that he's not crazy. At this point, I was having a full-blown anxiety attack. My heart was racing. I felt like crap, but I had to look. So I slowly peeked out the flap and waited for my eyes to adjust. And that's when I saw him. 
He was standing only a few arms lengths away from the tent. He was swaying a little and wearing a baseball cap. What made it awful though, what was really creepy, was that he was wearing woman's lingerie. That's when I knew that there was most likely something very wrong with this guy. If the making high-pitched noises at a stranger's tent in the middle of the night didn't give it away. After I pulled my head back inside the tent, my buddy and I discussed what to do. Finally, we decided to yell at the guy to leave us alone. My buddy started yelling, Excuse me, can you leave us alone? We're trying to sleep in here. The noise stopped. It was dead silent, and that's when we heard footsteps running towards our tent. They stopped right outside the tent, but we didn't waste any time. We started yelling again. Seriously, leave us alone. We have cell phones in here. If you don't leave us alone, we're going to call the cops. With that, we heard him walk by the tent and head off. Sounded like he was moving towards the road. Needless to say, we laid awake, petrified until the first signs of sunlight. Then we hightailed it the heck out of there. We discussed our experience on the way home, and were both pretty embarrassed about how scared we got. It definitely was not manly on either of our parts. I think because we were both ashamed of how we let some weirdo freak us out so much. We haven't ever talked about it since that day. So there you go. There's my weird story. I'll always wonder what the heck that guy was doing out there, or what was wrong with him. Sometimes, I wonder if things could have turned out differently if we were a couple of girls. I'm not saying that he was some serial killer, but it seemed like he was testing who was in the tent. I guess I'll never know. And for that, I'm kind of glad. I always wanted to try the car life thing after watching so many YouTubers who live in their cars and travel around the country. I lived in Fort Lauderdale for five years and thought I would be stuck there, and that was it. Then the pandemic hit, and when I checked my bank account, I was back paid thousands of dollars. Before I know it, I'm packing up all of my stuff, and the landlord said that I could leave all my furniture and that was fine. Now I'm on 95 heading north, laughing and actually leaving and couldn't believe it. I managed to get a hang of the whole car life thing and became more comfortable stealth parking in different places and not being detected. I had not done any off-grid stuff yet, but was more comfortable by the time I reached Lake Tahoe. I was hiking and asked some guy with his dog, he was a local, if he knew where I could find a place to sleep in my car because Tahoe seemed tricky. He said that there was a place right up in the mountain called Hope Valley. It sounded good, so off I went. Lake Tahoe is already very high in altitude, so this was a few thousand feet higher than that. It was this past July. As I reached the area, I saw a small parking lot that was an entrance to a wildlife nature preserve. It was closed and empty, so that would do. I'm all settled in with my blanket, and the sun is setting and the temperature plummets. Before I know it, it's pitch black and visibility is zero. I start to hear wolves howling, and at this point, I'm game. This was the experience I wanted. It was a little creepy, but I was fine. I was living what I would normally be watching on my YouTube in my apartment. Before the sun went down, I noticed their garbage cans that were overfilled 15 feet behind the car from the entrance to the preserve. I finally drifted off to sleep and was awakened by something at 3 a.m. You couldn't see anything. It was so dark. And then I heard footsteps, heavy ones, right outside my door. And at this point, I'm scared as all heck being a New York City boy. Then something brushes up against the car. I'm scared and don't know what to do. I wait for a couple of minutes. Then I opened the door, run around the car as fast as I could, and got in the driver's side. I drove down the mountain and slept in a Motel 7 parking lot like a baby. Never made it through my first and only off-grid car camping adventure and I won't forget it. The only other time that trip that something creepy happened was in Mount Shasta. I drove halfway up the mountain, 
parked on the side of the road and got out and started walking into this trail. I made it about 70 yards in and heard a low growl. I never ran so hard back to my car in my life. The rest of the trip was the best hiking I've ever done in Montana. We once found some young scouts, 9 to 11 years old, stumbling around in the woods after dark, completely lost, no lights, one sleeping bag between the two of them. They had taken a wrong turn into a dried creek bed that wasn't a trail, and just gotten completely lost. If they hadn't happened to be making a lot of noise stumbling around in the dark next to our tent, they would have had a really crappy night all alone in the woods. Luckily for them, we had helped some other lost kids earlier that day, and we got a look at their map. We happened to know where the group was staying, and walked the boys back to their friends. Even 20 years later, I still feel bad for those boys. The younger kid was bawling his eyes out, and the older kid was just barely keeping his stuff together. What the heck was that scout leader thinking, letting all of these inexperienced little kids wander around, with no supervision? or guidance. I was hiking with my girlfriend, her sister, and her boyfriend in Hawaii in 2021. We parked our car at the end of the road about 200 feet away from the trailhead behind the only other car at the end of the road, where another couple was getting ready to start the same hike. We briefly chatted with them as we got our shoes on and prepared our bags. They then started up the trail, and we followed maybe 10 minutes after they started. We figured we would maybe see them at the slide, which indicated the turnaround point. For context, the trail we were hiking led to a water slide deep in the mountains, which was the remnants of an old irrigation canal from the plantation era. The trail meandered through the rainforest, occasionally crossing and traversing the concrete irrigation canal, and led us to some large pipes spanning across a small valley, then directly into the mountain wall. This is where the trail forked. You could either follow the canal through the mountain in the dark, or traverse around the ridge to the slide. My girlfriend and I took the canal through the mountain, and her sister and boyfriend opted for traversing the trail. We both made it to the slide, and we didn't see the couple there. There were only two main trails that we knew of that connect to the slide, and we didn't see the couple returning from the slide in the opposite direction. We didn't think much of it at the time, because maybe they had taken a third route back, or had continued further up past the canal past the slide. But no one really does that based on the info from a few locals who have hiked the trail several times. We made our way back to the trailhead and still no sign of them. Their car was still there parked in front of ours. We still aren't sure what happened to them. They just totally vanished off the trail. Not super scary, but it definitely makes you wonder where they might have gone when considering the only ways to and from the trailhead. I just had a relatively creepy backpacking experience this weekend, which got me curious about what other folks have encountered while backpacking. I'll start sharing my experience. A friend and I did a brief two-night trip out of Sky Kamash, Washington, in the Central Cascades. We hiked in and set up camp at a beautiful subalpine lake. Everything was good up until dark, of course. I awoke around 1 a.m. to hear what sounded like branches breaking in the near distance. I initially thought that it sounded like branches on the ground being stepped on, but figured it could be branches breaking away from the tree, too. To keep my freaked out mind from going wild, I told myself that it was probably just an elk. This went on until I finally fell asleep again. The same thing happened the following night, but to make things worse, I heard what sounded like the zipper on our rainfly being unzipped as slowly as humanly possible. 
or like something very small was being drug across the fly of the tent very slowly. Either way, I flipped around on my horrifically squeaky inflatable pad in hopes of scaring off whatever it was, if anything at all. Needless to say, I didn't sleep that night, but thankfully found that the zipper was fully closed at dawn. I've heard that temperature changes can cause cracking sounds within the bark of trees, but then again, a Google search on branches breaking in the woods pointing me to Bigfoot, but who knows. Either way, this creeped me out. I've never once heard sounds like that when backpacking, and I'm often awake several times during the night on trips. I was on Poo Poo Point in Issaquah, Washington a couple of weeks ago, and I hear twigs breaking left and right from an area behind me. I figured it was a paraglider who landed short of the landing area and was coming up on the trail. Imagine my surprise when a bear popped up 15 feet away from me. We looked at each other for a few brief seconds, and I let out the loudest hey bear, and he trundled off. I was shaking for the next 10 minutes. I've run into a lot of bears in the Enchanted Valley, but when you don't expect one, they can be a bit interesting. Last year in summer, I decided to spend one night in the wild in a nearby forest so I packed my stuff and some food and went to the place in the evening. It was only a half an hour walk from my flat, and it wasn't the first night out in the wild on my own without a tent, so I ate some dinner and put my sleeping place up. When it was dark, I started to sleep, but the night was very uncalm. Somehow, I couldn't get very good sleep. I woke up all the time, probably because it was quite close to the city, and I could still hear cars and people partying. So at around 4 o'clock, I decided that I will pack my stuff up and go home so I can at least get some good sleep. When I was on my way back, still in the forest, I saw a person, probably male, standing on the path that I wanted to go on. He was just standing there with the back to me, not moving or walking. This was already scary, so I tried talking to him, asked who he is and if he could turn around, but he didn't move at all. I continued talking to him, that he should please talk to me or turn around or do anything. I tried it in two different languages, but he didn't react at all. He was just standing there, not moving. I waited and talked to him for at least 10 minutes, really scared. Then at one point he started walking very slowly in the direction that I wanted to go to. So I know, if I go the same way... I rather had to walk very slow or overtake him and be close to him at one point. So I decided to walk another way, which was a detour of at least 30 to 45 minutes. In the end, I knew that our paths will cross one last time, but at this time I could already see the city. But luckily, I didn't meet him again. He was probably high, but it was very scary since it was in the night and dark and he wasn't reacting or moving at all. I was hiking with a buddy near Tupper Lake. We were sitting in a fire tower watching the sunset and had just said goodbye to a young couple. About two minutes after they leave the peak, a blood-curdling scream fills the air. Keep in mind, they walked for two minutes. We were 50 feet in the air, and the wind was blowing towards them at about 20 miles per hour. My buddy and I looked at each other scared out of our minds, with zero idea of what to do. We came for the sunset, so we stayed for the sunset. Figuring if it was our last time to leave this earth, we would do so with the image of an ADK sunset fresh in our minds. After the sun ends, we start walking down the trail with sticks in hand just freaking out. 
We walk for about five minutes and figure that we're probably good and just scaring ourselves. The rest of the hike down was unnerving at best. The woods are never comfy at night past the range of your light. We get to the bottom and my buddy says, yo, there's another car here. When we came, there was only one car, a red one with a dude in it. The other girl showed up separately. She was the one that screamed. Her car was still here. His was gone. We ran to our car, hop in and start driving home. At this point, we were seriously considering calling the cops. As we're driving, we are past and it's the red car. I swung the car around, followed him back to the lot, and drive past the lot as his interior cab lights turn on. It's just him. No girl. To this day, we have no idea what happened. What we do know is that we told the guy in passing that we're going to camp Bridge Brooks Island, and the next night we did. We swore that we were being watched the entire night, with a big scare coming from our boat hitting rocks and sounding like a guy running up on us. I took an ill-advised winter hike in a storm. The wind was coming off the peak and down the ridge that I was ascending. There was snow on my ridge that was about shin deep, and we had about 800 feet to the summit. It was getting dark and the wind lulled. We both heard a long, terrible scream up ahead, really tortured. The wind picked up again. We rejected the attempt and made our way back to the tent. I thought I could hear a helicopter in and out of the wind gusts, but in the dark, couldn't see anything. The next afternoon, there was a news report of one dead after falling from a ridge during a military exercise. It was from the summit ridge line that we were heading for. I heard that man fall. Back in 2015, I was on a hiking trail in Arizona. I have hiked a lot in worse terrains in Europe, so I wasn't too worried about doing it alone. It was almost getting dark, and I was at an eerily deserted stretch for what felt like hours now. Suddenly I heard a kind of music. As I kept going, I realized that it was someone whistling. It gave me the creeps, but the idea of company relieved me a bit too. Soon enough, I saw a man in front of me walking the same direction. He was wearing a t-shirt and pants, which was surprisingly inadequate, especially for the impending night. I passed him by. He was the one whistling indeed, turned to say the customary greetings. He looked up, dead pan, and without a word turned back down towards the ground and kept whistling. He was walking slowly on an almost trance-like manner. I quickly averted my gaze forward, and almost abruptly the whistling stopped. I turned back to see what happened, and there was absolutely no one on the trail. Zilch. Didn't even feel like anyone had been there. Needless to say, I freaked out. I made it back without any further issues, but I still think about what I saw and heard that night. I had a stare-off with a bobcat. I awoke early before dawn and made a cup of coffee, then took a quiet walk among the huge boulders around my camp. I came around one of them and locked eyes with a large kitty, probably 45 pounds, who froze in place as I did. We were about six to seven feet apart. His eyes dilated. He crouched, ears back, and we stared deep into each other's eyes. I was afraid that if I dropped eye contact, he'd spring at my throat. He looked freaked and defensive, ready to fight. He was probably thinking the same thing about me. After no movement from either of us for way too long, I took a risk and dropped my eyes and head for less than a second. 
When I glanced around, he was gone. Poof, like a ghost. My dog right at my side had no clue. Never saw it, smelled it, or chased it. I was not surprised by my dog's ability to be fooled by the cat's perfect natural camouflage. But not to smell it? It was right in front of his face. There was a huge mountain lion up in the Three Sisters Wilderness area. His territory is large. My doctor saw it across the road and said it was gigantic. On a solo backpacking trip up the wilderness boundary, I found big cougar tracks where it had leapt after a deer or elk during the chase. The paw prints were about 20 feet apart, and I camped there for the night. I was hiking alone with my dog. It was at the beginning of the hike, so I was still very close to a town. I met a family walking together. A man, a woman, and a kid. The man says hi to me, and it's obvious that he wants to talk, so I stop. Assuming he wants to ask about my dog's breed or something. My dog smells him, and he says to my dog, Ah, you know who the master is here. What the heck? Then he asks me, Are you not afraid to walk alone? I tell him, No, I'm not. Then he asks me, Are you sure? You're a young woman alone. Are you not afraid of being attacked? Well, now I am, thanks. I tell him that I'm close to town, so no. He then told me how I shouldn't be without a man and keeps asking me, are you not scared of being assaulted or killed by someone? At this point, I wanted to ask him if by someone he meant him. I pointed out that I had a big dog with me and told him how my dog was protective and wouldn't hesitate to defend me if something goes wrong, which is true but I mostly said it to scare him in case he had bad intentions. I made eye contact with the woman and kid at some point, and it was obvious that they were embarrassed. Eventually I left, and I never saw them again. This all took place in a rural area in France, not a place that's especially dangerous for women. Another scary thing is that I saw a scary, massive boar. It took me a minute to understand what that creature was, but that's not as scary as the creepy dude. I got stalked by a family of brown bear on a trail once. Thankfully, they mostly kept their distance, but they were definitely following me and I couldn't figure out why, other than that they were potentially starving and I was potentially dinner. Turns out, I had a massive bag of homemade trail mix in my pack and carried it with me on the hike instead of leaving it in the bear bag back at camp. I found it when I stopped to have some water, and at that point, the bears were getting ballsy. Closer and closer each time I tried to take a break. I dumped that trail mix out where I sat and climbed up the nearest cliff. If those bears went right for the trail mix, they didn't follow me further. It's how keen their sense of smell is. Black bear wouldn't have really concerned me. They're super skittish creatures. Brown bear, on the other hand, I don't know why, but those creatures don't give a crap and will tear you limb from limb looking for a single gummy vitamin that you forgot in your pocket. In the late 90s, I was in my junior year of high school and hiking up Usury Mountain in the East Mesa, Arizona, with my best bud and two girls that we liked. We reached the Wind Cave at the top, but wanted to keep going, so we scrambled up the summit to take in the view. My friend was sitting on a rock and noticed an old rusty Altoids tin box and picked it up. Inside were two folded up pieces of white paper, which he spread out on the rock. The first page was a crude sketch of the view from the exact spot drawn in pencil, with the caption, The Last View from Name's Eyes, with the date, 
I believe it was only some months or a year past. The second page was an apology letter listing people in this person's life and things they were sorry to have said or did to them. We surmised that it was a self unaliving note and started searching the backside of usury for anything, something, remains, clothes, more clues. There was nothing. This was the late 90s, and internet search was not really a thing yet, so we went to the Central Mesa Library to sort through the microfish files, skimming through newspapers a little after the date, on the drawing, or any lost person notices or any news related, and again, nothing. But it was fun feeling like I was an Encyclopedia Brown for an afternoon. Some years later, my friend moved to another part of the United States and hasn't really kept in touch. But I often wonder if he still has the 10, and if he ever found the person's identity using modern research methods. Unsatisfying end to the story, I know, but it was definitely a little creepy, and a little sad. Plus, I gotta use the word microfish. East Mesa has a surprising amount of culty aspects that I experienced growing up. I should probably write them all down. I was hiking in northern Ontario through an old mining road. Years of neglect had fallen tons of trees. My partner and I had 27 pound packs on, so ducking or going over fallen trees was time consuming and tiring. We got to the point on the trail where we needed to go south to the lake. There was a beach there we spotted on Google Earth. Thinking nothing of it, we head straight through the forest. No path. For those that have been through boreal forest, you know what I'm talking about. I'm up front for the first part. I step near a conifer truck. I'm two feet away from the trunk, but my foot disappears into a hole. I don't lose my balance and quickly recover, but use the nearby stick to poke around the area. It's just a fake top with broken branches and brown pine needles. Don't know how far it went down. Came to the realization there are a lot of holes in this forest. We kept our distance from any other conifer trunks and made it safely to our destination. It was worth the hike, and we made it safely home. If something bad had happened, we were many miles away from the main road and tough hauling back through the old mining road. Great memory, but it was scary. I posted a review on all trails for a snowshoe I did in the mountains. I was the first one up that trail after a pretty good sized snowstorm, breaking trail pretty much the whole way. A couple days later, somebody tracked me down on Facebook from that review and started asking questions. I thought it was kind of weird, but it turned out that she was trying to track down a guy who had hiked down the trail a few days before. He went up with just his dog and basic gear, but no snowshoes, and got caught in the storm. The storm was so powerful that it shut down a ski hill in the area. Total whiteout. Dropped a lot of snow very fast. The dog showed up on the highway 10 miles away, two days later. I was the next person up the trail after him, so they were hoping I'd seen some sign of him, but I hadn't. Turned out he'd died up there. Most likely he'd gotten off trail in the whiteout, got bogged down in the deep snow and froze. Moral of the story is be prepared out there, especially in the mountains, double especially in the winter. I was a volunteer working at a camp in Velapohe, Albania. One night, my friends and I decided to go to some beach bars to party. We bar hopped a little and eventually ended up in a one a bit too far from camp, a bit further from the coast behind a big forest. When 2 a.m. hit the clock, I felt tired, so I decided to go back to the camp. 
no one else was willing to, so I ended up walking alone. I decided to take a shortcut through the forest. It was pitch dark, so I used the flashlight on my phone. I illuminated the path and then I saw it. It was a body. I startled and started moving the light slowly, only to reveal ten more bodies lying on the ground. Fortunately, all of those bodies were alive, just sleeping. It turned out that the forest was full of homeless gypsies who were just living there. I was relieved that no one was dead, but I was also a bit scared of being robbed. Obviously, I don't mean to be racist, but one of those guys are fine and nice, but also poor and unfortunate. They were usually making a living by playing music on nearby beaches. However, at the same time, I saw their children pickpocketing the tourists. But the night got even scarier. When I left the forest safely, I started walking on the promenade. I started looking at the stars as the night sky in Velahohe is simply gorgeous. I was passing a lot of rabid dogs on the way. I didn't think much of it at the moment, because they were just scavenging near the rubbish bins and piles and just kept walking. Suddenly, I start feeling uneasy. Something wasn't right. I turned around, and wouldn't you know it, the dogs were following me. The pack was getting larger and larger, and it wasn't just a funny parade with cute puppies. They started forming an open circle formation, just like hunting wolves in movies. I immediately started walking a bit faster, looking around for any large stick to defend myself. The dogs accelerated their pace as well. Encouraged by their numbers, some of them started growling. Then I heard loud barking and tapping. I quickly turned around and saw one of the dogs charging me, with about 10 to 15 dogs walking behind it quietly or growling. I did the only thing I could think of, which was shouting and stomping aggressively. That immediately discouraged the pack. All the 10 to 15 dogs stopped and looked at me quietly, still remaining in the circle formation. The charging one retreated and barked even louder, probably to cover its lack of courage. I slowly turned my back and started walking, but then the dog charged me again, and again I shouted and tried to look aggressive. This worked again, and became a routine for the rest of my way back to camp, which was fortunately just ten more minutes. Needless to say, I was very scared that I was going to be eaten, or at least severely bitten by a pack of wild dogs. But thank God, nothing bad truly happened. I like to hike solo. One time I was hiking around a trail system at the base of my local mountain with my two dogs, not far from civilization and not a technical trail. It was really more of a walk in the woods. I had hiked that trail many times before, almost daily. The worst part of the trail was when you had to pass by this little lean-to that someone had put against a pine tree, maybe 150 feet off the side of the trail. I always got creeped out by it because someone easily could have been in it, but after having walked the trail so many times, I got pretty acclimated to it. Well, lo and behold, this time my fears came true. This time, a lumbering, jacked, unkempt man with a very unhinged look in his eyes and a huge machete comes striding out of the lean-to as I'm passing by. I'm a pretty small gal, I'm completely unarmed, and I'm completely unprepared for this. He starts walking alongside me, very close to me, telling me how he had just been released from prison, how lonely he is, how confused he is about having to get back on his feet after spending time locked up, how angry he is at everyone for letting bad things happen to him. My heart is beating out of my chest, but I manage to stay calm on the exterior. There's no one around to scream for. There's no way that I'm going to overpower this guy. I'm at a total loss about the right thing to do. I just gently and kindly talk to him about his troubles, share about what I was going to do with the rest of my day, which includes going home to my family, and eventually I'm able to tell him that I need to turn around and head back because I'm running out of time, at which point he just books it back deeper into the woods. 
He easily could have assaulted and murdered me at that moment. I have no idea what kept them from causing me any harm, but I am grateful. Years ago, I was taking a short hike around a lake where I lived, something I must have done a hundred times before. Nice day, but during the middle of the week, so no one else was around. About ten minutes into it, I got the sense of someone behind me and turned around. When I did, I saw a man about thirty feet behind me walking very quickly in my direction, with his eyes right on me. Strange thing was that as soon as I turned around and looked at him, he immediately turned around and walked back the way he had come. I got the creepiest sensation that I had been in immediate danger from the guy and that the man turned back the other way because he had lost the element of surprise. I waited about 20 or so minutes and then got out of there. I still wonder what would have happened if I hadn't turned around. My best friend and I went for an early trail run one morning in the summer. Ours were the only cars in the parking lot, and there are no other trailheads for miles. As we were running up the mountain, we noticed something ahead of us. A tall person was walking very slowly toward us, swishing their arms in front of them side to side. It was a hot day, and he was wearing a hooded jacket. Their sleeves were long enough to touch the ground, and their hood was tied over their face so they must have only had a small hole to look out of. We passed this person with no issue, but it's the creepiest encounter I've ever had on a trail. I learned that I'm definitely the kind of person that would trip my friend and leave them for dead if the moment called for it. I was hiking Cerro Chapero in Costa Rica last May, 42 kilometer trail that I started at midnight and finished at 5.30 p.m. There is a lodge at the base of the trail. Once I finished and got back, there were cops with a family there. I ate dinner and went to bed, not knowing what was going on. The next day, I found out that a woman who was hiking with two family members had disappeared on the hike. She had apparently been hiking ahead of the other two for a short period when they heard her scream. When they caught up to where she had been, she wasn't there or anywhere to be found. They searched and called out as long as possible until they had to head down the trail to seek help. They found her body four days later. She had fallen off of a large cliff. Turns out, I passed her dead or dying body unknowingly at some point on the hike. A buddy of mine and I were hiking Mount Washington in October. We are seasoned and prepared hikers. It was a windy cold day but we had a great time. Managed to also bag Monroe between sets of clouds, just obscuring everything. We knew that we'd be hiking in the dark and planned accordingly. We were hiking down the Jewel Trail with the headlamps on, and out of the darkness we hear, hello. My buddy and I basically both crapped ourselves. Setting there is a young woman and her boyfriend in sneakers and light jackets freezing. No backpacks, no water, no nothing. We start to ask questions and they only speak French. My buddy thankfully is a native speaker, so we get the whole story. They started hiking up Jewel at 3 p.m. From there, they managed to fumble around and then they lost the light. This was 2008, so smartphones weren't terrible, but not great. It didn't take them long to blow their batteries out trying to use them as flashlights. Too afraid to go down the hill in the dark, they did the sensible thing and just stopped and stayed on the trail. We gave them water and food in our spare layers and started back down the trail. We got them back to their car and they thanked us profusely. 
I always wondered how people could die in the whites. This was the first time seeing how unprepared people will gleefully go down the trail without a care. When I was 11, I went camping with my mom, her boyfriend, and my little brother outside of Las Vegas in the middle of the desert. We went arrowhead hunting one morning, and during our hike, we stumbled upon a full human skeleton laying on a blanket, kind of tucked under a bush, laying on their back like they fell asleep and never woke up. My boyfriend knelt down and prayed over the remains, and then we walked back to the campsite silent, everyone in complete shock. Got the ranger. Boyfriend got into helicopter to show him where the remains were. Turned out to be a presumed self-unaliving of a young male. He had been missing for almost a year. It was suspicious that the whole skeleton was still in contact, though. That image is forever burned in to my brain. Back in the early 90s, I did an overnight small chunk of the Appalachian Trail with two work friends. It was rainy, miserable. I had a cheap sleeping bag and an ancient external frame backpack that made me worry about being a lightning rod at that elevation. We got lost on the way out and started complaining to each other and settled into grumpy silence. We hadn't seen anything the whole time, but then we could hear somebody coughing like a really wet, croupy, hacking cough. Turns out it was a single adult man and a kid. They were wearing rain gear, but didn't otherwise seem outfitted for even a short jaunt, like us, much less a longer hike. The kid looked miserable, just coughing and coughing, and we passed each other in silence. I was basically a kid myself, maybe 19. But the older I have gotten, the more that I think about this five-minute snippet of my life. I have kids now. That child had glassy eyes and a flushed face. A sure sign of fever. His hair was stuck to his face from the rain. I still remember that sad little resigned look in his eyes as we passed. We were miles and miles from any kind of access point or way station. I never would just keep walking now. The dad, I really hope it was their dad at least, and I would have had a frank conversation. Did they need help? Dry socks? A snack? Was he aware that his kid needed to get off the trail ASAP? Etc. I still think about it. A lot. I've got three crazy experiences. In college, my buddy and I are camping at the Mount Washington lean-tos to have three days of spring skiing at Tuckerman's Ravine. If you don't know the area, there's no lifts. You hike up a very steep and relatively short run. The camping is two to three hours from the parking lot. We wake up to a beautiful morning with not a cloud in the sky. Unfortunately, the service report says 50 mile per hour winds at the ski area. The mountain has the highest wind speeds recorded on earth. We decided to take a short hike and then hopefully ski in the afternoon. After an hour, we can still see the lean-to. Clouds roll in and it's a complete whiteout blizzard. We're above the tree line with no markers. We end up coming down the wrong side, hiking for hours in sometimes chest deep snow. We finally hit a road and walk another few hours and find a motel. We beg for a room and after some cajole and get one. The next morning, we hitchhike 20 miles back to the base parking lot, climb up for hours to get our skis and camping gear. There's a raging windstorm at the Lean Twos, and we have to ski slide, slip down the icy trail to the parking lot. A few years later, my girlfriend, now wife, are cross-country skiing in Vermont in the spring. It's a one-way trip from a car we left back to my brother's car. We have a map and compass, and we're following the long trail markers on the trees. 
It has recently snowed, so it's only our tracks. The prior summer, the trail has been moved, not on our map, but they leave up some of the old tree markers. We become lost and decided to settle in for the night. I dug a deep pit to build a fire. At about 10, the pit collapsed and put the fire out. It's pitch black and we dug out some snow caves, but my inner brain was rebelling. Just then the moon rose and I could strap on the skis and collect more firewood. We were rescued by volunteer snowmobilers. My brother had called the police at about 3 a.m. It took three hours to get us back to our car. Lastly, we were hiking in the Angeles National Forest and I had a baby in a backpack. We saw a mountain lion. My wife yelled run, but I calmed her quickly and we slowly backed away. When we were a safe distance away, she took the baby like a football and sprinted down the trail. I saw her meet a small group coming up. When I got to her, I asked if she had warned them and she said coldly, no, I wanted to have someone between us and the lion. Her maternal instinct seemed to have overrode common courtesy. Thankfully, there was nothing on the news that evening. I grew up in Orange County, California, but there were some real wild areas around us, believe it or not. In high school, we went to this place called Black Star Canyon in the Cleveland National Forest. Big, densely wooded area of oak that stretches from OC to San Diego, almost to the border. Even contains Marine Corps Camp, Camp Pendleton. Anyway, we had been told that it was haunted growing up. Turns out, true story, there was a tribe up there that was slaughtered in the 1800s. I hired fur trappers because they kept stealing the Mexican ranchers' horses for meat. Enough said for a bunch of dumb high schoolers. So we plan a night hike to this place. My friends and I did stuff like this all the time, but I consider myself pretty skeptical, and luckily most of us were pretty level-headed. The area is pretty well known for mountain lions too, so we were all on guard and in agreement to turn around at any given sign even if it was just one of us wanted to. So the way the trail works, you park at a forestry gate and start to walk a long asphalt narrow road that's mostly dirt from where there were sparse houses in the 50s and 60s before the floods washed them out and the land was committed to National Forest Service, eventually turning to full hiking trail. Along this road is a line of barbed wire as well with all kinds of signs warning you not to cross. So here we are, typical idiots walking on a road on a hardly slivered moon, pitch black night, after midnight, and not using our flashlights to add to the flare. Well, as we go and adventure deeper and deeper down this road, which we'd never been on before, mind you, I keep seeing what appears to be a cowboy leaning on the wooden fence posts, holding the barbed wire, just kind of leaning on it, but distinctly looking at us. I'm talking full-blown cowboy brimmed hat, just leaning, but it's just a silhouette out the side of my eye, and every time I look straight on, there's nothing. I'm telling myself if I'm logical and push it off as a trick of the eyes to keep my cool, but I keep seeing this guy every ten or so posts, but I don't say a thing to the guys. We get to a point where we've been walking for over an hour and debate on heading back just because of the time. Then my friend goes, yeah, and I keep thinking I'm seeing a cowboy along the fence line. No crap, I felt my stomach drop out of me. I couldn't believe it. These were plain wooden fence posts, maybe a typical four foot or so tall, with mostly field behind them. No way that that looks like a person. So I open up about it also, and we all agree to turn around. Just then, my other buddy starts flipping out ripping his shirt off and screaming about getting stung. We're all kind of confused looking at him like he's crazy, but he insists that a bee or something just stung him. So we turn our lights on his back to look and watch as three distinct scratches form, stretching from his shoulder diagonal to the opposite hip, even drawing blood. 
We were done, needless to say, after that, but made it back to the car without further incident. You can probably argue that the shadow was a coincidence in the dark, and shapes playing tricks, sure, I'll give you that. But throw in the scratch in a way that we watched happen right as we're discussing this cowboy, and in a way we couldn't do to himself, and none of us standing in a circle did it to him. I believe there was something going on. This area ended up being used by Jack Osborne's show, Haunted Highway, on his pilot episode. It's pretty cool, and I've been back since, but only in the day. California has more to it than you'd imagine. This is just one story out of many that I've experienced out here. I was walking through a not so popular or well-known trail. It wasn't marked very well, so we got turned around a few times, and there really wasn't a lot of signs that people went on this trail often. Most paths were tough to see if they were even trails or were just wandering. Then we saw what looked like a dense area of trees and what looked like a path, so we head straight towards it. It was a well-traveled path just in this little area. We take a turn and see some strange, shiny, reflective objects in the tree. We cautiously round the turn, and then as far as we could see, about 30 yards on the only straight path were Christmas ornaments. I mean, there had to be hundreds of them. Really creepy ones and some standard. Some looked personal, but it wasn't the oddity of some of them that was the sheer amount of them on an unmarked trail in the middle of the woods after we got turned around a bit. That was probably the weirdest stuff I've ever experienced. Looked it up on all the trails after we made it out, and there were no comments on that trail about Christmas ornaments. The hiking path was along a small stream. During heavy rain, that stream would turn from a 2 meter wide shallow creek into a 20 meter wide river, so it wasn't unusual to come across random trash that had been washed downstream. First I passed a child's lunchbox, then a small jacket or sweater, then a child's backpack with a name and address prominently printed on it with permanent marker, then a plastic garbage can. You can clearly see that there was something in the can. It was wrapped in black garbage bags, but they were torn, so you could see what looked like clothing underneath. It was pretty far out, so I wanted to make sure before turning around and calling the police. Thankfully, it was just a bag of garbage. I was hiking out of a canyon, and as I approached the mouth of it, I heard a repetitious thumping noise that got louder and louder the closer I got to the mouth. Standing at the mouth of the canyon, I started looking around for what the source of the noise might be. I had some binoculars, and as I scanned up above the canyon, I spotted someone dressed in a grim reaper costume beating a drum. I have no idea what was going on. This isn't my story, but it's one that someone told me. They were in some very, very remote part of California and were about to enter a forest. Near the edge, close to a rock and behind some trees, were two people wearing all white, a man and a woman. They simply stared. When he tried to say hi and greet them, they didn't respond but instead just kept on staring. This was in the morning. At night, he noticed his food was missing and there were two human footprints that went all around his tent. Three days later, he hears whispering around his tent in the middle of the night. 
Another day later, as he keeps looking back because of the previous incident, he sees two white dots following him about three miles behind him. They followed him for around 100 miles. That night, he purposefully hid his tent far off the trail. They still found him and lit a light directly at the tent. Dude took off running and they proceeded to chase him. Eventually, he hid and could see them with their flashlight just looking for him. He left all of his gear and eventually got to a town where he contacted the police. The police said that similar incidents had occurred from different people, yet they never found anyone. People were also mysteriously disappearing in the forests. Dude made it out and went back home. I saw a full YouTube about it from Mr. Ballin. It definitely gave me the chills. Just today, my friend and I were hiking on some abandoned and used land. It's really beautiful, with lakes, cliffs, and tons of trees. The hike was going really well, but close to dark, it turned around. My friend whispered to me that they had been thinking of skinwalkers and couldn't stop. This got me thinking of the same, and we decided to head back to the car to eliminate any risk. A few minutes into the hike back, we both got horrible feelings and it became apparent that we were not alone. We kept making our way back to the car as fast as we could, but it kept getting worse. Both of us experienced blurred vision, and the air suddenly got thick and had a hum to it. It also became incredibly hard to move, and we both experienced an intense urge to lay down and stop hiking. We came across an area we hadn't hiked through, but was adjacent to where we were and there were so many deer prints in every direction, as if deer had been rapidly pacing there, and human footprints on the other side of that scramble. There wasn't a clear starting point to the footprints, and no evidence of any other hikers for miles. The trek back to the car seemed to take five minutes and three hours simultaneously, so we have no clue how long it actually took. Neither of us have felt this sense of dread, or have been this disoriented before. Do you think we had a close encounter with a skinwalker? Or was it something else entirely? I don't have the background knowledge to say exactly what it could be. We're in eastern Kansas if that helps. Any information or ideas are appreciated. Note, I'm not trying to offend anyone in my story. I'm simply telling the events that I experienced. My friend was thinking of skinwalkers and I am simply looking for advice or ideas as to what I could have experienced. Whatever it was, it was very scary and not a good experience. I said in my post that I did not have the knowledge or experience to claim it to be anything specific, and I hope that doing so would clarify that I was not trying to offend anyone. Thank you to all who have given ideas or kind criticisms of my wording. I really appreciate all of it. I was hiking in Willamette National Forest on a trail that I am very familiar with. I had my two dogs with me, a hound and a lab, and we had just got up a really steep hill and I sat down for a rest. My dogs are usually just cruising around, sniffing out little critters and enjoying themselves. Suddenly one of my dogs starts growling and staring down the trail where we had just come from. Just like that. They both get up right next to me and start to growl, staring down the trail. It's not a particularly bushy area, so I can see pretty far, and I don't see anything. But the dogs were sure that there was something there, and I believed them. Maybe a cougar. After a while, they calmed down, and we kept going and looped back on another trail. I had a pocket knife with me that I carried out for the next few miles. But we got back okay. They have never acted like that before or since. Mm. 
This happened yesterday. My brother and I went for a hike to stave off cabin fever from self-isolating. We chose a pretty remote trail to lower the risk of coming into contact with other people. I was walking ahead of my brother, and the gravel on the track was making our footsteps sound really loud. Deep in thought, I was listening to the rhythm of his footsteps behind me. About 20 minutes in, I started hearing other footsteps starting off faint and getting louder, until they were the same pitch as his, but they were much faster, like a running rhythm. They suddenly came to a halt, and I could hear the motion of someone stopping on gravel. That sudden, sharp, rocky sound, if you can imagine it. I assumed there must have been someone running or jogging on the track, and sure enough, I saw a shadow to the side of me appear, which looked like a person's head next to mine, as though they were right behind me. I stopped and turned to let them pass because the track was narrow. However, when I turned around, it was just my brother staring back at me. He was confused as to why I'd stopped, so I asked if he was running a second ago and he said no. I asked if there had been anyone behind him, and he said that he wasn't aware of anyone. I thought it was strange, but just let it go and carried on. About five minutes later, we came around a corner and there was this smell of just pure death, like a really strong off-meat smell. We figured it was a dead animal and kept going. We reached the hike lookout about 20 minutes later, chilled out for a bit and then headed back. We passed the death smell, and then around the exact spot where it happened before, I started hearing running sounds again. I ignored it this time because it was starting to freak me out and just pick up the pace to get back to the car. I told my mom and she joked that the death smell must have been a dead jogger and I was being haunted by them to which I laughed at the time. But now I'm wondering, what if it was? Maybe I should have investigated the smell. Thank you so much for listening to all of the stories in this video. I hope you enjoyed them. I also hope that you enjoy the extra rain at the end. Get a good night's sleep, everyone, and I'll read to you in the next video. Bye-bye now.